The following programs were originally aired live, long before the advent of High Fidelity. And they were recorded using a variety of means, from direct recording onto early audio tape and glass records, to simply placing the microphone of a wire recorder in front of the speakers of a radio playing the program. I hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to these, some of the all-time favorite shows. the song please put some money in the hat you want me to pay for that i don't make the rules pay up no would you pay to hear frank sinatra of course then you should pay to listen to me i taught frank everything he knows you taught frank sinatra how to sing <laughs> no i told him how to use his mob ties to get a music contract i'm not paying you see that man with the club sleeping on the bench? Of course. He is my manager. Don't make me wake him up, because that will make him angry. And you wouldn't like him when he's angry. Police! Great. Now we're in jail. What have you got to say for yourself now? Uh, sorry? What made you think threatening people on the train platform was a good way to get money? I didn't think it was a good way to get money, but it was a good way to get food. How will this get us food? They gotta feed us in jail, right? I want to club you for that one, but they took away the club. I don't know what to do now. Uh, why don't you just get on with this day in history? Fine. April the 5th. 1942, jail. In 1242, Alexander Nevsky of Novgorod defeats the Teutonic Knights in the Battle of the Ice. Now people will finally have something to put in their martinis. <laughs> in 1722, Dutch navigator Jacob Rogsveen is the first European to discover Easter Island slash Rapa Nua in the Southern Pacific. In 1818, Battle of Maipu, Chile's independence movement led by Bernardo O'Higgins and Joseph D. San Martin win a decisive victory over Spain, leaving 2,000 Spaniards and 1,000 Chilean patriots dead. No idea why the Chilean, no idea why the Chileans were being led by an Irishman, but there you have it. In 1847, Birkenhead Park, <laughs> the first civil park, public civil public park opens in Birkenhead, England, designed by Joseph Paxton. In 1879, Chile declares war on Bolivia and Peru, starting the War of the Pacific. In 1987, Fox TV network premieres showing Mary with Children and the Tracy Ullman Show. You know, that show that the Simpsons short came from. That's pretty much all anybody remembers it for. In 1874, Johann Strauss Jr.'s opera De, Fl De Flandermas premieres in Vienna. In 1984, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar breaks Wilt Chamberlain's all-time all career scoring record of 31,419 points with 31,421 points. And he did this after he was in the movie Airplane, by the way. In 
Pretty impressive if you ask me. And that was This Day in History. Now let's get on with the shows. Who's on first? Why, it's Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Coming up next. Camels, the cigarette that's first in the service, present the Abbott and Costello program. With the music of Leith Stevens and his orchestra, the songs of Connie Haynes and the Camel Quintet, tonight's guest, Miss Marlena Dietrich, and starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Hey, Abbott! No, oh, Costello. Oh, Abbott, will you stop that noise? What are you doing here in the studio dressed in your bathing suit? Well, I spent all day trying to get my car out of the swimming pool. What was it doing there? Don't you read the papers, Abbott? The government says you have to pool your car. Uh. <laughs> no, you dummy. They mean share the ride. You have to pick up people. Oh, I did that yesterday. I picked up Helen, Mary, Rosie, and Josie. But your car holds more than that. Yeah, but now they only allow you four gals a week. <laughs> well, you, know, you can't get it. Well, never mind that, Costello. Where have you been all week? What have you been doing? Oh, boy, have I been having fun with Connie Haynes? No kidding. Last Saturday, I took her to a football game. What a game! What excitement! Any passes? No. Her mother was with us. <laughs> and another thing, Abbott, there was a man sitting next to us with a six-month-old baby. All afternoon, the kid was crying. He was so hungry. Well, didn't the father bring a bottle? Yeah, but the kid wanted milk. <laughs> Finally, to shut the kid up, I give him a penny. Well, did that keep him quiet? Yeah, but he kept waving the penny in front of my binoculars. It ruined the game. How did it ruin the game? All afternoon. Lincoln was playing in the backfield. No, no, no. Well, forget the football game. Much better this afternoon, huh? Yes, 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 a lot better. We've got, we've got other things to worry about. You know, our announcer, Ken Niles, is complaining because he didn't have enough to do last week. Isn't that right, Ken? Yes, it is. <laughs> After all, I could give the program a lift. <laughs> I'm a shot in the arm. You said it. You're a dope. <laughs> now, don't be silly, Costello. Niles is very popular. Why, sure. Right after the broadcast last week, a lot of women chased me up Hollywood Boulevard, and one of them caught me and threw her arms around my neck. I saw that. You did? Yeah. Why did you snatch her pocketbook? <laughs> now, cut it out, Costello. Now, I talked to Ken's wife, and she says uh, he should have more lines. She says he's got talent. She says he's terrific. She says he's colossal. She says this, she says that. I don't care what his wife says. Well, I do. My wife is a wonderful person. She's as necessary to me as, as an umbrella in a rainstorm. I'll take the umbrella. It's easier to shut up. No. <laughs> now, why don't you be reasonable, Costello? Mrs. Niles is a very sweet girl. Yes, she is. You know, she's a great deal like Sonia Henney. You mean you have to keep her on ice? <laughs> now, please. Are this... you folks hearing us? Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. Now, that isn't fair, Costello. Now, let's get together here. Give Ken a chance to show what he can do. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks, Bud. I, I, I'd like to read a little a tidbit that I just happened to bring along. Oh, this is going to murder you. Uh, <clears throat> one night as I sat rocking, rocking on my chamber floor, came a knocking, gentle knocking, knocking on my chamber door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. There, how'd you like that? Don't look now, but the raven just laid a knee. <laughs> hello, everybody, and uh, hello, my fat little sugar man Oh, this voice of this kid is temporaneous Shh, quiet, quiet Hello, Connie Mr. Costello, honey I'd like you and Mr. Abbott to meet someone 
This is my Aunt Ruby. Uh, hello. Nice to meet you. Hi, Aunt Ruby. How do you like California? Connie doesn't have enough to do. Wait a minute. After all, I... I listened to the program last week, and there should be more music. Connie ought to sing four or five songs. There's nothing but talk on the program. And who wants to hear a lot of talk, 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 talk? Uh, talk, 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 talk? Hold talk, your hat. Here comes another race. After all, Mr. Costello, I taught Connie to sing. Why, even I sang in New York, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago. What about St. Louis? They beat the Yanks. Ha-ha, ha-ha. I really... Yeah. I really struck you out that time. You struck me out, eh? Mm -hmm. And you're just the old bat that can do it. Now, yeah. Wait a minute. Now, just a second, Costello. You can't talk like that to Connie's Aunt Ruby. Maybe she's right. Maybe this program needs more singing. Exactly. Everyone loves singing. Something like this. All through the night, there's a little brown but singing. Oh, well, of course. You know I just had my tonsils taken out. Have them put back in. <laughs> Costello, what right have you got to criticize? What do you know about singing? Now, look, Abbott, if I hadn't come from such a large family, I'd have been a great singer. What did the large family have to do with it? I could never get in the bathroom. Oh, no. <laughs> come on, Costello, make up your mind. Are you going to give Niles and Connie more to do or not? Why should I? If I give them more to do, the first thing you know, even the sound man will want more to do. And why shouldn't I? What did I have on last week's program? Nothing. Not even a door slam. I understand doors. I know doors inside and out. I talk to doors and they talk to me. Well, what do you hear from the mob? <laughs> ah, well may you laugh. Little do you know how important every little sound is to me. Even the sound of a moth chewing on an overcoat. Like this. What's that funny sound? That's the moth spitting out the buttons. I... <laughs> Don't you think sounds are fascinating? Here is a sample of my day. When work is through, I walk home at night in the rain. I open the door. I go in and shut the door. Then I walk upstairs in the rain. It's raining in the house? Yes, we're waiting for a government ceiling. <laughs> must have a better writer than us, huh? Yeah. I imagine so. I jump into bed and sleep. <laughs> it's morning. What a night! <laughs> I've got to catch the train. I kiss my wife before I go to the office. My wife kisses me. I kiss her and she kisses me. Uh, wait I... a minute. What about the office? With a wife like that, why should he go to the office? <laughs> Lou Costello. Yes, sir. Uh, For me? Yeah. Uh, how's your spelling this week? I can spell anything. Okay. Spell crumpets. Crumpets. Yeah, crumpets. Crumpets. Yeah. K? No. no crumpets. C-R-U-M-P-E-S. Uh, oh, wait a minute. You left out the T. Today, I gotta have crumpets without T. Well, why? I lost my sugar ration card. Oh, now, wait a minute. Look, Ration Luke. card. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Ration. Ration. ration or ration. Look, around here, you can't forget any teas. Why not? Well, because with us, it's important. In fact, with any cigarette smoker, T ought to be one of the most important letters in the alphabet. Is that right? Why, sure. T stands for taste and throat. That's anybody's own personal proving ground for cigarettes. The T zone. Now, of course, most people have tried camels. But have you tried them lately, since you've been smoking more? Give camels the T-Zone test now. Ask your taste about camel's flavor. You'll find it wears well, doesn't go flat. Ask your throat about camel's mildness. It's the best judge you can find. Thousands of smokers who are making their own T-Zone test advise camels suit them through a T. Just remember that you're the one who's doing your smoking. For steady pleasure, try camels. You'll find they're slow-burning, cooler-smoking, richer-tasting, milder, better. Because camels are expertly and matchlessly blended of costlier tobaccos. So take a tip from your T-Zone. Your throat and your taste will tell you. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camels. Get a pack tonight. You'll want to buy a carton tomorrow. Abraham, Abraham, in 1860 
he became 60th president. Now he's in the Hall of Fame, the most respected gym. That is why we celebrate this birthday every very day. Abraham, Abraham, Orchestra with a camel quintet doing oh, Abraham from the Holiday Inn. And now, Abbott. ladies and gentlemen, oh, quiet. Abbott! What's the matter? Hey, look. Look what I got. Look at all the money. Wait a minute, Costello. Where did you get that roll of bills? I went outside for a minute. Just when I reached the corner, a guy ran out of the bank with a bag full of money. And he gave me some. He gave it to you? Mm hmm. What did he look like? I couldn't tell. He had such a bad cold, he had a handkerchief tied across his nose. <laughs> well, you dumb cluck, that was a mask. The man was a bank robber. Oh, I don't think so, Abbott. He was the president. He offered to sell me the bank for a squawk. Sell you the bank for a squawk? Yeah, he said, one squawk out of you and I'll give you the business. <laughs> of all the dumbbells, why didn't you go into the bank and investigate? I did go in. And what a way to run a business. I walked in and a couple of clerks were playing hide and seek. That's ridiculous. Honest. One guy was hiding in the closet. The other guy was under the counter. There was nobody around to play with him. Then there was another guy. What other guy? He was trying to do tricks. Trying to do tricks? Yeah, he was laying on the floor trying to escape from a lot of ropes. And you thought he was playing a game? Fine time to play games, huh? Yeah. Especially when he had a toothache. He didn't have a toothache. No, then why did he have a plaster across his mouth? The man had a gag in his mouth. If he did, he never got a chance to tell it. Oh. <laughs> Listen, you should have taken the plaster off his mouth. I did. And right away, the guy started worrying about his... Rationing card. Worrying about his rationing card. Yeah, he started yelling, they took the sugar. They took the sugar. Oh, no, 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 Costello. The man, the man was yelling because he was stuck up. Stuck up? Sure. A fine time to get a swelled head. No. <laughs> Somebody might have robbed the place. He did rob the place. Look, was there anybody with him? Just a woman. A woman? Why didn't you mention her before? She didn't appeal to me. Oh. <laughs> did you pinch her? No. Then you should have held her. If I'd have held her, I'd have pinched her. You idiot. <laughs> a little bit. Do you realize that by keeping the money and letting the crooks get away, you've made yourself an accomplice? Ken Niles, turn on the radio. Maybe we'll get a police report. Hurry up. Okay, boss. Okay. Hey, you hear that, Abbott? What's that? There's a message. Well, what does it say? <laughs> Attention all citizens. The Fifth National Bank has just been held up by Black Pete and his gang of desperate bandits. When last seen, the gang was headed for their hideout at Deadpan Gulch. Also at large is their accomplice, described as five feet tall. Five feet wide, that is all. That's me, Mr. Five by Five. <laughs> Costello, you know the police are after you. Now, you've got to capture that gang to clear yourself. Uh, now, you can't do it alone, so call a posse. That's the thing. Okay. Here, pushy, pushy, That's... pushy. No, 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 Here, no. Here, pushy. No. no, Lou, please. Deadpan Gulch is the, in the heart of the cattle country. It's the home of the Western bandits and cattle rustlers. Then I'm just a guy, Abbott. I became a three-letter man chasing cattle rustlers. Oh, how could you become a three-letter man chasing cattle rustlers? I sat on a branding iron. <laughs> but did that cause you to catch the rustlers? Catch them? I passed them. <laughs> but this is going to be a long trip. Uh, you'll have to get an outfit. What are you going to wear? I'll wear a ten-gallon hat. A tan shirt, a leather belt, and a bloodhound. What pants? The bloodhound. I, no, all right. <laughs> Never mind the outfit. And another thing you need is a horse. Have you got a horse? Have I got a horse? Yes. I got a horse, and he's my pal. Well, that's swell. I eat with my horse. That's wonderful. I drink with my horse. I even sleep with my horse. You sleep with your horse? I got it. It's his blanket. <laughs> now, tell me, can you ride a horse? Sure, I can ride a horse. One time, Abbott, I rode two horses at once, standing up. Mm. I had my right foot on one horse, my left foot on the other horse. All of a sudden, we came to a fork in the road. Each horse went in a different direction. That was a laugh. Yeah, I thought I'd split. I... 
Well, never mind. The first thing, the first thing you have to do is find the bandit's trail. When you do, you leap into the saddle and away you go. Your face is stern, your grip is sure, your clutch is firm. How's my transmission? All right, I'll ask him. Please keep quiet. Then you ride. You ride out across the prairie. You ride for hours and hours on end. That sounds logical. Don't interrupt, please. <laughs> you ride and you ride until your trousers are worn thin. Finally, there you are. I knew I'd come through. Yeah. <laughs> well, Costello, what are you going to do? Are you going out after the bandits? Are you going to clear your name? I'm going to clear my name, Abbott. a boy. I'll do it. I knew it was in you. I'm going to get it out of me right now. Come on. I'll get them, bandits. But just tell me one thing. If I get killed, what's going to happen to that little fellow that depends on me? The poor little fellow won't get anything to eat anymore. That poor little fellow won't even have a roof over his head. If anything happens, Abbott, it'll kill him. The poor little fellow. Costello. Who is the poor little fellow? Me? <laughs> Connie Haynes with a Camel Quintet to sing a new tune of the Old West, Cow Cow Boogie. Out on the plains, down near Santa Fe, I met a cowboy riding the range one day, and as he jogged along, I heard him singing a most peculiar cowboy song. It was a ditty he learned in the city. Come a tell ya ya eh, come a tell yip to the eye, get along, get hip, little doggies, get along, better be on your way, get along, get hip, little doggies, and he trust them on down the old fair way, singing his cow cow boogie in the strangest way. Come a ta ya ya eh, come a ta yip to the eye eh, singing his cowboy song. He's just too much. He's got a knocked up western accent with a Harlem touch. He was raised on local weed. He's what you call swing half breed, singing his cow cow boogie in the strangest way. Come a tie, yeah, yeah, eh. Come a tie, yip to the eye, eh. Singing his cowboy song. He's just too much. He's got a knocked up western accent. With a Harlem touch, he was raised on local weed. He's what you call swing at breed. Singing his cow cow boogie in the strangest way. Come a tie, yip, the eye. Come a tie, yip, the eye. It's the cow, cow boogie. The cowboy boogie song. And now, back to the adventures of our heroes, Abbott and Costello, as we find them hot on the trail of the bank bandit, Black Pete. Leading a posse of men, they track the villain to the lawless town of Deadpan Gulch. Here they are, riding up the main street of the town. I can spurs the jingle, jangle, jingle, 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 hey, jingle. What's wrong? What's wrong? One of my spurs got stuck. <laughs> Costello, what do you think you're doing? Why are you riding underneath your horse? Well, my horse isn't feeling well, Abbott. And the doctor told me to watch his stomach. <laughs> well, here we are, men. We'll probably find Black Pete in the Red Dog Cafe across the street. Stop your horses. Okay. Whoa! Whoa, Whoa, Whoa boy. Whoa. Atta boy. Take it easy, Nelly. Uh, sit down now. Whoa, Nelly. All right, men. Everybody into the bar for a drink. Now, oh, now. Just the men. You horses stay outside. <laughs> All right, let's go in. And listen, Costello, when we go through this door, have your gun ready. If anybody moves, shoot. If anybody shoots, I'll move. Sorry. When I die, you'll see the preacher. Oh, speaking of my glory and my fame. Hey, Evan, listen to that. What a pair of pipes. Wish I was a plumber. And tell them my son. Costello, 
Don't you recognize her? Well, she's the toast of dead pan gulch. Really? Of the same. Oh, Marlena Dietrich. Look at that lovely face. That face has made a fortune. Yeah, it runs into a nice figure. <laughs> Hello, boys. Hello, boys. How big are men where you come from? <laughs> Welcome to the Red Dog Cafe. Did you like my song? What do you think of my range? Your range is lovely. In fact, I like your whole kitchen. <laughs> so you flatter me. You're probably tired after your long trip. How about a drink? Okay. I'll have a Crosby cocktail. What's that? One drink and then bing. <laughs> With your personality, I would suggest straight corn. <laughs> what a fresh kid. Just a minute, Marlena. You see, neither one of us is a drinking man. Do you have anything a, a little milder? I try a drink of this very mild wine. Now, that sounds better. I'll try it. <laughs> Just a minute. What's... What's the matter? I don't understand. That wine is made here by the Hoppy Indians. <laughs> hoppy Indians? One of the Indians are still hopping in it. <laughs> Costello, that's silly. Come on. Let's go over and watch the boys play roulette. Yes. Or perhaps you both would rather play a game with me. Poker, faro, blackjack. I'd rather play post office. <laughs> but that's a kid's game. Not the way I play it. <laughs> You know, little fat man, I could go for someone like you. You could? Yes. Do you know someone? Sure. I... <laughs> what a fresh kid, Abbott! <laughs> now, look, keep quiet, Costello. Don't talk like that to Marlena. She may know where Black Pete is. Try to win her confidence. Turn on the charm, you know. I'll turn on the charm. Okay, watch me. Marlena, my love, I adore you. You do? Yeah. <laughs> Marlena, will you let me be your slave? Will you let me do something for you that I have never done for any other woman? What's that? Will you let me press your slacks? <laughs> Costello, will you stop that? You just don't know how to handle these Western girls. Oh, yes, I do, Abbott. Marlena, one time I was in love with a bull-legged cowgirl. She was too bull-legged to round up the kettle. What do you mean? Well, she had a terrible time getting her calves together. <laughs> what are you talking about, Costello? You've never even been in love with a girl. Yes, I was. I can see her now. She always wore cotton stockings. Cotton stockings? What happened to her? Nothing. <laughs> but of all the girls I got tattooed on my chest... On your chest? Marlena, I love you the best. The best? Better than the rest. The rest? In the West. The West? On my chest. On your chest? There's an echo in the joint. <laughs> well, there's no question about it, Costello. Marlena Dietrich just can't be bothered with a man like you. Marlena, is that true? Oh, Lou. If you only had the eyes of Clark Gable. Yes. The nose of Tyron Power. Yes, yes. The chin of Gary Cooper. Yes. The face. The face of who? That's all. If you only had a face. <laughs> you know, the kids get nursed. Now, uh, look here, Costello. We're wasting time. Did you forget why we came to Deadpan Gulch? We've got to find Black Pete's hideout. Black Pete? He's the most dangerous character in these parts. Oh, boy, he don't bother me. But he's very tough. He eats little men like you every morning when he gets up. That's me, the breakfast of champions. <laughs> but, Lou, why don't you give up this mad search? It can only lead to your death. I think you got something there, kid. Hey, Abbott, I am scared. Ain't you scared? No, I am not scared. Then why are you biting my nails? <laughs> but no matter what happens, I'm going after Black Pete, Marlena. And if I die, I want you to take this shirt of mine as a keepsake. But suppose you don't die. Then wash it and have it back by Monday. <laughs> and no starch in the collar, either. Listen, Costello, cut out the foolishness. Now we line up everybody in the room until we find our man. That's right, Abbott. Everybody line up and empty out your pockets. Why are you making them empty their pockets? I lost my yo-yo. <laughs> now, wait a minute, boys. It's not necessary to look any further. I am Black Pete. You are? What a fresh kid! 
<laughs> what a stale plot. I think you got something there. Marlena, I still don't believe all this is true. It is true. I took the money from the bank, but I did not steal it. It was my own money. It was my pin money. A hundred thousand dollars pin money? I have very expensive pins. <laughs> if you don't believe me, I'll show you. Mm. I have all the money right here in my stocking. Look. Abbott, what a cute bank. What a place to make a deposit. <laughs> Oh, Marlena, if I give you all my money from the bank, will you put it in your other stocking? Certainly. Costello, don't be an idiot. Your money is safer in the bank. Why do you want to put it in her stocking? Because that's where it's going to draw the most interest. Before we hear from Abbott and Costello again, do you want to find out how hitting ground feels to a paratrooper? Well, just hop off the top of a truck going 15 miles an hour. But don't try that until you're as husky as an all-American halfback and as nimble as a circus tumbler. Even then, you'd have to learn plenty to qualify for the shoot troops, fighters as tough as any in the world. And whether your job is to dangle in midair from silk cords or whether you're making the shoots, you want to get the most out of your off-duty moments. Take Helen Lynch, for instance. She works at the Pioneer Parachute Company, making some of the chutes used by our paratroopers. Like so many of us, Miss Lynch is smoking more these days, and she sticks to camels. She said, quote, Package after package, camels never tire my taste or wear out their welcome. They have such a rich, full flavor, and they're so easy on my throat. Unquote. Camel is first in the service. Actual sales records in post exchanges and canteens show that with men in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, Camel is the favorite. Why is that? Well, just ask your own throat and taste. Camels have a full, rich flavor, the kind that wears well, doesn't go flat. Camels are milder, too, and cooler smoking because they're slow burning. The big reason behind this camel goodness is costlier tobaccos, blended in the years-old camel tradition of quality tobacco blending. If you're smoking more these days, try camels. Your throat and your taste will tell you. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camels. Get a pack tonight. Send the carton to that fellow in the service. And now, a word about next week's program. You'll hear more music from Leith Stevens and the orchestra, more songs by Connie Haynes and the Camel Quintet, and a gripping, dramatic story of life in the squared circle with our guest star, John Garfield. Now, here is a short preview of next week's program. Thousands of people are assembled in Madison Square Garden. All eyes are focused on the two fighters in the center of the ring, Killer Garfield and Cupid Costello. There is a terrific exchange of blows. The crowd is on its feet. Costello is on his face. One, Costello, two, Costello, get up. Three, get up. Get up off your knees and quit playing with those marbles. What marbles? I'm picking up my feet. Sure to tune in next Thursday night at the same time for another big comedy show starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello with John Garfield as our guest. Brought to you with the compliments of Camel Cigarettes. Camel presents three great radio shows each week. Abbott and Costello on Thursday nights. On Friday night, it's the Camel Caravan with Lanny Ross, Herb Schreiner, Xavier Cougat, and Our Town. And Monday nights, Blondie. Marlena Dietrich, who appeared with us tonight, has just completed a new universal picture, Pittsburgh, with John Wayne and Randolph Scott. And here's the latest news about the Camel Caravans, those swell traveling shows that entertain our boys in the Army camps. Fifteen Army and Navy training stations will be visited this week, including Camp Gordon, Georgia, Camp Pendleton, California, and Camp Croft, South Carolina. This is Ken Niles speaking for the makers of Camel Cigarettes. And wishing you all a very pleasant good night.
Ever see a pipe wear in a muzzle? No, sir, and you never will, because that won't keep it from biting. Thing to do is get Prince Albert, the brand that's no bite treated for real smoke in comfort. Another thing, PA's crimp cut, and that means it packs firm and easy and gives you cool one-match burning. You'll find around 50 mild, rich-tasting pipe folds in every handy pocket package of Prince Albert. Try PA for pipe appeal. You'll agree it's the National Joy Smoke. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. And now, here is a man who only wishes he could sing as well as I do. It's Bing Crosley. Bing. Has me in its spell That old black magic That you weave so well Those icy fingers Up and down my spine The same old witchcraft When your eyes meet mine The same old tingle That I Round and round I go Like a leaf that's caught in the tide I should stay away But what can I do? I hear your name And I'm a flame A flame with such a burning desire That only your kiss and put out the fire For you're the lover I have waited for The mate that fate had me created for And every time your lips meet mine Darling, down and down I go Round and round I go in a spin, loving the spin I'm in under that old black magic called love. St. Patrick's Day is just two days off. Just around the corner, you might say, and many happy Hibernians as well as other jolly souls will celebrate by wearing the green, parading, whooping it up, exchanging boisterous blarney and oh, oh, just generally making it a big day in honor of the patron saint of Ireland. Of course, the day also carries a deep religious significance. Those, then, are the well-known aspects of St. Patrick's Day, but I wonder how many of us ever think of food in connection with this day. Oh, a belt or two of Irish, yeah, but uh, what about the food? Now, would you care to guess what a typical St. Patrick's Day dinner would be in comparison with turkey and dressing and so forth on Thanksgiving and, and Christmas? Or ham and Easter or potato salad, devil eggs, cold cuts and watermelon on the Fourth of July picnic, things like that? Would you like to hazard a guess? Or did you know that there was a typical or traditional Irish feast for St. Patrick's Day? Oh, there is. I'll tell you that. As usual, a typical St. Pat's dinner will be served at Kavanaugh's. That's the New York Irish landmark on West 23rd Street on the 17th. Now, Kavanaugh's loves old Ireland and loves to prove that there's more to the country than shamrocks, shillelaghs, and mulligan stew. And believe me, Kavanaugh's food proves it, too. Of course, anyone who's ever wielded a knife and fork in Ireland and tasted the wonderful beef, bacon, butter, ham, salmon, Dublin Bay shrimp and the real Irish potatoes knows that the old sod produces food that, that cannot be rivaled anywhere on the face of the earth. Now, this Irish dinner to be served at Kavanaugh's in New York will necessarily have some North American substitutions, but everything will still be grand, you can bet on that. And the harps will sing and the pipes will play. Now, stand by, will you? We're going to hit you with the menu. 
Let's start with Dublin Bay prawns. Not Irish, but fine shrimp from Florida. But the Killarney sauce is of Irish origin. And the Clare beef soup with added marrow is the Golden Vale soup from County Clare, Ireland's richest pasture land. Rare properties are attributed to this broth. It's said to fortify the inner man against a possible increased intake of the Iskebatha. <laughs> Iskebatha being Gaelic for whiskey, in case you didn't know. Maybe the bath apart means don't bathe in it. I wouldn't know. Well, the salmon is from Nova Scotia, but poached in the Irish way and served with sauce ver and Kerry blue potatoes. White potatoes from Maine. Next, roast saddle of lamb, done according to a special recipe straight from the Emerald Isle. Now then, make way for some baked ham. The ham is truly limerick. You know the hams and bacon from Ireland, don't you? They're great. Now then, what do we top this fine meal off with, huh? What, what dessert will we have there? Well, according to the chef at Cavanaugh's, it's going to be dairy apple tart. Ooh, wow, wow, what a meal. What a meal. I may fly into New York just for dinner, but now I have a bit of an Irish song. It's a lovely one, too. Did your mother come from Ireland? Cause there's something in you Irish Won't you tell me where you get those Irish eyes And before she left Killarney Did your mother kiss the Blarney Cause that little touch of brogue you can't disguise Oh, I wouldn't be romancing I can almost see you dancing While the carry pipers play Sure, and maybe we'll be sharing In the shamrock you'll be wearing On the next St. Patrick's Day Did your mother come from Ireland Cause there's something in you Irish And that bit of Irish steals my heart away Girls, how many different kinds of bulbs do you use in and around your house? Count them sometimes, you'll be amazed. Now, let me give you a clue as to how many of them were introduced by General Electric. Fluorescent lights in your kitchen, introduced by GE. Three-way bulbs in your reading lamp, courtesy of GE. Soft white bulbs in your vanity lamps, a GE development. It's not too surprising, really, when you think that General Electric comes out with a new or improved bulb on the average of every other working day. That's why it pays to look for the GE monogram when you buy bulbs. Put GE bulbs on your shopping list today.
stylish, buddy and group. Stylish indeed. You know what, too, I'd like to hear, Rosemary? No, Ken, what's that? In the middle of an island. In the middle of an island, huh? That's a little rock and roll-y for you, isn't it, Ken? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm very large with the rock and roll. I love it. Well, I'm glad to see that you're so modern, Ken. Well, I try to keep up. Well, this is quite a song to keep up with. Yeah, really bounces along, doesn't it? It sure does. And, of course, I think that we should mention that Mr. Buddy Cole is very, very inspired on the organ part in this piece. Yes, I love the way Buddy Cole played the organ the other day. Maybe we can uh, coax him to do it again. Oh, I think we can. He's very agreeable. Here's In the Middle of an Island, folks. <laughs> Just the monkeys and the palm trees In the middle of an island Plenty time to do some kissing Plenty time for lots of loving And walking barefoot in the sand So there's no island at all Just a picture on my wall time for a board of directors meeting, Bing? Yes, it certainly is. We have a quorum. What's on the docket? <laughs> we have to select a duet. That's well, it's already been selected, Rosie. Buddy Cole found a good suggestion in a Chinese fortune cookie of all places. We thought that love was over, that we were really through. I said I didn't love her. We'd begin anew. And you can all believe me we sure intended to, but we just couldn't say goodbye. The chair and then the sofa, they broke right down and cried. The curtains started waving for me to come inside. I tell you confidentially, the tears were hard to hide. And, and we, we just couldn't say goodbye. The clock was striking twelve o'clock. It smiled on us below With folded hands It seemed to say We'll miss you if you go So I went back and kissed her When I looked around The room was singing love songs Dancing up and down And now we're both so happy Because at last we found That we just couldn't say goodbye so I went back and kissed her When I look around The room was singing love songs Dancing up and down and now we're both so happy because at last we found that we just couldn't say goodbye. It's gentle as a flower's smell, gentle as a tinkle bell. It's gentle, gentle fells, the only dishwashing detergent with lanolin D to protect your hands. 
Lanolin D, the very essence of skin beauty, leaves your hands soft and lovely. Only Gentle Fell's clear golden liquid contains Lanolin D. Dishes and glasses dry sparkling clean, never spotty or streaked. For a spotless reputation, Gentle Fells, F-E-L-S, Fells. Uh, this is the theme uh, song from David Selznick's epic motion picture, Gone with the Wind. My own true love, my own true love, at last I found you. My own true love, no lips but yours, no arms but yours. Will I? And I knew I'd know you, know you by your kiss, by your kiss. You shown true love. I'm yours forever, my own true love. That's all for today, friends. But you can catch us tomorrow at the same spot on your dial. So long for now. Thank you very much. Now let's join a true legend of American comedy who also entertained troops for nearly 60 years, Bob Hope. For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day, see your dentist twice a year. Again this week, the Pepsodent Company presents another in a series of broadcasts to our men in the armed forces throughout the United States. Tonight, for the men of the Army Flexible Gunnery School, the Pepsodent Show, starring Bob Hope. Howdy do, ladies and gentlemen.
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Ariel Gunnery School Hope <laughs> Saying use pepsidents, you gunnery basers And your teeth will never fly out like tracers <laughs> Or This is Bob Gunnery School Hope Telling all you sharpshooters to use pepsidents And though you get nothing but hits on ranges You can always get misses on sofas <laughs> Well, here I am at Las Vegas, Nevada Las Vegas, that's a slot machine with a mayor <laughs> Yes, sir, this is Las Vegas Until payday, then it's Las Vegas <laughs> There are about 5,000 men here at the gunnery school And there are also 100 wax <laughs> That's about the same odds you get on those slot machines <laughs> Every place you go, they have slot machines The slot machines, that's Jesse James with cherries <laughs> And you know how the slot machines have pictures of oranges, lemons, and plums? Well, they play them so fast here, all it shows is a bowl of fruit salad <laughs> And Las Vegas is famous for its easy marriages And they really get married fast here Well, I guess they have to marry them fast If the Justice of the Peace waited too long, the bridegroom would lose his two bucks in the crap game <laughs> This camp here is in the desert, and the desert air is so dry when a private and a superior officer meet, they have to oil each other's elbows before they can salute. <laughs> and there are a lot of coyotes around here. Coyote, that's a wolf that hasn't been inducted. And these gunners are right on their toes They've always got some live ammunition But they'll never introduce you to them <laughs> They took me up today And let me work the guns for a while I wouldn't say my aim was bad But it was the first time in aviation history Anyone ever shot off his own tail <laughs> They really fly at high altitudes around here One crew had to bail out And they were so high They pulled the ripcord And got a three-day pass at the same time <laughs> My brother's an aerial gunner at the last frontier <laughs> That's the hotel here He's an aerial gunner there. He's the only guy that can shoot a seven from the chandelier <laughs> But you can't escape gambling here in Las Vegas Just to be careful, I put my money in my shoe And ten minutes later, my big toe yelled to my little toe You're faded I played some poker at the eight ball bar Of course <laughs> Hello members <laughs> Of course Of course the dealers have no way of knowing what the next card is But when I picked up my hand I was holding a ten jack queen and a blank check <laughs> And they pay you off in silver dollars here That's just to make sure that if any guy puts his winning in his pants He can't walk out of the joint <laughs> Oh, no. Uh oh. Hello. Oh, no. Uh oh. Now, girls, if you want brighter smiles, here's Wendell now. The film you feel on your teeth makes teeth look dull. Pepsodent toothpaste with irium removes that film, uncovers the natural brightness of your smile. You see, Pepsodent, and only Pepsodent, contains irium. It loosens film and floats it away quickly, easily, safely. And when film is gone, Pepsodent toothpaste brings new brightness to your teeth. No wonder more people than ever before use Pepsodent toothpaste today. No wonder it's number one with the men in the service. Try Pepsodent toothpaste for just one week. See if your teeth don't feel cleaner, look brighter. See if it doesn't uncover that natural brilliance of your smile. Get a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste. Remember, Pepsodent and only Pepsodent contains irium. Dear Miriam, sweet Miriam, now she's using irium. Up and down the street, all the boys tweet, tweet. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hello. Don't smile. Oh. 
When Wendell Niles said Pepsodent, that's what he meant. And here's Francis Langford. Fellas, I'd like to introduce a charming young star currently appearing in the Warner Brothers picture, Princess O'Rourke, who made this trip out here from Hollywood with us to see you boys, Miss Jane Wyman. Miss <laughs> Jane Wyman. Hello. Yes, sir. One of the nicest looking Janes I've seen in a long time. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate what you say. That's all right. I appreciate what I see. <laughs> Gee, what a wonderful audience these boys are. Aren't they wonderful, this audience? 2,000 gunners out there concentrating on the same target. <laughs> Jane, these are the boys that slapped... That was my line, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. I was waiting for myself. Look, these are the boys that slapped down the zeros. Yes, I know. I watched them in action. At target practice? No, when you got off the train. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta see a doctor about my jaundice But you know, you made a nice impression on these gunners, Jane Really? Yeah, most of them got together and voted you the site they'd like to rest their peepers on <laughs> Oh, the fellas are nice I was talking to one of the gunners in one of those little ball turrets You were talking to one of the gunners in the little ball turrets? Uh-huh, but a lieutenant came along and made us both get out <laughs> Say, but you know, these gunners are real he-men. I'd like to be a gunner on a flying fortress. Oh, it's tough, Bob. You have to forget fear. Well, that's for me. And you have to forget comfort. That's for me. And you have to forget women. That's for them. <laughs> Say, your husband is Captain Ronald Regan of the United States Army, isn't he? That's right, Bob. I just finished knitting him a sweater last week. No, did it come out all right? Well, I forgot to put arms in it. Yeah. 
Well, tell me, does he wear it? Yes, he does, Bob. In fact, now he's the only officer at his post who salutes from the inside. <laughs> That's cute. Say, did, uh, tell me some one thing. If I, uh, how'd you like the bus trip up here, Jane? <laughs> did you notice we passed through Reno? Yes, Reno is a place where most people go when they want to solve their marital problems. Yeah, that is if they can't get a spot on Mr. Anthony's program. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing about... <laughs> it's a little sneaky, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, one thing about Nevada, Bob, you can certainly get married and divorced pretty quick in this state. Yeah, you get your basic training in Las Vegas... And you go to Reno when you're ready for OCS. What has Reno got to do with OCS? Obnoxious couples separated. <laughs> but those are two colorful cities, Las Vegas and Reno. Jane, it's just a stretch of land separated by alimony. <laughs> You're right, Bob. You see all types of couples in Reno getting divorces, young and old. Yeah, let's show the folks. First, the young couple. Okay, I'll be the wife. Yeah, doesn't leave me much choice, does it? Okay. <laughs> okay, stand, Captain, take it, boy. I can't go on. I just can't go on. I cannot go on. You can go now. The lights just changed. <laughs> And hurry, go ahead, get a divorce Well, if you feel that, wa that way Here's your wedding ring back And here's your engagement ring I don't want them Turn them into the scrap drive I did They turned them back <laughs> Well, who are you going to name as the other woman? Our cow Or whoever it was that taught you to kiss like that <laughs> Well, you told me yourself I make love like a movie star Yeah, like Lionel Barrymore <laughs> This is the end, Robert You behave like a beast You insult all my friends I insult all your friends? Of course you do When the Joneses walked in You didn't have to say Hide the silverware Hide the silverware Sure I did It was theirs, wasn't it? <laughs> and Robert <laughs> Oh, Robert What did you have against my mother? Oh, nothing much Except she kept using my hair tonic On her mustache <laughs> Oh, Always picking on mother oh, What do you mean Wasn't yesterday your birthday And didn't I give her a watch Yes Made a nice booby trap Didn't it <laughs> And now here's the old couple Getting a divorce Take it stand boy. <laughs> Gosh ma Why are you divorcing me Well We've been married 50 years And you ain't never kissed me Well, I told you I was bashful <laughs> But you ain't never held my hand yet Gee, ain't you had no experience? Nope, I was brought up in a one-horse town <laughs> Some other fellow owned the horse <laughs> Well, I don't care I'm gonna get a divorce and start living I'm gonna sing and dance And stay out late nights Yep, yep I'm gonna cook with gas Yeah, you're through cooking You're ready for basting <laughs> Now, you're quieter. I'll tighten your suspenders and you won't be able to get your feet back on the ground. <laughs> oh, but, Ma, you can't get a divorce. I ain't never run around with other women. Don't make no difference. I'm naming your heating pad as correspondent. Yeah. And besides, you're a wrinkled old cuss. Look who's talking about wrinkles. You got more slit trenches on your kisser than Mrs. Prune face. <laughs> Get a divorce if you want to But you come running back to me Before two hours has passed What makes you think I'll come running back in two hours? Well, you know yourself You can't go no longer Than that unburped <laughs> Pa, pa, you changed Whatever happened to all your Get up and go? Oh, it got up and went <laughs> I gotta admit I ain't been able to pucker no good Since I lost my teeth Yeah, yeah, it used to be When I wanted a kiss I'd snuggle up close and whisper Press your lips close to mine, darling. Now I gotta grab your ear trumpet. <laughs> Come on, Jane, hold it now. <laughs> and yell, slap the app to me, Pap. <laughs> You're too old for romance, Robert. You can't even pucker your lips. I can't pucker my lips? Well, watch. Gosh, your lips are puckered Yep, now pull my face out of the vacuum cleaner <laughs> and, now, and now here's Jane Wyman I broke my 
my watch the other night. I broke my watch cause I wound it too tight. I broke my watch round a quarter to nine. So I took it to the corner to a friend of mine. Well, I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. The funny dirty watchmaker at the jewelry store. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. He's got it on the beam steadier than ever before. Oh, look at the old man go. Now he's a hundred and three, and that's no lie. Oh, look at the old man go. When he lifts that glass up to his eye, well I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. The funny dirty watchmaker at the jewelry store. He fixed my watch, he fixed it quick, and pretty soon he was making it tick. He made it tick with a beautiful beat, and I watched him through that window. From outside on the street, well, I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. The funny daddy, watchmaker. Pepsodent, and only Pepsodent, contains irium. And Pepsodent toothpaste with irium removes film that makes teeth look dull. It loosens film and floats it away. Quickly, easily, safely. And when film is gone, Pepsodent toothpaste with irium brings new brilliance to your teeth, uncovers the natural brightness of your smile. So get a tube of Pepsodent toothpaste with irium. Remember, Pepsodent toothpaste. Because only Pepsodent contains irium. Dear Miriam, sweet Miriam, now she's using irium. Up and down the street, all the boys tweet, tweet. Hello. Hello. Dump smile. Oh. Hello. Dump smile. Oh. When Wendell Niles said Pepsodent, that's what he meant. Tonight, folks, Bob Hope is in Nevada. Bob Hope's reputation is well known here in Nevada, so when he arrives in Las Vegas, the mayor greets him on the steps of the city hall. Mr. Hope, I want you to feel right at home here. Thank you, mayor. So I'm presenting you with a keyhole to the city. <laughs> yes, this has been a wonderful visit for Bob and the cast, and now surfeited from his adventures of the day, Bob goes to his hotel and he is soon fast asleep. <laughs> Dreams like a baby. Mama. Mama. Come on, Mama, lay that pistol down. <laughs> Bob sleeps on. He dreams of the days of the Old West. Betty Grable. I say he dreams of the Old West. Betty Grable. Pleasant sort of a rut, isn't it, huh? <laughs> Gee, I wish I could get back to those wild and woolly days. I'll take you back. I'm the spirit of the future. I don't want the spirit of the future. Where's the spirit of the past? He's out looking for spirits of the present. <laughs> Bob dreams on. He sees the rip-roaring Las Vegas of yesteryear. It was really tough. Cattle rustlers, outlaws, killers. The town was so tough, even the hotels had cannon towels. Yes, it was a lawless town then. It needed cleaning up. Bob dreams he is the two-fisted editor of the Las Vegas Bugle. And with the one he's got, we're weeded out him. I'll clean up this town. I'm a real newspaperman. 
I got printer's ink in my veins. Well, get me a blotter. <laughs> We've got to get out the Sunday morning edition. Start the paper through the press. Okay, Chief. <laughs> What was that? Buck Rogers. He'll never learn to keep his head down. Chief, we need news. We'll get some. I got Professor Colonna working as a reporter for us. He's the biggest ace in the business. <laughs> Las Vegas. Las Vegas bladder. Uh, hello. Hello, Hope. This has never been scoop, hot, flash, late, bullet, and up to the minute on the spot. Come on, reporting. Yes, Colonna. What's new? <laughs> Kelowna, there's been another bank holdup and the bandits took $2,000 from the teller's drawers. What do you make of it? That's no place for a man to hide money. <laughs> but I'll get the story, Hope. I just followed those holdup men into a burlesque show. Kelowna, a fine reporter you are in a burlesque show. You're supposed to be out getting some bare facts. Well? <laughs> ah, but never mind that, Hope. I got a great story. I'm down at the railroad station, and there's some guy running off with the mayor's wife. Professor, this is a family newspaper. We can't print anything about a guy running off with the mayor's wife. Can't? No. Okay, honey. Guess we can buy the tickets now. <laughs> Cologne, I've been getting complaints about you all day. You were seen peeking in the bedroom window of the Murphy Ranch. And ten miles down the road, another ranch. Have you any explanation, Kelowna? Oh, I just got a fast horse, that's all. <laughs> Kelowna, you're following in the footsteps of an idiot. Well, lead on. <laughs> but I'll get on the story of those bank robbers, Hope. Kelowna, I know where the crooks are. Meet me at the eight-ball saloon. I'm going there now. Hurry. <laughs> Fellas, well, this is the famous eight ball saloon. <laughs> Gee, what a short floor show! <laughs> well, it's Vera Vague. Yeah! <laughs> Miss Vague, why are you down here in this rough saloon? Well, I'm the sheriff, Mr. Hope. Uh, didn't you see the star on my ankle? Yeah, well, what's it doing on your ankle? Nobody looks there. This your first trip to Las Vegas, bud? <laughs> so you're the sheriff, Miss Vega. Have you pinched anybody today? Well, not in the line of duty, no. <laughs> oh, shame on me. <laughs> I wonder why I have so much fun. Well, perhaps you know more in this childhood. <laughs> Boy, you. <laughs> Why don't you go into the bar and have a head put on you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. I like being sheriff, Mr. Yeah, but Miss Vague, if you're a sheriff, you have to spend all of your time hunting for dangerous men. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you just think I chase men and get paid for it, too? <laughs> say, but those guns on your hips, what are they, 44s? I should say not. They're not an inch over 30. Oh, you oh. mean the guns? <laughs> Just the same, I can get men without using guns. Yeah, well, I'm from Missouri. Well, don't be ashamed of it. Some of the best mules in the country come from there. <laughs> Say, Miss Vague, what do you do with the desperate criminals you catch? Well, I lock them in my apartment, of course. Your apartment, Miss Vague. Why don't you put them in jail? Slow-witted son of a gun, isn't it? <laughs> Well, Miss Vague, if you're the sheriff, why are you spending the whole evening hanging around this saloon? Well, you see, I thought I'd catch my boyfriend, Waldo. This is on his route. Uh, I'm so worried about Waldo, Mr. Hope. He inherited his father's weakness for drinking. Oh, he's a chip off the old block? No, no, a stave off the old barrel. <laughs> but I don't care. Things are approving. He's only drinking half as much as he used to. Half as much? Yes, cut out the chasers. <laughs> Miss Vague, where does Waldo spend most of his time? Around the headquarters for G-Men. Headquarters for G-Men. Yes, poor fellow, he thinks the FBI sign means free beer inside. <laughs> Hello, Las Vegas Bugle. Say, Hope, hot news. The big movie star, Gloria Oomph, just got in town. She's up here in the commercial hotel. Room 318. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm right, I'm right outside her door now. You're not peeking through the keyhole, are you, Kelowna? Oh, no. It ain't my turn. <laughs> Kelowna, I thought you were going to meet me here at the Eight Ball Saloon and help me catch the crooks. I'm coming home, but my horse is running away. Whoa! 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 Now well, we're coming to a big hill. This will slow him down. What do you know? He shifted gears. <laughs> Is Professor Cologne on his way here, Mr. Hope? Yes, he's coming like the wind. He's taking the Las Vegas bus. <laughs> yes, that's, sir. that's a local joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, Mr. Hope. So are you. <laughs> I wonder when the outlaw's coming. All right, everybody, reach. Reach for what? Don't confuse me. I'm a new man. (laughs) So, Colonna, you're the crook who shot the cashier and stole the money. How could you be so disgusting? How could you be so abominable? How so despicable? Well, I studied nights. Colonna, do you have any scruples? What would I be doing with Russian money? <laughs> All right, Hope, I'll admit it. I'm really that famous outlaw, the rattlesnake of the West. What's a rattlesnake? You know, the ki- kind with a tail gunner. <laughs> I'm the sheriff, Professor. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll shoot it out, and I'll shoot first. Oh, my gun jam! Look, Colonna, only a dirty coward would shoot an unarmed woman. Well, here goes. <laughs> Didn't hurt a bit (laughs) Hmm, perhaps I'm not standing close enough (laughs) Didn't even feel it (laughs) Oh no, I'll use my elephant gun I'll unpack her trunk Now (laughs) Now don't move Thank you, Aerial Gunners. You know, in the old days, the covered wagons lumbered across Nevada, and Dad held the reins, and Mother and Baby crouched inside, and sitting up front in the buckboard and hanging out the tailgate were a couple of youngsters with long tom rifles and double barrel shotguns, and they shot straight, and they weren't afraid of anything. A hundred years have gone by, and the old wagon trails have sprouted wings, and the same kind of kids are riding new trails through the skies, from England across the Channel to Berlin, from Sicily across the Straits to Italy, from South Pacific bases to Rabaul. The buckboard is the sun-kissed nose of a B-17, and the tailgate is the rear compartment of a B-24, where a guy on both knees is throwing 50 caliber deaths at Zeros and Messerschmitts. They call this guy the aerial gunner, but when the big forts go out, this gunner is a destroyer protecting a human convoy. And he's a wall of hot lead between enemy planes and his buddies inside his ship. When those thousand plane raids take off, it's up to the gunner to punch the return portion of their round-trip ticket. Yes, sir, these gunners are the boys that keep flying high, so our flag will always be waving high. Good night. Since the War Department does not endorse any product, this broadcast is not intended as a pepsident endorsement. This broadcast came to you from Las Vegas, Nevada. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. Don't miss the Laugh-A-Minute Love Story. True crime stories of the 1940s and 1950s are up next with Jack Webb's Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, Crime Prevention Week, now being observed nationally, is designed for one purpose, to emphasize that crime is your personal enemy, costs money and lives, it weakens the moral and physical strength of your community. Show your respect for the law by cooperating with your police officer 52 weeks a year, Join the fight to stamp out crime, the ally of treason. The story you are about to hear.
here is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Bunko Detail. A husband and wife confidence team has shifted operations to your city. Their criminal record dates back 17 years. They're masters in the art of swindling. Your job? Get them. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first pop will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, April 20th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain McCauley. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10.35 a.m. when we got to the Holy Gospel Tabernacle. The pastor's house. Look at that palm tree. Yeah. Windstorm sure didn't do it any good. Well, it was really blowing last night. It woke me up a couple of times. Yeah, not me. I slept like a baby. What'd you say the name here was, Olson? Yeah. Got it right here. Uh, Reverend Andrew Olson. Mm-hmm. Doesn't seem to be anybody at home. I'll try it again. said on the phone he'd either be here or at the church. Where's that? Just around the corner. Faces on South Spring. Not a very wealthy looking neighborhood. Mm-hmm. It must be the church up there. Huh? Mm-hmm. Sure could stand a coat of paint. Grounds are well kept, aren't they? Nice flower bed. Look at that. Giant pansies. Tried some in the backyard last year. Too bad. What do you mean? Giant snails. Sliced them right off at the roots. Guess that must be him up at the front, huh? Better close the door, huh? Oh, yeah. Come on. Uh, excuse me, sir? Oh. Didn't see him. You the Reverend Olson? Yes, can I help you? My name's Friday, Reverend. I talked to you on the phone. Oh, yes, Sergeant. And this is my partner, Sergeant Romero. How do you do? Oh, ain't that nice. Sergeant Merrill? No, that's Romero, Reverend. Oh, excuse me, Romero. Didn't expect you so soon. A little busy here fixing the pulpit. It happened last Sunday. What's that, Reverend? I guess I got carried away with my sermon. Quite a commotion. Oh? I leaned forward in the pulpit. This whole section here just splintered and broke right off. Ruined my whole sermon. Well, I can finish this up later. Have a chair there, officers. No, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, there it is, Sergeant. The names, descriptions. Mr. and Mrs. Tom Herbert. That's the name they used, anyway. Mm-hmm. Would you mind briefing us on how it happened, Reverend? When did you first meet this couple? He came to us a little over a month ago. Didn't have any reason to be suspicious. Mr. Herbert showed me some fine references. I didn't think it was necessary to check them. What kind of approach did they use? Could you tell us? 
Well, the first visit, Mrs. Herbert did most of the talking. She told me she and her husband wanted to write a history of our church. It was supposed to be part of an historical book on all the churches in the county. Naturally, I felt a little flattered about it. Mm-hmm. Did this Mr. and Ms. Herbert make any demands for money or to write about your church, I mean? Oh, no, no. There was no money involved at first. They said all they wanted was our cooperation in doing some of the research work. You know, looking up dates, names, things like that. Oh, I see. They seemed very sincere, both of them. Didn't drink, smoke. They worked very hard during the search and writing. I don't know why they had to change. Would have been nice having history written about our church. Yes, sir. When did they first bring up the idea of money? Well, Mr. Herbert came to me one day and showed me this letter. It was supposed to be from the people who were going to publish the history of our church. The letter said, well, because of certain business reasons, the whole thing was off. They couldn't publish the book. Mr. Herbert acted very sorry. Mm-hmm. Did he leave that letter with you, Reverend? No, he took it with him. Mm-hmm. I felt badly about the whole thing. They were doing all that work and then the book not being published. Mm-hmm. Well, did the Herberts broach the idea of you and the church putting up the money to print the book? Well, no, not exactly, but I guess they gave me the idea. How do you mean? They suggested that I talk it over with the church board, so I did. Hmm. We all agreed it would be a shame to give up the idea of the book after so much work had gone into it. Is that when you agreed to finance the book? Well, the board and I did, yes. It's all my fault, though. I helped to persuade them. And the money came out of church funds, is that it? As a matter of fact, it didn't. We only have a small operating fund, so you can see we're a small church. The congregation isn't wealthy. And where did the money come from, sir? Well, for one thing, the ladies of the altar society put on a Sunday afternoon ham dinner. It made some money, and then the Herbert suggested we help sell advertising to pay part of the cost, so we did that, too. It still wasn't enough. Well, exactly how much did you turn over to the Herbert? $804.61. I had to borrow 350 from the bank to make it. It'll all have to be paid back. People who paid for their advertising, too. It'll all have to come out of our pocket. It's a terrible thing. Yes, it is. Terrible. I don't know what I'm going to do. I hate to ask the congregation for it. Their offerings have always been so generous. And they're not wealthy either. They're just working people. Well, when was the last time that you heard from this Mr. and Mrs. Herbert? A week ago, I guess. Yes, it was last Monday. I got anxious and called them at the hotel. It's on South Grand... I can give you the address. They told me when the books would be ready. It said it would be on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the last I heard of them. No forwarding address. No other place that you think we might find them? No, I'm sorry. Just don't have any idea. It's so hard to believe anyone would do such a thing to us. Yes, sir. I wonder if we could have the address of the hotel. Yes, all right. It will come with me. I have it over at the house. Did uh, Mr. and Ms. Herbert have a car? Do you know, Reverend? I don't think so. If they did, I never saw it. I know what I'm going to tell the congregation. $800, that's a lot of money to our people. Yes, sir. Tell me, Sergeant. I don't mean to be uncharitable, but Mr. and Mrs. Herbert, do they have a criminal record? Have they done this sort of thing before? Well, their descriptions seem to fit a couple that we've been looking for. They've been working with churches in this area on and off for a couple of years now. Can't understand why they do such a thing. It's almost like robbing a poor box. Yes, sir, they've done that, too. 11.15 a.m., we went back to the city hall and pulled the package on the suspects, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Herbert. They were a veteran man and wife confidence team who'd worked the Los Angeles area and other large cities around the country. Their specialty seemed to be swindling churches and clergymen. Over a period of 17 years, they piled up a long record involving frauds and various bunco games, but they'd only been brought to trial once. The case had been dismissed for lack of sufficient evidence. 11.35 a.m., we took mug shots of Mr. and Mrs. Herbert out to the Reverend Olson, and he identified them. We checked the hotel on South Grand where they'd been staying. No lead. We got out a local broadcast and an APB on them. Together with the sheriff's office, we sent a special bulletin about the Herberts to the pastors of the different churches in the city and county. From the list of names on the mama sheet, we began checking out all the known friends and relatives of the suspects. One of them was a Clyde Harris, proprietor of a physical culture school out in the Wilshire District. 1 p.m. Tuesday. We drove out to talk to him. Which way, Joe? Right down the street, the blue and white sign. Oh, yeah. Venus School of Physical Culture. I can make you an all-American girl, Clyde Harris manager. 
Looks like the office here. No, we're supposed to meet him in the gym. That's next door. Oh. Yeah. Here. No, go ahead. No, yeah. Back this way, I guess. Collison, you're doing it wrong. Your pelvis is all out of position. Excuse me, are you quiet, Harry? Yes, did you want something? Uh, police officer, Mr. Harry, would like to talk to you? Oh, yeah, of course. Could you hold on half a minute? Sure, go right ahead. Uh, Francis, Francis, would you take over here for a few minutes? I have to talk to these gentlemen. Ladies, Francis is going to count for you for a while. You go right ahead with the lesson. I'll be back in a few minutes. Back here, officer. Won't take too long, will it? No, sir, just a few minutes. Sorry to interrupt your lesson. That's all right. I just don't want to have the ladies thinking I neglect them. They pay good money for these exercises. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here you are. Have a chair. Thank you. Well, you said something about Tom Herbert on the phone, Sergeant. What's it all about? Well, we understand that you're a friend of the Herberts, Mr. Harris. Yeah, I knew Tom and Doris a couple of years back. Haven't seen much of them lately. When was the last time you saw them? Let's see. Must be two, three months anyway. Anything wrong? Well, do you know where we could locate them? I don't know for sure. Last time I saw them, they were at a hotel downtown in South Grand, I think. You know, South Grand, right near people. You have no idea where they moved when they left there? No, I didn't even know they'd moved. They haven't phoned or contacted you at all in the last month or so? No, not a word. They're not in a jam again, are they? We'd like to talk to them, that's all. Would, would you know of any of their favorite spots around town, eating, drinking places? No, I don't think I could say. They got around quite a bit. You checked with some of their other friends around town, the Patton, the Thompson, Mike Runyon. What was that last one? Mike Runyon, very good friend of the Herbert. Ben? No, I don't recall the name. Well, how could we get in touch with this Runyon, Mr. Harris? He's got a phone. Come out in the office. We'll call him if you like. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll get Mike on the line for you and introduce you. Uh, would you mind talking to him, Harris? Don't tell him it's for us. Just ask if he knows where the Herbert's are. Would you mind? Yeah, all right. Hello, Mike. Clyde Harris, Mike. Yeah, how are you? Fine. Fine? Yeah, a long time. Say, Mike, you any idea where Tom and Doris Herbert are? Mm-hmm. Is that right? How about that, huh? Eh? You don't. No, that's okay. It's not important. Sure thing, Mike. Make it soon, huh? Right. Goodbye. Yeah. No, he doesn't know where the Herberts are staying. Saw him a week ago out in Hollywood, though. Says they're doing fine. How do you mean? Ran into him outside that big church on Hollywood Boulevard. They told Mike all about it. They really got religion. That's so? Yeah. They're even writing a book about the church. We called back Mike Runyon, the friend of the suspect, and he gave us the location of the church where he'd seen Mr. and Mrs. Herbert. Ben and I drove out there and talked to the pastor, Reverend John Kenworth. We showed him the Herbert's mug shots, and he identified them. They were going under the name of Williams, and supposedly they were writing a book about the history of the church. To cover publishing expenses and research, more than $1,000 from Perry's contributions had been placed in a separate account at a local bank. Reverend Kenworth told us that it was a special joint account, and the Herberts had access to it. Ben got on the phone and called the bank. How's that? Yes, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah, all right, thank you. What did they say? The two of them were in the bank yesterday. They didn't draw out everything. How much did they leave? Three dollars. Ben and I checked with the teller at the bank and showed him mug shots of Mr. and Ms. Herbert. He identified them as the couple who'd withdrawn the church funds. We went to the hotel address the suspects had given to Reverend Kenworth. They checked out two days before. The search went on. Two weeks passed. We ran out of leads. No further reports on the couple. A month went by. Tuesday, May 23rd. We got an APB from San Francisco on a couple answering the Herbert's description. They were still working the church angle. During the next six weeks, we got reports on them from Washington, Oregon, Nevada, and Northern California. In Sacramento, they apparently changed their M.O. for the first time. 
They started selling phony health insurance policies. They promised everything, and they had a lot of takers. One of the big selling points was a clause which promised full protection if anybody in the family should come down with polio. From Sacramento, they headed south to Oakland, and then to Fresno. On July 10th, the complaints started to come in, and we knew the Herberts had moved into Los Angeles with their health insurance racket. One of the first victims was a Carl Fogarty. He lived out in the Westlake area. There's a policy they gave me, Soy. They pick health insurance. Not worth the paper it's printed on. When did they sell you this, Mr. Fogarty? You remember? Uh, three weeks ago, I guess. Never would have known it was phony if my boy hadn't come down with polio. How's he getting along? Not too good. Right leg. He's got a bad there. Not as if we don't have enough grief. We've got to lose out on this bone insurance. You mind if I take a look at that policy, sir? No. Go ahead. Here you are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, same outfit, Joe. Apex Health Insurance. Same phony address. Yeah. Would you remember the man who sold you this, do you think? I think I would, yeah. I wonder if you'd mind looking through these pictures, Mr. Fogarty. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Look at them carefully, if you will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one. That's him. I remember. Who's he? His name's Herbert. When he came in to tell you this policy, was he alone? Yeah, he was. And a real good sales talk. How much did you pay for the insurance? Let me see. Forty-three dollars and some odd cents. Mm-hmm. I remember that because I cashed him a war bond and I took five dollars out of the rent money. Outside of this policy here, you have no other papers that the man might have given you? No, nothing but this business card here. Mm-hmm. He gave me that. You see here, the same name, Apex Health Insurance. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Fogarty. We hope your little boy goes out of it all right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, here's our card, sir. Is there anything we can do, we'll give us a call. Sure. Okay. Uh, about time we check the office, huh? I think so. Do you have a phone here, Mr. Fogarty? Oh, yes, yeah, Sergeant. Uh, straight back in the hall there. Help yourself. Thank you very much. Two five seven two. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Fred. Joe Friday. Anything for us in the book? Hmm. West Seventh. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks, Fred. Anything doing? It yeah, looks pretty good. Office got a call from a printing shop out on West 7th. The manager's got an order he's not too sure about. How do you mean? It's for a batch of letterhead stationery, business cards. Yeah? For who? Apex Health Insurance. You are listening to Dragnet for the step-by-step solution to tonight's authentic case history. Here's step-by-step are the actual reasons why Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette. Why in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarette. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Compare Fatima yourself. Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes. But your first puff will tell you. Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Insist on Fatima. Start enjoying the quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. Wednesday, July 10th, 4 p.m., Ben and I drove back downtown to the printing shop on West 7th Street and talked with the manager. He told us that the order for stationery and business cards for the Apex Health Insurance Company had been placed two days before. He said he'd become suspicious after reading a story in one of the newspapers about the polio insurance fraud. He also said that the customer who had ordered the stuff was a woman. She told him that she would call and pick up the order on Friday. We showed the manager a handful of mug shots. He could give us only a partial identification of Mrs. Herbert's picture. 
called the office, told them we were going on stakeout, and arranged for a release. Ben and I spent the rest of Wednesday and all day Thursday and Friday in the rear of the print shop where we could keep an eye on everyone entering the place. Friday, 6 p.m., no sign of the Herberts, not a trace. Saturday, the same, no sign of either one of them. Monday, more waiting. The suspect stayed away. Tuesday, 3.30 p.m., I went out the rear door, went down the street and got some cigarettes, and then I headed back for the print shop. Ben? Keep your coat on, Joe. Just call the office for a relief. Why, what's doing? That Clyde Harris, friend of the Herberts, guy who runs the physical culture school. Yeah, what about him? He called the office, wanted to talk to us. I phoned him out there at the gym. Yeah? He told me he was out drinking last night, and he met Mrs. Herbert at a bar. She was alone. Did he tell you where to find her? The Greenwood Apartment, 603. When the relief men arrived, Ben and I left and drove across town to the Greenwood Apartments on Taylor Street. It was a three-story frame building set back from the sidewalk behind a sloping lawn lined with a box hedge. We checked the names on the mailboxes. The name T.J. Bronson was listed for apartment 603. We rang, but there was no answer. Better try to manage, huh? Yeah. Mm, it's a nice place. The insurance racket must be paying off for him. Excuse me, here we go. Mm -hmm. Yes, are you the manager here? That's right. Thatcher's my name. Can I help you? Police officers, Mr. Thatcher. We're trying to locate the people in 603. Oh, that crazy woman tried to blow up the place last night. Why, what do you mean? Mrs. Bronson, she came in drunk about 2 a.m. No sense at all. About 3 a.m., the folks from 601 called me and they said they smelled gas. I went up there and found her in the kitchenette. I'd like a light gas stove turned on going full blast. Crazy. Where's her husband? Couldn't say chasing around again, I think. Hadn't been home in a week. Lucky I got to that gas before somebody lit a match. You say it happened about three this morning? That's right, it's a crazy woman. She'll be all right, too. Where is she now, do you know? Yeah, County Hospital. 4.25 p.m. Ben and I got in touch with the office and arranged for a stakeout at the Herbert's apartment. We called homicide and checked on the attempt suicide report. They informed us that the woman had been taken to the psycho ward, County Hospital. We went over to the hospital, checked at the main desk, and identified ourselves. The nurse on duty had us shown to the ward where the suspect, Doris Herbert, was confined. She was a halfway attractive woman in her late 40s. Short, bleach blonde hair, dark eyes with deep circles under them. She turned and looked up as we stopped beside her bed. Excuse me, you Doris Herbert? Uh, Is your name Doris Herbert? Who do you want? Police officers would like to talk to you for a minute. No, uh, I knew you'd be around. I don't care. Ma'am? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the whole rotten thing. I knew you'd come. I just have a few questions, ma'am. It won't take long. Go ahead. I don't care. Did you find him yet? You mean your husband? He's not my husband. Not anymore. Him and that cheap girl behind my back sneaking around. Twenty years we've been happy and he throws me away. Where's your husband now, Miss Herman? With her. He's been with her a week. He doesn't even care I'm here. Twenty years ago he cared. I found him, taught him something. I taught him everything he knows. This girl that your husband's with, where does she stay, do you know? Yeah, an apartment. It's on Franklin, right around the corner, Franklin and Laurel. You were close, weren't you? You knew it was us. What's this girl's name? Marie Daly. I saw her with him. Tell me something. Yeah. You know it was us, Tommy, and me, the insurance? Yeah, we knew it was you. I didn't like it. It wasn't a clean game, Tom's idea. He made money, but I didn't like it. It wasn't clean. All right, Miss Herbert, we'll talk to you later. No, not me. I'm going to die. I'm going to die and forget all about it. You be sure and get him, won't you, Tom? i tell him everything he knows. Get him. You're sure about the address? Yeah, I'm sure. Tell me something. Hmm? Why do you have to do it to me? Throwing me away, lying, taking that cheap girl. Why do you do it to me? Well, you ought to have an idea. Huh? You taught him everything he knows. Before we left the hospital, we made arrangements to have Doris Herbert transferred to the prison ward. 5 p.m., we drove out to the apartment house at Franklin and Laurel and checked with the landlady. She told us that Tom Herbert's girlfriend, Marie Daly, had checked out of her apartment the day before. She said the Daly girl had a middle-aged man with her. We showed the landlady Herbert's mugshot, and she identified him as that man. She had no forwarding address on her, but she did remember the name of the express truck 
was called to pick up the Daily Girl's baggage. We checked with the express company and found that the trunks had been taken to the Lockheed Air Terminal. We started calling the airline. 6.30 p.m. We finally got a report that a man answering Tom Herbert's description had booked passage for two on a flight to Mexico City. The plane was scheduled to leave at 8.35 that night. Ben and I drove out to the airport and went on stakeout. 8.15 p.m. We waited. 8.20. No sign of them. United Airlines, mainliner flight 649 from Denver and intermediate cities. Now, Getting a little late, huh? Yeah, 324, they're cutting it close. Going in the bar, Joe. Take a look. Yeah, that's him. Let's go. Not hard to spot. What's the matter with the girl? Looks pretty drunk. All right, come on. Reverend Water, how am I? What you want? Reverend Water, yeah. Haven't got much time. We don't want to miss that plane. We don't miss it. Are you Tom Herbert? Yes, what is it? Police officers like talk to you downtown. Just a minute. This must be some kind of mistake. No mistake, Herbert. We talked to your wife. Let's go. Where's the Tom? What do they want? Nothing. It's a mistake. Now, look, officers, I don't know what this is all about, but we have to get a plane. The 835. I can't go downtown with you. Can't we talk it over here? I'm sure we can straighten this out. Your wife copped out, Herbert. Now, let's make it easy, huh? Come on, lady. What's he talking about, Tom? My wife What's he mean? I told you it's a mistake. Now, be reasonable, huh, officer? All we want to do is take a trip. We've been planning on this. New clothes, new luggage. Here's your hat. Our car's outside. It's a mistake. You can't do this. We planned on it. We've been waiting a long time for this. Yes, sir. So have we. Come on, let's go. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 88, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, each week we're honored with letters from listeners all over the country. Letters telling us that you've bought Fatimas and you find them the best of all long cigarettes. Well, thanks to you and the many thousands of other smokers who have switched to Fatimas, I'm happy to report that more people are now enjoying Fatimas than ever before. January sales figures just released show that in the East, Fatima sales are up 56%. In the Middle West, sales up 133%. And here on the coast, Fatima shows an increase of 68%. Well, that means Fatima sales are up nearly 70% all over the country. Now, if you haven't yet discovered Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma, I suggest that you buy a pack tomorrow. When you do... I'm convinced you'll agree with Fatima smokers everywhere. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Mr. and Mrs. Tom Herbert were tried and convicted on several counts of grand theft. They are now confined in the state penitentiary for the term prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by confinement for not less than one, nor more than ten years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. David Harding, Counter Spy, solves an exciting case next on NBC. Now it's time to pay a visit to Duffy's Tavern. So we take you now to Duffy's Tavern, starring Archie himself, Ed Gardner.
Oh, Duffy's starving. Why do you late meat to eat? Archie the man just bacon. Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. Huh? Well, I was busy. I was talking to Joe Buck. He just got out of the army. Yeah, he came close to winning the Purple Heart, too. Yeah. He stuck himself putting on his discharge pen. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's a very big crowd here tonight, Duffy uh, Kind of a family crowd Well, uh, Crackpot O'Toole's here with his aunt uh, Moriarty's here with his father And uh, Free Drink O'Reilly's here with his old granddad <laughs> Yeah Yep Good old Free Drink He's full of holiday spirits <laughs> Yeah, singing Christmas carols mm. I'm dreaming of a tight Christmas <laughs> Hey, uh, by the way, Duffy, that reminds me A guy was in from the uh, water department today Well, he says as long as we never use no water here They'd like the pipes back <laughs> And, uh, incidentally Now that I got you on the phone How's chances for a little advance against me Christmas bonus? An advance against me bonus That's funny, I can hear you <laughs> But Duffy, I gotta take a dame out and I ain't got no dough. Huh? With what you pay me, I should make ends meet? <coughs> Duffy, my ends ain't met in so long they wouldn't know each other. <laughs> huh? Well, what do you say? How about it? Huh? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Someday them pennies is gonna pinch him back where he least expects it. <laughs> Ah, oh, that Duffy For ten years now Every year I've been asking him for a bonus And for ten years he's turned me down mm. You think it could be a hint? Hmm The incipient gratitude of the man <laughs> After all Who is it that works from twelve hours a day Seven days a week? Me <laughs> I'm talking about mental work, Eddie Who is it that worries night and day about this business And how much profit we're taking in? Mr. Duffy. I, uh, <clears throat> I guess I'm not making myself clear. Who is it that stands here? That's and... you. <laughs> <laughs> now, come on, I see you, you. You can relax, Mr. Archie. Why do you worry so much about money? Ain't you heard that money is the root of all evil? Well, I guess I got an evil mind. <clears throat> but it ain't for myself I want the dough, Eddie. You see, last night... I met a dame at a party. Uh-oh. Off with your hats, boys. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, Betty, and you should have seen her. What a luscious baby. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I took one look at her and, poop, <clears throat> I was spellbound. Spellbound, huh? Yeah. She was standing there holding a dummy tass of tea in one hand and... And then the other, a razor. <laughs> Eddie, this is a different kind of a spellbound. <clears throat> this is a wonderful dame, tall and, uh, you know, extremely well-built. Uh, sort of a double-armed DeMillo. Uh, <laughs> she uh, looked just like she stepped out of Earl Carroll's. Earl Carroll's what? <laughs> no, Eddie, this dame is different. And she goes, uh, she goes for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> Is different. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? Her name? Ambergris. <laughs> Ambergris McNulty. I just call her Amber for short. Uh. You have never seen anything so beautiful, Eddie, and plus the fact that she has a very fine mind. Wait a minute. If she's that good looking, how come you noticed her mind? Well, why not? Well, nothing, but you're older than I thought. <laughs> When are you going to see her again? Well, that's the trouble, Eddie. I ain't got the dough to see her. She's uh, used to them uptown places like the store club and the Cobra Cabana, you know? <laughs> them kind of joints where you can't tell a waiter from a customer. <laughs> got to have money to go to those places or you make you feel like a goon. Uh, hello, Art. <laughs> yeah. Clifton Finnegan, how are you? Arch, I'm distressed. I just heard the most terrible thing. What? Clancy the cop told me that a man is hurt in a traffic accident every 15 minutes. So? How can the guy stand it? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe.
maybe the guy is redundant. Look, Flanagan, <clears throat> have you got any dough? Why? Well, you see, I got a date with a dame. Oh, dames, you're all alike. They're only out after one thing. Money. <laughs> Clifton Finnegan, buy me a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> Clifton Finnegan, pay me way into this subway. Believe me, Arch, dames is overrated. Take away their fancy clothes and what do you got? <laughs> Answer me. <laughs> Go ahead. Answer me that. Duh. <laughs> you took the weights right out of me, Mark. I'm beginning to believe you. I think that if you went to the movies, you would just as soon take a chocolate bar as a beautiful dame. Well, it all depends. With or without almonds. <laughs> Boy, I took a dame to the movies once. That was enough. Well, what did you do? Well, first we started holding hands, and, and we took off our shoes. Penny, you wasn't holding feet. Well, just for a little while, I have to leave our hands free for the popcorn. <laughs> and, you know, just as I got a nice big mouthful of popcorn, she leans over and starts giving me one of them long kisses. What happened? Well, the popcorn started popping and the... Uh, 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 Tell you, Arch, maybe I do like girls and I don't know it. No, Finnegan, sometimes you're impregnable. <laughs> hello, Archie. Oh, hello, Miss Duffy. Uh, take a look. How do you like my new dress? Let's see. Turn around. Hmm. Looks like you walked up one flight. <laughs> and fell down two. Now, look, you. Uh, just a minute. I'm only kidding. It really looks very nice. It's only that I can't help comparing it with a certain party's clothes that I was out with last night. Oh, Yeah. What was she wearing? As, it, as though you'd know the difference. I know plenty about Dame's clothes. Well, what was she wearing? Well, she had on an assembly of light blue. Uh, <laughs> beige, of course. Uh, very French, a Paris model, a uh, shipwreck Kelly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and she had on a little over-the-eye hat, a cloche you know, with a pork pie brim, uh, to dress a pleated v-neck around the flounce with a uh, corsage of violets nipped in the tuck. Uh, <laughs> an hourglass waist with a midriff, and incidentally, one of the midriffs rips I have ever seen. <laughs> and to complete the picture, a gorgeous, loosely draped bias over her peplum. All hemstitched, of course. <laughs> Boy, what a beautiful day. Oh, yeah? But uh, how did she feel about you? Extremely mutual. <laughs> the minute our eyes met, she gave me that come hither look, you know, so naturally I hid it. So, <laughs> and she kind of beckoned me over to a love seat. Well, I'm not the kind of a guy to turn me back on a back, so <clears throat> I sat down with her. Well, the first thing I know, she's holding me hand, see? She moves over close to me and gazes into my eyes and whispers to me. She says, Archie, you're gorgeous. Put your arms around me. I gotta get that bonus. <laughs> Hello, Duffy. Huh? Oh, it's you, Mrs. Duffy. <laughs> Oh, I thought the voice sounded too deep. <laughs> Is uh, Duffy there? Uh, well, would you mind to let him up? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to speak to him. Thank you. Hello, Duffy. Now, look, Duffy, about that bonus. Huh? You change your mind? Or you figured I'd swipe it out of the cash register anyway? <laughs> well, uh, Duffy, that's very sweet of you. Yeah, you know, so help me if... If it didn't turn me stomach, I'd come right over and kiss you. <laughs> well, thanks very much for the bonus, Duffy. Okay. Eddie, Duffy, you're sending me down a bonus. <laughs> I swear, if I'm lying, may I never move from this spot. Hello, Rigger. What are you here for, morning? <laughs> oh, boy. 
boy. Now I can go out with Amber. Eddie, uh, get her on the phone here. Plaza, 9970. Oh. Uh, 9970. Oh. That's her uh, private, unlisted number. Oh. 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 Hello, Miss McNulty. No, okay, I'll wait. And going upstairs to get her at her private, unlisted flat. <laughs> well, uh, look, Eddie, when, when she gets on the phone, you know, you're, you're me butler and lay it on thick. Yes, yes. Hello, Miss McNulty? Yeah, well, this is Eddie the butler speaking. Huh? Come right up. No, you missed out. <laughs> Yeah, I'm calling for Mr. Archer. Mr. Archer. Uh, that's right, the tall, skinny jerk. Hey, give me that phone. Hello, Amber. I uh, hope you'll forgive my butler, but he's a new man I just stole from Lady Mendel, and he ain't quite housebroken yet. <laughs> well, uh, Amber, how about a date tonight? Huh? Well, you know me, honey. I'm loaded with lucre and looking for love. Uh-huh. The mood I'm in tonight, Dove Cat, I'll buy you orchids by the bale. Tote that barge. <laughs> Fine, geez. Okay, honey, I'll uh, send up one of me limousines. Uh, what color dress are you gonna wear? Uh -huh. Okay, I'll send the roadster with the black wall tires. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, I just forgot my uh, chauffeur is on his vacation. Uh, I guess you better just hop a sub. <clears throat> Okay, doll face, uh, don't keep your ding dong daddy awaiting. Eddie, what, George? He, he's in the back room. So, you know, he's got this date, so he got to get cleaned up to get brushed off. <laughs> Why is that, Eddie? Why does Arch have so much trouble with things? Well, it seems they're either too young or too old. Or not desperate enough. Finnegan? Oh, terrific, God. You look like you just stepped out of Esquire. Uh -huh. By request of the publisher. <laughs> what are you inferring at, Eddie? Oh, look at that tide. Ketchup all over it. Since when is red and brown a bad combination? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but look at them shoes. Hmm? All run down at the heels. So what if the heels is run down? You can only notice it when I'm standing still. As soon as I start walking, my socks work down and cover them up. <laughs> Boy, I'm gonna bowl this dame over like a ton of bricks. <clears throat> By the way, uh, what you using for money? The Christmas bonus, that stuff that you're sending down. Let's see, where can I take her? Some place that's uh, nice and lush and soft and svelte. Uh, you can get a svelte cup of coffee at the automat. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Now, look, you know that, Mr. Duffy. That man is so cheap. That's that... what I'm counting on, Eddie, his cheapness, you see. If he's going to give me this bonus, I know he ain't going to cut up a perfectly good mattress for just a few paltry bucks. No, this time I got a feeling that he'll come through. Hello, handsome. Well, Amber. Boy, you got here in a hurry. Yeah, I took a cab. Just couldn't wait to get another gander at me, could you, honey? <laughs> Let me look at you, doll face. Boy. What a filth, hmm? Huh? <laughs> you know, you remind me of that old proverb, a place for everything and everything in its place. <laughs> you 
Yeah, Bambi, you look even better than you did last night. Uh, what kind of a coat is that you're wearing, by the way? Oh, just muskrat and mink dyed. Well, you all gotta go sometime. <laughs> Honey, did you dream about me last night like I told you? Yeah. What did you dream? Well, I dreamt that you and I were parked in a car up at Inspiration Point, and you started to put your arm around me. What happened? I slapped your face. Well, honey, you know, according to Freud, uh, that dream was just a subconscious fulfillment of your suppressed ego. <laughs> in other words, you're nuts about me, and you don't know it. And I resent your love, Amber. I'm nuts about you, too. What's getting into you, anyhow? Oh, I don't know. Blame it on the night air. Blame it on the perfume of your odor. <laughs> Blame it on us, the closeness of your proximity. Archie, you talk like a child. What kind of kids do you run around with? <laughs> Come on, Amber, don't fight yourself. Admit you love me. Come on, give me a little kiss. Do I have to? Well, not if you don't want to, naturally. Well, I don't want to. You have to. <laughs> Come on, try it. You might find me an experience. Now, wait a minute, Archie. <laughs> a hen. A hen. <laughs> A.M. What a reading. You will get your notice in the A.M. <laughs> Look, Amber, <clears throat> this is Miss Duffy, Duffy's daughter. Um, how do you do, I'm sure. You mean that Duffy, the owner of this place, is also this character's father? Yes. yes. Brother, is he on a losing streak? <laughs> Archie, uh, is this the snappy dresser you told me about? Yeah, why? Ha, ha. Now, just a second. You a snappy dresser. Harper wouldn't take you to a bazaar. <laughs> Listen, you hag. Ah, your father's up, Dyke. Just a second. <laughs> <laughs> just a second. Now, watch your language, please. There are sailors present. <laughs> Miss Duffy, maybe you better get back to the cash register. With pleasure. Okay, scram. I'm sorry, Amber. I must apologize to Miss Duffy. You know, her mother was frightened by her father before she was born. <laughs> well, now, look, Em, how about some uh, refreshment? Uh, perhaps a Coca-Cola or a glass of milk? Are you kidding? Milk? <laughs> With an olive in it, of course. <laughs> look, bud, I'm a champagne and caviar woman. Oh. <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't got it. Well, of course we got it. What do you think? We're running a clip joint. Oh, uh, Eddie. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, gargoyle. Uh, some uh, good uh, champagne, please. Yes, sir. Bottle or draft? <laughs> oh, either either bottle or draft, uh, as long as it's exported. Uh, how about... How about the Pipesick 44? Okay, but it's going to taste like 7 upsick. <laughs> Very good joke, Gargoyle Now, in addition to the champagne I would like a side order of caviar Only one order? Yes, uh, the monsieur is on a diet uh, Well, go ahead Don't stand there, fetch the order well, Sir, surely you don't expect us to kill a whole caviar Just for one order <laughs> If necessary, you can kill a whole herd of them <laughs> See the kind of a guy you're dealing with, Amber? I uh, didn't tell you, but you see, I got a bonus coming through that uh, means that you and me, maybe someday, we'll have a mansion with a living room that you can hold an elk's ball in. Marble, marble staircases. A bathtub, 60 feet long and 30 feet wide. Gee, I could drown in a bathtub that big. You'll have your own private lifeguard. <laughs> Yes, sir, kid, stick with me and you'll be lighting your cigars with $10 bills. That's the kind of a guy I am. Uh, Mr. Archie. What is it now, waiter? Envelope just arrived from Mr. Duffy. Oh, oh, oh. Excuse me a minute, Amber. Give me the envelope, buddy. <coughs> Let's see here. One dollar, two dollars. That's funny, it seems to end there. <laughs> yeah. 
The zipper on the mattress must have got stuck. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's a note here. Dear Archie, here is your $2 bonus. Best wishes for a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. <laughs> a prosperous New Year, that dirty skunk. Eddie, what am I going to do? I can't tell this dame. Well, why not? Well, she's so much in love with me, she'll go nuts if she finds out I'm broke. Well, from the looks I am, I'd say when she finds out you ain't only going to be broke, you're going to be dead broke. <laughs> what am I going to do, Eddie? Hey, wait a minute. I got an idea. I'll tell her I got to go out of town on some big business, you know, and I'll switch it to Finnegan. What's Finnegan going to use for money? I'm giving him a dame, ain't I? Do I have to give him money, too? <laughs> hey, Finnegan. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Come here, I want to talk to you. Uh, keep an eye on the joint for a minute, Eddie. What is it, Archie? Amber, I'm afraid I got a big disappointment for you. Uh, my uh, stockbroker in Chicago just called me up, collect, of course, to uh, <clears throat> notify me that I just lost 10,000 shares of Social Security, sir. <laughs> you see, I collateral them on a preferred margin last month, and they didn't fluctuate fast enough. And, well, I don't want to bore you with the details, but he says unless I hop out to Chicago immediately, I may be escrowed. this all mean? It means a dagger in me heart, honey. I won't be able to keep our little date tonight. Why, you broken down crumb after I break Now, through. don't get mad, honey. I ain't gonna let you down. I got your substitute, a uh, very wealthy playboy. Uh, <laughs> and you like him, you know. The Marion kind. Sort of a John's out of Manville. <clears throat> Hey, Finnegan, come here. Uh, yeah, I like it. Finnegan, uh, I would like you to meet Glam Miss Amber McNulty. Oh, uh, enchanted, I'm sure, Miss McNulty. <laughs> you uh, wouldn't think it to look at the guy, Amber, but he is extremely R-I-C-H. Just a second, uh, do I know what that is? What is it? Spelling. <laughs> and I don't like it. You see, Amber, he's uh, a millionaire and very eccentric. <laughs> well, he can be eccentric, but does he have to be so dirty? <laughs> well, uh, you know, like all thoroughbreds, he's at his best in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think you'll find him very quaint, though. Archie, why don't you let him speak for himself? Tell me something about yourself, Mr. Finnegan. <laughs> That's his story in a nutshell. <laughs> you see, he uh, really came from a long line of descendants. Really, Aunt? Oh, certainly. Amber, you've heard of the Plymouth Rock? Yeah. His ancestors brought it over on a Mayflower. <laughs> uh, they were broke for a while, but they finally came out from under. <clears throat> yep. What a wonderful life. <laughs> Wonderful life he leads, you know. Winters in Miami Beach, summers in Maine, springtime in the Rockies, uh, 
April in Paris. <laughs> and in June, he's busting out all of it. <laughs> Archie, I still think I'd rather hear about it from Mr. Finnegan himself. Well, if you insist. Uh, oh. I'm just an ordinary citizen. I get up in the morning and have me supper. <laughs> and I go for a walk on me hands. <laughs> and I eat me lunch. And I go over to the park and they feed me pigeons. <laughs> that is, if I'm still hungry. <laughs> and towards evening, I stroll home and have me breakfast. <laughs> Nothing unusual. <laughs> How long has this been going on? Oh, since one day when my mother dropped me on me feet. <laughs> you know, you're cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a little teddy bear. Chico, chico. Say, Arch, I'll slug this thing. <laughs> oh, I uh, forgot to tell you, Amber, the guy has a fear of dames, you know. It's skirtophobia. <clears throat> oh, well, don't be afraid of me, dream face. <laughs> Give me a little kiss. Go ahead, Finnegan, kiss her. What have you got to lose? <laughs> oh, remember, I gotta live with myself. Come on, honey. Quit holding out. Give me a kiss. No, wait a minute. Oh, come here. Oh, yeah, this dame acts like a sailor. <laughs> no, Finnegan, this ain't like a sailor. This is different. This is intersectional. Uh, oh, well, then, let's try it again. How about the... How about the... Come on, sugar. Come on, sugar, we got a tall evening to cut down. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, where are we going to, a nightclub? No, I'm tired of those expensive nightclubs. I'd just like to go to a good movie and sit in the balcony. Yipe! The Armed Forces Radio Service. Another exciting tale of escape is up next. Fed up with the everyday grind? Tired out from the summer heat? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are making your painful way over the great India desert, alone and dying of thirst, while behind you, pursuing you, are the fanatical Kafirs who once bowed to you as king, and now call for your life. Tonight, we escape to India and two soldiers of fortune who pushed fate too far. As Rudyard Kipling told it in his famous story, The Man Who Would Be King. (laughs) 
One Saturday night, it was my unpleasant duty to put the paper to bed alone. It was a pitchy black night, as stifling as a night can be in India in June. It was very still, save for the ticking of the clock above my desk, which seemed to shatter the black heat of the night as the hands crept toward 3 a.m. And then from the passage outside my door, I heard voices. Yeah. Who's there? Only us. Uh... And who are you? Oh, so you don't remember us, eh? Mm, no, I can't. Uh, how about the job per border, then? Job per border? Yeah, and having the authorities turn us back for impersonating newspaper men. Newspaper And men. then there was the train. Yeah, off of which you had a throne, if I remember correct. Oh, wait. That flaming red hair. That bald head. <laughs> oh, Daniel Dravis and <laughs> Kiki Carnahan. <laughs> That's right. Well, what do you two want <laughs> this time? If it's money, I haven't got it. And if it's a fight, it's too beastly hot. You can rest yourself easy, sir. Because we have come asking for naught except some information. We've been all over this country. And we've concluded that injury isn't big enough for such as Daniel and me. So, we are going away to be kings. Kings in our own divine right. What? I. We shall be kings. Yeah, we've signed a solemn contract. Each to help the other... And neither of us to look at liquor or women until we have become king. I've never heard of such a fantastic idea. Now, well, what do you want of me? Oh, but a look at such maps of Kafiristan as you might have about. Maps of Kafiristan? That's where we decided to go. Well, don't you realize that not one single Englishman has ever gone into the Kafiristan mountains and lived at Mount again? You're a good deal more likely to become dead men than kings. Yeah, well, sure. Anyway, I don't believe you have the slightest intention of traveling a mile outside of Delhi. Then you should come down to the Sarai marketplace in the morning, down where the caravans leave for the north. Now look, look you two, I'm a newsman, not a nomad. Now why, why should I come down to that filthy pest? Oh, I'm not so sure that you're either. Uh, what do you mean? You say you're a newsman, but here's the chance to see the start of the greatest story of all time. And you'd pass it up. Because you're too blasty lazy to get up that early in the morning. Come along, Dravot, my lad. Yeah, but if you should have a change of heart, come to the Serai in the morning and see whether we'd be liars or not. And so they left, those two lovable scoundrels. And I sat alone in my office, thinking. The kings of Kapiristan. <laughs> kings of Indies. But then, perhaps, just perhaps, they might pull it off. And it would be something to cable home. And so it was that the next morning I was making my way through the dirty, milling crowds of the Serai marketplace. <laughs> you should not laugh at him, Said. Eh? The witless are under the protection of Allah. Oh, quite so, boy. Quite so. Who is the fellow, anyway? A mad priest, Said, who has arrived only this morning from Ajmer. Ah, I see, I see. You, Said, come look at my camel, loaded with toys to please the eye of an army. Yeah, now, now. Go about your business. I haven't any use for toys. These are wondrous toys in these sides. Fit for a king of Kafiristan. What? My good lord. Daniel Drebbit. Quiet, come along. I have two camels just beyond the warrior. The blessings of Pier Khan and the gracious Sahib be consent to look at the poor toys of a priest from Ajmer. Over this way. Where's Conahan? Here we are. Permit me to present my servant. Azamir Khan. At your service, Governor. Well, I... How do you like our disguises? Do they pass? And if they fool this crowd in the Serai, they're probably good enough to get you across the border. And uh, good enough to get you killed. Yeah, getting killed is no part of the contract Peachy and me draw up. Although, um, perhaps killing fits in with our plans in a different sense. Feel around underneath the toys there in the camel bag. What? Mm -hmm. My good lord, the rifles. Twenty brand new Lee Enfields. With ammunition to match. Yeah, and 20 good reasons to make your death certain. Any patron of the Hill Tribes would kill his own mother to get a rifle. Now, who would harm? A, a poor mad priest, Saeed. Allah protects me. <laughs> mad is right. Yeah. And so was Lord Clive, and Rhodes, and Bonaparte. Drive out the camels, P.C. We have a long way to go before we become kings. Fire! Huh? 
As I stood and listened to the camel bells fade away in the distance, I wondered... I wondered if it might not be a glorious thing to go to Kapiristan and be a king. Three years pass in India, much as they pass in any other land. It grows hot, then the rains come, and then they heat again. Some colonel at a hill station puts down an uprising... A new viceroy comes out from London. The paper duly records the death of a sultan in Rajputana. And the trees in the courtyard grow a few feet taller. And finally, time in its circle turned up another night, much like the one three years before. Once again, I sat alone in the office, listening to the clock, and waiting for some unimportant item to come over the wire from Europe. It was long after midnight when my office door slowly opened. Well, I say, you might knock first, you know. Knock. Knock. Good Lord, man. What's wrong? I... I... You don't know who I am, do you? No. No, I haven't the faintest idea. Over here. You'd better sit down, old fellow. You're in a bad way. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's a whole year I've been walking. Right here in this very office we settled it. You sitting right there and giving us the map. <laughs> hey, and you've been sitting there ever since? Three years. No. Oh, no. Man couldn't change that much in three years. You're not Peachy Carnahan. Yes. I was the king of Kafiristan. Me and Daniel Travis. The real crown kings we was. Is this true as gospel? And what in the name of heaven have they done to you, Peachy? Peachy? I knew Peachy Carney, am I? He's a king. With a, a real golden crown on his head. Told me he does. He's dead now. No, no. No, no, no. You're Peachy Carnahan. You are. Now you must pull yourself together. Yeah. Poor, poor myself here. You've got to keep looking into my eyes. Then maybe everything won't go to pieces. All right, all, all right. Now, tell me what happened, Peachy. We left the caravan at Yagdala, and we struck off in the hills. Well, yes, go on. Weeks it was for travel, Daniel and me. First, there wasn't no roads, and after a while, no food. But there was always the drums. Sometimes they were close. Sometimes farther off. Most of the time we could hear them. Somewhere. Oh, hello, oh, old man. Here now. It's no place to be stopping. Up with you. Well, I'm fearing it's no use, Daniel. What's got into them? Well, the poor beasts are done in and starved. Same as ourselves. Don't go no further. And we'll go on without them. I've not come this far to die on the side of a mountain. Wait. Wait. Look, Daniel. Over the edge of them rocks. Oh, oh men they are. Yeah, a score or more of them. And one goes ahead of the rest. They're not but bows and arrows. They got a pair of the rifle to pigeon. Right you are, Daniel. It's now that we stop to become kings. Yeah, yeah. Here you are. And some cottages, too. Easy now, Peachy. I've got the tragglers for Rhea first. Then we'll lay a few at their feet. No arm to the one in front. We may need him. Hold it, Daniel. Look at them. Ah, flat on that blooming face. It's their leader. He's coming out alone. Well and good. You'll go part way to meet him, P.G. But keep your rifle by. Look at him, Daniel. He's as fair as us, with yellow hair. So he is. Part of the lost tribes these people are. Stop. I await your command. All ye who speak with the voice of thunder. By the Lord, Harry Peachy, we're in luck. It's the old Afghan tongue he speaks. Speak up. Who are you and whence do you come? I am High Priest and the chief of the village of Bashkai. A journey of only a few heartbeats. This Bashkai, how many people? They are numbered in the thousands. There are more villages in the hills? More than a man has fingers and toes. You hear that, Peachy? Give our kingdom, make due order. 
And you. You're going to take us to Boskai. Do you understand? I understand the voice of thunder that you speak. Ooh, he's a smooth one, Peachy. He knows her for that, too. What's your name? Mazur Khan Jantaros. Yeah, it's too long. Hey, well, hey, we'll call him Peachy. He has the look about him of an old soldiering friend of ours. Billy Fish. <laughs> <laughs> so he does. <laughs> hey, we bestow a name on you. From now on, you'll be Billy Fish. And put this on your drums. Tell them two kings have come out of the mountaintop. Two kings that speak in words of thunder. So the earth trembles. Tell them two kings have come to Kafiristan. <laughs> You, Peachy. Daniel? Why are you sitting out here in the dark? I've been thinking. Man has to stop and think sometimes. Uh, but uh, anything special, Daniel? Look at him, Peachy. Look at that blinking campfire that's gleaming in the dark. Like the jewels in the crown. Yes, Daniel. You've done a fine job for sure. Oh, 23 villages you joined together as one. Yes, it's the army you claim to be thanked for it. Two thousand men with a fair knowledge of better now. Some of them's a bit green at it yet. Yeah, they're ours now. Every man, jack, woman, and child. We own them, body and soul. Yes. Yeah. We're kings now, Daniel. Not proper kings yet, but we will be. Yeah, sooner than you think, Pete. How's that? Now, Billy Fish told me something today that fair amazed me. These people know the craft. You mean they're Freemasons? Daniel, it's impossible. So, well, me, it's gospel true. He gives a grip and everything. It's old, the craft is. Older than the memory of man. And up here in the hills, they've been preserving it all these years. Why, well, some of the high priests know up through the fellow craft. But they don't know the third degree. You see it, Peachy? They don't know the third degree. But we do. And, Daniel, what is it you're fixing to do? Do? We're going to be proper kings. We got them going and coming now. I'm going to turn the whole country into one grand lodge, raise some of the priests to the third degree. And for me, I'd be the grand master of Kapiristan. Ah, you ain't got the right to. We've never been officers in no lodge. Right. What's a king got to do with asking for a right? I'm against it, Daniel. It's no good to go fooling around with the craft. Ah, you talk like an old woman. The thing will work. I know it will. We'll make it a bloomin' ceremony. Regular aprons with the symbols and the marks. All for us, Peachy. The king's a Kafiris town. Everything is prepared, Master. And the priests and the people wait. Well, they haven't much longer delay. Yeah, now, Peachy... How do you like my apron? It's a wondrous sight for fair, Daniel. Made of white almond skin it is. And the master's mark with emerald studded. The mark? You know the meaning of the mark? That I do. What's got into you, Billy? It is a thing that's passing strange, Master. Yeah, strange and lavish. Come along now. Ready, Peachy? Right with you, Daniel. Then out we go. Onto the temple steps. Uh, we'll give them what for. <laughs> Not the blinking eyes out. That's what we'll do. <laughs> Look at them, Peachy. Right down on their blooming knees and yelling their fool heads. Oh, of course. It's a good thing to be a king, Daniel. The mark. Behold the mark. It's a sign. The promised ones are Yeah, now. What's wrong with the priest, Billy? They look like trouble, Daniel. No. Stand where you are, Master. They recognize the mark. Yeah, that great stone on the floor. Why did they turn it over? Wait. Oh, it's the same. There's the mark. The promise. Speak up, Billy Fish. What's the meaning of it? See for yourself. Look. Daniel. Carved on the back of the stone. Tis the master's mark, all right. And the same as the sign you wear. Only a few of the priests have known of the hidden mark on the stone. Now, what does it mean? The many who have doubted you are a god doubt no longer. And you, Billy, what do you think? I, Master. 
I think that now it is the time for thee. Ooh, Daniel! Golden crown! Hey, how they glitter! Fit for the brow of a king! It's what we came for! Here now, put them on! We'll crown ourselves narrow, right? Now, listen to them! You know something, Pinky? We come here to be kings, and that we are, all right. But blamed if we ain't a couple of blooming gods to boot. With a million people bowing on their knees. <laughs> Well enough, Peachy. So it was gods you became, as well as kings. But then what happened? What became of Daniel Dravit? Dravit? Dra- I knew Daniel Dravit once. He's a king now. Daniel is. Where's the golden crown? Carnahan was with him. Peachy. Peachy, try to pull yourself together now. Yes. Uh, I'll try. Good. Good. Now you became kings, you and Daniel. Kings of all Kathiristan. He was a fine figure, Daniel was. With his red head wearing that golden crown. Kept himself aloof from the people, so to speak. And when he walked out in front of the temple, I fair I crawled on their stomachs to worship him. Yes, but what happened, man? What happened? happened? Well, I... I figure mostly it was... Winter coming out. The winds were starting up and... Clouds was blowing down from the north. Oh, it could blow beastly cold. That winter wind. Who's out there? That you, Billy? I'm damned it anyway. Here now, what's this? I, I have brought you food, Master. You are the wild sheep with curry and rice. Oh, up off your knees, girl. Bring it inside. Thank you, Master. Place it there. Mm. Yeah, nah. You're a well-favored wench. I do not understand. Why are you crawling on your knees? Fitting way to approach the god of Kapiristan. Mm. What's your name, girl? Maruma Benjab. Maruma? You married? It has not yet been my happy fortune, Master. You afraid of me? You are a god. Yeah, I mean, uh, how do I seem to you? <clears throat> you find me pleasing or what? Your face. It's more wondrous than the noonday sun. And your look, the look of eagles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> ah, very well. Give me leave now. Thank you, Master. Mm. Marum, huh? Hey, hey. Oh, would you call me, Daniel? Oh, the food's here, eh? Right? Ah, good. Mm. Mark that window, turn. You know, winter's about due to strike and fill the passes with snow. There'll be little moving about before spring. Yeah, you're right. Say, T, I decided to take a wife. <laughs> but you can't do it, Daniel. We made a contract. That was till we was kings. Well, kings, we've been these many months. No, no, it's no good. I'll tell you now, I'm against it. Against it? You was against using the craft, too, but look what it's done for us. This is different. Billy Fish will tell you no, the same as I do. Billy Fish, eh. Who's the king here? Him or me? My mind's made up. Three days from now, I shall have me your wife. And you can put it on the drums and tell every blighter out there in the hills. The kingdom of Kapiristan... Gonna have a queen. What's keeping her, Peachy? They should have brought her in half an hour ago. I don't know, Daniel. 
How about you, Billy Fish? You put him up to stall an oath? Deliberate like? Certain preparations must be made, Master. He's across the court with some of the priests. Maybe they're trying to buck her up a bit, Daniel. She thinks she's going to die, you know. Ah, die indeed. Why, I... Master, it is against the laws of heaven for a woman to marry a god. I'm not a god, I'm a man. You know that by now, Billy. No. And I should not want to think so, Master. But either way, this can mean only trouble. Yes. I beg you to reconsider. And I beg you to keep your mouth shut, Billy. I'm through waiting. I'm going over there to talk to the Master police. Flint. Oh, we've got to go with him, Billy. I think it's going to mean trouble, but come on. How many men can you depend on? No more than 20 with rifles. Most of my men are in Bashkai. And what shall we do? We shall have to make a run for it, I fear. We might be safe in Bashkai. Oh, you bungling fools. Bring out the girl. Huh. Well, now, that's better. Here, girl. This is no way for a bride to behave. Oh, smile now. And give us a kiss. Oh, the waste has bitten me. The blood, Master. Don't let them see the blood. Look, see the blood. It's not a god or a devil, but only a man. Yeah. What is the blood? Master, it's too late. Back, Daniel, they're coming with knives. They can't do this. I am the king. You must run for it, Master. Come on, Daniel, come on. Confounded Eden. I'll come back. I'll come back and beat the blasted engine. That's what I'll do. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, we'll be back, all right. <sighs> How much further, Billy? Only a short way beyond this ridge, Master. Well, so far, so good. Huh. At least them blooming drums is stopped. Well, we're at the top, Daniel. Yeah. And a right good climb it's been. Uh, uh, I... uh, Look. It seems the drums have come before us, Master. Cut off. No less than a thousand of them. Standing there quiet like. With them wicked long knives in their hands. There'll be no getting past them, Daniel. No. We're done for. Go back, Billy Fish. Take your man away with you. Go with him, Peachy. It's me they want. I did it. Me, the king. No, Dan. I'm sticking with you. Billy Fish, you clear out. I am your friend. I stay with you. You're a good man, Billy. They're coming now, Daniel. Yeah. Peachy. Forget it, Daniel. I'll forgive you. Freely, fully. Uh, then let them come. There be one thing they can't change, Peachy. We've been kings. Kings in our own right. Kings! And all come here and stand. Eyes open, poor Billy Fish, like a blooming earring, I did. An air in the snow and the rocks. Oh, good Lord, man. But you, Peachy, you got away from them. <laughs> got away from them, did I? <laughs> oh, no. They stung me out on a tree. They drove nails right through me hands, I did. Yeah, see, look, see. But I fooled them all right. Because the morning coming up, I, I wasn't dead. And then I made him think I'd... I'd lost me senses. <laughs> and they was afraid to harm me because I was protected by Allah. <laughs> Cut me down then. After a while, they let me go. You poor devil. What had happened? What happened to Daniel? Daniel? Daniel was a king. He wears a golden crown. No, no, now, now, what happened to him? He's never left me. All them long months, 
Walking on the road back, he kept me safe. The mountains, I danced at night, but Daniel held up his hand. Peachy came along, bent double. I never let go of Daniel's hand. <laughs> he put me now. Here, in this bundle. <laughs> you knew old Daniel, sir, even if it was a monoquin. Look at him now. I let him go. There was little else to do. He was only hours away from his death. I sat there and stared at the bundle he had left lying on my desk. Stared as the pale shafts of dawn struck fire in the red beard. Stared at the golden crown sitting too large and heavy upon the wrinkled, mummified head of Daniel Gravett. The man who would be king. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Tonight we have brought you The Man Who Would Be King by Rudyard Kipling, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Featured in tonight's cast were Ben Wright and Wilms Herbert with John Daner, Peggy Weber, and Jack Crucian. Special music by Ivan Dittmar. <laughs> Next week, you are trapped in the dark streets of a French town with only two remaining avenues of escape. The workshop of a fearsome nightmaker or the arms of a dangerous woman. While behind you... Hunting you through the dark night swirls a mob of men eager for your capture. Next week, we escape with Vincent Starrett's strange story, The Fugitive. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. <laughs> CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now let's see what... Fibber McGee and Molly are up to. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with I See the Moon at Noon. <laughs> Why should I wax my floors? What does the wax really do for them? Well, that's a good fundamental question, and I can answer it very clearly. Have you ever rubbed an apple to make it shine? Do you realize that what made it shine was a thin coat of wax with which nature protects fruit and flowers? It's true. And the use of genuine wax on floors is also for protection. 
When you put Johnson's Wax on your floors, you're protecting them against scratches, stains, and wear of all kinds. The wax coat is a glowing shield of protection. And just as rubbing the apple made it more beautiful, polishing your floors with genuine Johnson's Wax adds greatly to their beauty. And for that matter, to the beauty of your entire home. And there's a third reason for Johnson waxing your floors. It saves you work all year, does away with tiresome floor scrubbing. And besides floors, there are 100 extra uses for Johnson's Wax in your home. May I urge you to buy some tomorrow? For the last few years, a certain citizen of Wistful Vista has been quietly collecting bottles. If you can collect bottles quietly. And here, loading his loot into the car to take it downtown and sell it, we find that collector of infernal residue and his patient spouse, Fibber McGee and Molly. Goodness, that's about all. Ain't got room for many more in that back seat. Hand me that last carton, will you, Molly? Thanks. You're welcome, dearie. Now you can do something for me. Sure, what? Look, mm -hmm. since 1938, you've carefully saved every bottle that came into the house. Yeah. And I never asked you why. I was never one to pry into your private life. If you wanted to collect bottles or buttons or, or butterflies or, or baboons, it was all right with me. But now I'd like to know what your idea was, and if you don't tell me, I think I'm going to scream! <laughs> Gee, I'm sorry, Molly. I thought all the time you knew I'd been saving those bottles for the refund. The refund? Sure. Instead of trotting down to the grocery every day with two ginger ale or root beer bottles and coming home with a dime, I thought I'd save them for a couple of years and really collect some dough. Catch on to it? Well, heavenly days. And how much do you expect to get for the lot, me bold financier? Well, averaging two cents per bottle, and I got exactly 537 bottles, I figure I'll get about 11 bucks. And that ain't hay. <laughs> and to think how many glass blowers have been wasting their breath when they might have been learning the piccolo. <laughs> $11 for three years' work. What do you mean, three years' work? It ain't been work. What? It's been fun. What you mean? It's been my hobby. It's, it's kept me off the streets. <laughs> Well, uh, where are you taking them? Grocery store. You want to go along? I wouldn't miss it for a 40-acre farm with Clark Gable as hired man. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. I'm in. Well, where'll I sit? You got both seats full of bottles. Well, I'll sit up in front there. You can make a kind of a little nest among the root beer and ginger ale bottles. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> they were soft drinks, so I ought to be quite comfortable. <laughs> Now, don't, don't, don't bust any of them. I, I got a lot of time and money in this stuff. You got a lot of water in them, too. Something's dripping down my neck. That's uh, just the rinse water. Somebody ain't quite dry yet. Some of them ain't. Well, here we go. Hey there, Johnny. Hello, daughter. Oh, hello there, Mr. Old Timer. If you're going downtown, would you mind if I rode as far as... <whistles> hey, what you doing, Johnny? Bootlegging? <laughs> No, I ain't bootlegging. I'm taking these bottles back for a refund. Is that so? Yep. From the looks of the bottles, you must have threw quite a party, kid. <laughs> Why didn't you invite me? I'm great at parties. Do card tricks, impersonations, and I can take my vest off without removing my coat. Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Oldtimer, but we didn't give a party. I've been saving these bottles for three years, Oldtimer. What for, Johnny? Well, it's just a hobby with you, Mr. Oldtimer. Haven't you got a hobby? I got two hobbies, daughter. I'm a string saver, and I never step on cracks in the sidewalk. <laughs> well, every man to his taste, old timer. I collect bottles, so you collect strings. And I've got a blue serge coat that collects lint. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Snooky. But that ain't the way I heard it. <laughs> the way I heard it, one feller says to tell the feller... <laughs> he says. <laughs> Did you hear this, Fibber McGee and Molly, on the Lux Radio Theater last night? 
Well, what'd the other fellow say? Uh, nothing, Johnny. He just sneered. <laughs> Well, I guess you ain't got room enough for me to ride with you, Johnny. I'll walk down to the corner and wait for a streetcar. Why, the streetcars don't go past that corner, Mr. Oldtimer. That's why I like to wait there, daughter. It's quiet. <laughs> so long, <sir. laughs> Now, what's the matter with this thing? It started off all right this morning. Dad wrapped the desk. Hi, mister. Oh, hello there, little girl. Now, don't bother me now on account of... Hey, where'd you get all the bottles, mister? Uh, Criminy, is that ever a snag of them, though? Hey, 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 watch your language there, sis. I got my wife with me. <laughs> hey, what you gonna do with all the bottles? I'm gonna hmm? take them back to the store for a rebate. Hmm? I says I'm returning them for a rebate. Rebate. Don't you know what a rebate is? Sure I do, I betcha. Uh -huh. It's when you put another worm on the hook. <laughs> but gee, mister, you can't catch enough fish to fill all those bottles. That rat it sis, I ain't going fishing. Don't you like to fish? Sure I like to fish, but... So do I, mister. Can I go with you? Uh, where? Fishing. <laughs> Look, sis, get this through that little sunbonnet full of sawdust, will you? I ain't going fishing. I know it. Well? Why? Because in the first place, I ain't got time, and in the second place, the season ain't open, and in the third place, I don't want to. And in the fourth, fifth, and sixth places, I got to take these bottles back. What for? For a rebate. Well, I guess this is where I came in, and my mama doesn't like to have me stay through two shows. So long, mister. <laughs> them brakes fixed. Well, come on, Molly. Here's the grocery store. All right, dearie. And believe me, it'll be a relief to get up off of these things. <laughs> well, so come why? Well, there were three mustard bottles leering at me like I was a piece of corned beef. Now, <laughs> well, I'll see. I'll take a few samples in first. Now, let me see. One ginger ale, one ketchup, one grape juice, one root beer, one horseradish. That ought to give them an idea. Yeah, it'd give me one if I was them, but I hope they don't think of it. Well, good luck to you, dearie. Thanks. I'll be back in just a minute, and you can help me carry in the rest of the... Whoa! <coughs> that ratted bud, why don't you look quick? Oh, hi, Nick. Well, for scream's sakes, Fisher. Excuse me for being such a big clumsy. I guess my feet are all thumbs. Oh, don't... <laughs> don't worry about the bottles you broke, Mr. DePopolis. They were just a handful of empty. Oh, is that so? I'd have got at least 11 cents refund on them bottles. You gonna pay me for them, Nick? Smartly. How much? Well, I think he said 11 cents, Mr. DePopolis. 
Oh, sure. Well, here is two bits apiece, Fizzer. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. I can't make change. Well, take the quarter, McGee, and I'll give Mr. DePopolis three more bottles. Here, Mr. DePopolis, here's your change. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey. <laughs> this is being a lot of fun, Cupid. Here's two dollars. Give me some more. Hey, and hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Cut that out. Do you think I want to get pinched for all this broken glass all over the sidewalk? Lay off, DePopolis. Huckley duckly, Fizzer. And look, Mrs. DePopolis is telling me to ask you if you are caring to stop at our house some nights this week for a game of compact bridge, don't do it because she hates bridge. So long, Fizzer. So long, Cupid. Bye, Mrs. DePopolis. Now, McGee, don't step in any of that broken glass. I already did. Oh, dear. Let me see it. Maybe yeah. I can... It's all right. I stepped in some iodine, too. <laughs> That's funny, that got a big laugh last week. <laughs> oh, well. Well, come on, Molly, hold the door open for me. All right. Hi, Mr. Sale. Can you... Be with you in just a minute, Mr. McGee. I'm waiting on a customer. Yeah. Uh, was there anything else, Mr. Wilcox? Well, uh, let me think. Uh, oh, yes, I want a small box of curry powder. And uh, send all this stuff right over to my apartment, will you please? Oh, you who, Mr. Wilcox? Hi, Harlow. What was that stuff you just asked for? Well, hello, folks. I just asked for a small box of curry powder. Curry powder? Shucks, you never told us you had a horse, Harlow. <laughs> Why, I... I haven't. This is the powder I put in the sauce when I make curry. You. You mean you cook, Mr. Wilcox? Well, sure. Doesn't fibber? He does not. And I wouldn't think of letting him mess up my kitchen either. Why, Molly, I'm ashamed of you. What? Why, there's no excuse for husbands not messing around in the kitchen these days if they want to. What if they do mess up the floor? Excuse us, folks, but this is the part of the thing that pays for the stuff. <laughs> what you mean, Harlow? Well, I mean about... <laughs> <laughs> I mean about the linoleum being properly protected with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. The no-rubbing, no-buffing polish that shines as it dries. And what well-kept kitchen floor isn't in these modern times. Why, what if the old man does spill a gob of gravy or a splatter of hen fruit on the floor? Oh, dear. Who cares? It can be wiped up in a jiffy with a damp cloth. Say, that'd be a great premium to give away with every can of Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, wouldn't it? Wouldn't what? A jiffy. A pearl-handled jiffy to wipe the spots off the floor. <laughs> That'd be swell. Oh, don't be silly. Oh, don't you be silly. Excuse me, Mr. McGee, you're next. Oh, thanks, Mr. Sale. Well, we'll see you later, Wilcox. And keep your curry up, Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> Yeah, stop in at our house sometimes. I'll fry you a nice batch of stupefied Crandall whims <laughs> with raisins. You, you like them? I love them. If they're fried in deep, fat. <laughs> now then, uh, what was it for you, Mr. McGee? I, I want a refund on these bottles. Uh, now, let me see. You have a penny coming on the root beer, a nickel on the ginger ale. What's this? Oh, that's a horseradish bottle. So it's all washed and sterilized. Sorry, no refund on those. Well, uh, how about the grape juice? We don't carry that brand anymore. Uh, the mustard? Nope. Just on the root beer and ginger ale. Here's ten cents. You can oh, take hey, wait. I got a car full of them outside, but Just wait till I run... Wait a minute, Mr. McGee. Huh? How many root beer and ginger ale bottles have you? Oh, I'd say about 170, which would come to about 575, really? but you... Oh, no, you don't. Huh? You haven't bought a dozen bottles of that stuff from me in five years. Take them back where you got them. This is a grocery, not a junkyard. Now, you look here, Mr. Sale. If that's the way you're going to act, you're liable to lose our account. Mrs. McGee, I've been trying to lose your account ever since you opened it. <laughs> it's more bother than it's worth. Oh, yeah? Well, it'll be all right with us, too, Sire. Sure, that last spinach you sent us had so much sand in it, I had to eat it with a niblick. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. Sale, why has our account been so much trouble? I'll show you. Look, here's your last order slip. Our delivery truck went clear across town to bring you one egg, two apples, four macaroons, and a box of toothpicks. Say, who ordered those toothpicks? I did, Molly. What for? Well, I was working on my ship model, and I ran out of lumber. <laughs> well, okay, bud, if that's the way you feel about it, give me my dime for these two bottles. Oh, now look what you've done. You've got broken glass all over my rhubarb. Oh, my. Get out of here, and don't come back. Oh, but look, I got a car full of bottles that I've been saving. I don't care if you've got a prairie schooner full of platinum. I don't want it. Go away! (laughs) 
Home? No. Where? Drugstore. Oh. <laughs> Furthermore, Mr. Kramer, if I'd ever suspected you wasn't going to make good on them bottles, I'd have never bought all my postage stamps in your drugstore. What'd he say? Shook his head. What'd you do? I shook my fist. What'd he do? Shook a shotgun. What'd you do? Shook. Sis, I got these bottles here a while back, and I'd like to get a refund. Sorry, sir. That was when we were under the NRA. No refunds now. Oh, but I want my dime. You can't have it. You've washed off the little blue eagle. (laughs) Hey, bud, I got a few bottles. Sorry, I've taken the pledge. Look, mister, I've been, I've been everywhere in town. Do you refund money on... On nothing! Beat it! <laughs> well? Yeah, I guess I'm a chump, Molly. It's no use. Chucks, I thought I had a swell idea collecting these bottles, but, well, I guess I, I flopped. Oh, now, now, don't take it to heart, dearie. Everybody sticks their neck out now and then. Yeah. That's why they have portholes on boats. <laughs> yeah, but shut oh, it. Oh, there you are, Mr. McGee. I've been looking all over Wistful Vista for you. Hi, Abby. Hello, Abigail. What was it you wanted? Well, someone told me that Mr. McGee had several hundred old bottles he wanted to sell, and I was so afraid he'd dispose of them before I found him. Well, there's no use in crying. Oh, what? What'd you say, Abby? Mm, she sounds like an angel in disguise, McGee, and one of the cleverest disguises I ever saw. <laughs> You mean you want to buy these bottles, Uppy? Indeed I do, Miss McGee. How many have you? Why, why about 500. Oh, what? splendid, splendid. Oh, what a lucky girl I am, really. 500 perfectly good bottles. <laughs> oh, uh, but I warn you, Miss McGee, I drive a hard bargain. Well. I'm offering you $50 for the entire lot. Heavenly days, $50. Well, 60 then. Oh, now, wait a minute, Uppy. That's ridiculous. Why, when I tell you how much I expected to get for these bottles, you... Well, $75, and that is my final offer. (laughs) Sold to the lady in the prematurely gray fur coat. (laughs) Say, I don't quite... This is so sudden, I... Now, look, uh, what do you want these bottles for, Uppy? Ah, uh, don't you wish you knew, you clever boy? Oh, God. <laughs> hey, you know the old saying, ask me no questions and I'll tell you no anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, here, Miss McGee, here's the $75. Oh, thanks. And you may dump those bottles in my backyard any time today. Oh. Pinch me, McGee. Out! Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Abigail. Oh, no, thank you. And now, to celebrate the deal, I insist on taking you to dinner at the 400 Club. What? Oh, come now. I shan't take no for an answer. Well, there's no <laughs> danger of you getting it for an answer, Mrs. Uppington. <laughs> I should say not. I suddenly got an appetite that'd make a steam shovel lower its bucket in shame. Well, fine in, Uppy. Let's go. Oh, but where shall I sit, Mr. McGee? Here, I'll make room for you, Abigail. Oh, 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 what fun, really. (laughs) Ain't it, though? (laughs) Well, here we go. And don't let the horseradish get smart with you, Abigail. The King's Men singing The Covered Wagon Roll Right Along. Oh, the covered wagon rolled right along While the pioneers gave out a happy song Me and Pappy did the driving Mammy cooked and kept us thriving And the covered wagon rolled right along We left Kentucky on the 10th of May 
Pappy said, I'll get our fiddles every day. Every day? Mammy, you just grease the skillet. If we need some food, I'll kill it. And the covered wagon rolled right along. Pappy's pants were made from skins of buffalo. Poor buff. But when winter came and brought the ice and snow, cold and rough. Pappy's pants ran out of leather. Mammy prayed for milder weather, and the covered wagon rolled right along. Once a wildcat jumped at Mammy from the rear. <laughs> Pappy winked an eye and said, now don't you fear. If he really tries to crowd her, we'll be having wildcat chowder, and the covered wagon rolled right along. Now at play and poker, Pappy won his fame. Once he got an Indian chief into a game. Ooh. Pappy wound up with four deuces and a squaw with six papooses, and the covered wagon rolled right along. Pappy sold a mule and then went on a spree. And he said, at last I got my liberty. <laughs> Mammy said, cut out your bragging. And she hitched him to the wagon. And the prairie schooner rolled right along. Now at last old California came in view. And we realized the troubles we've been through. Me and Ma are lucky creatures. Pappy's making western features. And the covered wagon rolls and rolls right along. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, what a day. <laughs> you know, Molly, for a while there today, I almost begun to have doubts if I could sell them bottles. <laughs> Say, what on earth do you suppose <laughs> Mrs. Uppington wants them for? I don't know, but I, I you know, I kind of regret the leaving them go at 75 bucks. I wish I'd asked 100. Well, you know, it cost her almost that anyway. I saw the bill she signed for dinner at the 400 Club. Yeah? You know how much? No. $22. $22? Oh, that couldn't be just for that one meal for the three of us. She must be bored in there by the week. <laughs> no, sir, it was nearly $7 a piece. And say, that was a mighty nice di dinner, too, wasn't it? I thought you said it wasn't so hot. Well, that was before I knew it cost seven bucks. <laughs> and I still say, though, that that was the worst cider I ever drunk. You do? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't cider. That was champagne. <laughs> it was? I thought the waiter said his mother made it. No, he did not. He said it was Mom's. <laughs> Who's that? Search me. Better get that seventy-five dollars out of sight. Come in. Well, hello there, folks. How's every little thing? Why, just wonderful, Mr. Gildersleeve. Ah, better than they've been for a long time, Gildy, old man. Uh, really? Why, certainly. Well, well, that, that's fine, McGee. I, uh, I just stopped in, McGee, to ask you if you could, uh, get into one of my suits. Why, we could both get into one of your suits. <laughs> Why should we? Why, sure, he's got clothes of his own. Yes, yes, I know, but I thought that, well, I, uh, the, how you fix the groceries, McGee. Groceries? Hey, what is this? Wait a minute. First you offer me your old clothes, then you offer us food. That ratted Gildersleeve, if you think for one no, minute... No, no, no. Take it easy, little chum. Take it easy. <laughs> it's no disgrace to be poor. Oh, I'll say it isn't. What are you driving at anyway, you big baboon? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, look here, little pal. Why don't you let me make you a small loan? Sort of ties you over until... That uh... ratted Gildersleeve, you cut that out. I don't want any money, and I don't want any clothes, and I don't want any groceries. Well, shucks, anybody think we didn't know where the next meal was coming from? Well, do you? <laughs> What's that? Now, Mrs. McGee, maybe I can talk sensibly with you. I know all about it. Mrs. Uppington told me. She told you what, Gildersleeve? About how she got word that you had your car full of junk and trying to sell it, McGee. <laughs> Imagine Pipper McGee, my pal, my neighbor, reduced to selling old bottles. Why didn't you let somebody know, McGee? We'd all been glad to help you. 
Well, of all the... Well, I'll be it. It's all right, chum. We won't say a word about this outside. But when Mrs. Uppington told me she felt so sorry for you that she took you in and bought you a warm meal. <laughs> then paid you $75 for a useless ton of old bottles. Well, that got me, McGee. Oh, so that's why she... Oh! That does it. That absolutely does it. Molly, never let me see another bottle in this house as long as I live. There's only one bottle left in the house, dearie. Well, where is it? Upstairs. Well, go get it and throw it away. Impossible. Why? Uncle Dennis won't let go of it. Oh, <laughs> Fibber and Molly will be back in just a moment. When that young son of yours goes tromping across your clean kitchen floor in his wet, muddy shoes, do you scold him and then feel sorry about it afterward? Well, it's a natural thing to do. But isn't it better to protect your floors with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat and not have to worry about it at all? Glow coat is the easy, modern way to keep linoleum floors clean and sparkling with a minimum of work. All you do is apply and let dry. Without any rubbing or buffing, your floors are protected with a gleaming, long-lasting polish. Glow coat keeps the colors of linoleum looking like new makes the linoleum itself last much longer. So you see, Glow Coat saves twice, saves you tiresome work, and saves your linoleum. In millions of homes, women swear by Johnson's self-polishing Glow Coat. Be sure to buy a can tomorrow. Oh, yes, remember, you save money on the larger sizes. <laughs> You know, Molly, what I'm going to do? What? I'm going to buy Gildersleeve a big, expensive present just because he tried to be so nice to us. Yeah. Mrs. Uppington was nice, too, McGee. Yeah. Though she didn't have to run and tell Mr. Gildersleeve about it. No, but I certainly give her a lot of credit. You're going to pay the money right back, aren't you? No. For that, she's got to give me a lot of credit. Good night. <laughs> Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Here's a special message to all high school boys. Fellow classmen, if your folks are like mine and say you should have some real work to do around the house, well, here's a tip. Ask for the job of cleaning and waxing the car. There's nothing to it. Use Johnson's Car New, C-A-R-N-U. It cleans and wax polishes in one simple operation. And if you're any good at all, you'll be finished in about an hour. Don't forget the name, Johnson's Car New. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Now it's time to pay a visit to the only man in old-time radio who wrote all his own material, Fred Allen. Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen. When you call Chloe, she doesn't answer either, kitty. <laughs> Fred Allen Show, with Fred's guests, the effervescent Phil Harris. Portland Hopper, Minerva Pius as Mrs. Nussbaum, Alan Reed as Falstaff Staff Openshaw, Parker Fenley as Titus Moody, the DeMarco sisters, and Al Goodman and his orchestra. And until I start blowing the claghorn, my name is Kenny Delmar.
National Association of Chiropodists sponsors Foot Health Week. Tonight, instead of a chiropodist, we bring you a comedian who owes his access to his corn. He's Fred Allen. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Kenny, I'm happy that you mentioned Foot Health Week. This week, the foot is king. Are you observing the event, Fred? Oh, yes, Kenny. Tonight, in honor of Foot Health Week, I went on the Jack Benny program. I spent 30 minutes with a heel. <laughs> people, should, people should pay more attention to their feet, Kenny. You know, happy feet make happy folks. Yeah, I think a man's work has a lot to do with the condition of his feet. Yes, Kenny, I know a man who works 10 hours a day and his feet are in perfect condition. Oh, what does he do? He's a mounted policeman. <laughs> Well, and he has no trouble at all? No foot trouble. He does have a few occupational calluses. <laughs> where? <laughs> I, where? Can he? <laughs> I said chiropodist, yeah, too. <laughs> I know. I, where, two wares are all right, because he has two ca calluses. You, <laughs> can he? Kenny, I refuse to tell you I am no stool pigeon. If you think that I am going... Alex! Well, for... Well, Portland, pull up an old participle, stop it from dangling, and sit down. This, uh, it so happens, is National Foot Week. Oh, Mama says chiropodists are paradoxical. How? Mama says chiropodists are the only men who make a living going to the dogs. <laughs> Your mother should be here to hear how that's going, that's all. <laughs> Paradox <laughs> Paradoxical, uh, that's some word you use there. Dr. I.Q. used it on his program last week. Oh, it's a used word, is it? I thought... <laughs> Dr. Uh, well, Dr. I.Q. has to use long words to reach that lady who's incessantly in the balcony. <laughs> Uh, what about, what about foot week? Oh, the foot is lucky. Really? The nose gets the dirty end of it. How, <laughs> how do you, uh, how do you mean? Well, the eyes have movies to see. Yeah. The ears have music to hear. Uh-huh. The mouth has candy to eat. And the nose? The nose has to smell everything. Right. <laughs> and if the mouth says something fresh... Uh-huh. The nose gets punched. Yes, that's true, through no fault of its own. But we ought to have, we ought to have National Nose Week, Portland. The street sprayed with perfume, a rose for every nose except Billy. Show the nose, show the nose a good time. Tell me, what else is new, Portland? A doctor in Boston says women live longer than men. Oh, right. did he say why? No, but Mama says a woman has to live longer than a man to have the last word. Oh, how true, how true. Your must have, uh, mother must have been re remotely... <laughs> I borrowed these teeth tonight. I don't know. <laughs> and speaking of painting, let's put two coats on and start for Allen's Alley, Portland. What is your question tonight? Well, this week, the Automotive Safety Foundation threw up a plan to reduce the number of highway accidents. And so our question this evening is, are you going to do your part to make this safer driving campaign a success? Shall we leave? As the old cuckoo said, when the pawn broke around the clock, I may as well start going. <laughs> Gosh, Portland, Allen's Alley is as quiet as a mink molting on a pile of peach fuzz. <laughs> I wonder if the senator is back from Dallas yet. Let's knock. Somebody, I'll say, somebody knock. Well, Senator Claghorn. Yeah, I just got back. <laughs> I just got back from Texas, son. Why, you're, you're all dusty. Yeah, I know, I ain't brushing my clothes. That's sullen dust. <laughs> I, I'd rather eat the soil of the South than Yankee pastry. Well, tell me, uh, how was your reception? Craghorn Day was the biggest thing Dallas has seen since the last major bowl unit was stranded there. Bigger than that, what happened? Well, they gave me a big watermelon barbecue. What a sight. Really? 2,000 Texans with their faces buried in watermelon. Gosh. You could hear the sucking from Dallas clean to Little Rock. <laughs> <laughs> what happened after the dinner? There was an all-star radio program over the entire Rebel Network. Really? Who was on the radio show? Big Southern Band, Swing and Sway with Henry Clay. <laughs> yes? Well, 
him that southern opera singer, Lily Pone. <laughs> Lily Pone? Yeah, Lily sang Carry Me Back to Old Louisiana. Now, wait a minute. Isn't that Carry Me Back to Old Virginia? Lily got two on call. She had to keep on carrying. <laughs> Tell me, what uh, what else happened? When I closed the program with a short eight-hour talk, <laughs> filibuster that is. Well, this is all mighty interesting in a sordid way, Senator. But what about this campaign to cut down automobile accidents? The South is... I say, the South is prepared, son. We're eliminating the automobile entirely. Eliminating the automobile in the South? How? Well, if a man has a 40-horsepower car, he turns in his car. Yes. The state gives him 40 mules. 40 mules. 60 horsepower, 60 mules. Yeah. 80. But the uh, the whole South will be flooded with mules. How can you control the traffic? We'll import a northerner for a traffic cop. You mean a northerner can handle mules? It takes one jackass to tell another jackass where to go. No, no. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, that's a hybrid horse on me, I guess. Let's try Mr. Moody's door. Howdy, bub. <laughs> Warm weather is here, Mr. Moody. Isn't it time to get out your fly swatter? Oh, I don't need no fly swatter. Well, how do you keep the flies off you? I got a spider hiding under my lapel. Oh. Yes, sir. Let a fly land on me. That spider's got him quicker than a baby snake can coil. Oh, I see. In fly time, that spider's running over me like syrup over a hot waffle. What's that? <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Moody, what about this new drive to reduce automobile accidents? Uh, most drivers try to make every road to Death Valley. Well, do you have any trouble? Yes, one big car hit my billy goat. And after the accident? That car was the only Lincoln I ever saw with a beard on it. <laughs> I see. And then a truck. Truck hit my prize pig and rendered him. Rendered him? For two miles, the road want nothing but lard. The pig disappeared completely? Well, I give a hog call to make sure. And after you gave the hog call? Four pig's feet come walking in the yard. Just four pig's feet? They was limping. Where did you... <laughs> you certainly had your troubles with speeding motorists. Uh, last Sunday was the worst. What happened? Well, I had 300 hens and one rooster. And? Rooster got out on the road. Zip! Feathers and giblets. Your only rooster was gone? Yep. Today I got 300 hens in mourning. Now what makes you think your hens are in mourning? They're laying eggs with black yolks. So long, boys. <laughs> well, I guess without his rooster, Mr. Moody has nothing to crow about. Well, let's see what happens next door here. No. Mrs. Nussbaum. <laughs> You were expecting maybe Lum and Abby? <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Ann, have you heard about this campaign to cut down automobile accidents? In the campaign, I am participating. Participating how? I'm writing slogans. Safety slogans? What are they? Driving slowly in your sliver, you will be a longer liver. <laughs> Good. Whether your name is Pincus or Myers, Check the brakes, likewise the tires. Very good, Thank very you. good. Driving fast when it is hazy, you'll be pushing up a daisy. <laughs> Say, how do you know so much about cars? Well, when I am a young girl, sweet 16 and never... Uh-huh. <laughs> Pierre and a stuck bear cat is driving by. Yeah. Uh, through the goggles, he is winking. Through the goggles, eh? And that started your romance? In a used Essex, the rumble seat, Pierre is courting me. Yeah. In a second-hand Chevy kneeling down, he is proposing. Good. In an old hotmobile with the top up, we are getting married. And since you've been married? Every week in all kinds cars, Buicks, Hudsons, and Cadillacs we are riding. Now, wait a minute. Who owns all of these cars? My husband, Pierre. Cars he is owning by the hundred. The air owns hundreds of cars. Who do you think is the smiling Irishman? <laughs> well, that leaves us just one more shanty to investigate. A single knock upon my door, and Falstaff's here to do his chores. Uh... 
You have new poems this evening, of course. As well you know, sire. Yeah. As Hester, they pinched the hot dog vendor. Someone called a cop. He had the mustard in the middle and the pickle on top. <laughs> no. Or, uh, what are you hiding, said the kangaroo. The squirrel answered, nuts to you. <laughs> no. How about this? Mother is singing. She's happy and gay. For the warden made her a trustee today. Now, <laughs> in the game of life, you are a foul ball. Tonight, we are discussing the campaign to reduce automobile accidents. My poem is ready. And what is your epic of prevention called? My motoring problems are over. How does it go? My motoring problems are over, but I warn all folks who drive, certain precautions must be taken if a car owner hopes to survive. Take it easy on the highway. At the wheel, use common sense. Have your car checked on occasion. You'll avoid all accidents. Never speed. Don't be a road hog. Don't drive with one arm round your girlie. Better late to where you're going than to meet St. Peter ten years early. <laughs> Advice to others I give freely. Lucky me, I bask in clover. The finance company called this morning, so my motoring problems now are over. <laughs> and as Paul Stamp throws his roadmap to an admirer, we turn to greet the five DeMarco sisters, accompanied by Maestro Al Goodman and the men Toscanini left behind when he returned to Italy. The, De the DeMarco scene coaxed me a little bit. a mere fragment of They Say It's Wonderful, played by Aloha Goodman and his pineapple picking poppers from Passaic. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen... Mr. Allen. Yes, Portland? This note just came for you. Oh, a note? It looks mysterious. It's signed Mr. X. Mr. X? Let me see. Why, this is from Phil Harris, Portland. X is his signature. <laughs> when, when Phil is incognito, he makes a triangle. <laughs> What does the note say? I, I don't know. Who can tell? Look at it. It's all X's here. At the bottom, it's stamped very E-R-G-U-N-T. Urgent. Oh, very urgent, I guess it is. Do you think Jack Benny knows Phil wrote you? How would he know? Benny can't read. <laughs> he just wears glasses to keep out of fights. <laughs> Benny thinks the only letters in the alphabet are L-S-M-F-T. We've never heard of A-B in the early one. I've seen, you know, that I... Hey, this may be Phil now. They had better be, or the rest of the program will be nothing but Crosby records. <laughs> Come in. Well, open my mouth and pour down a gallon. If it ain't my baggy-eyed pal, Frederick Allen. Phil Harris. <laughs> Phil, I have your note here. What is this urgent business? Well, Frederick, I'm desperate, and you've got to help me. What is your dilemma? Fred, you've got to get me on information, please. You on information, please? Well, why not? Well, Phil, you don't see Red Skelton trying to get on the Chicago Roundtable. <laughs> Listen, Fred, did you hear our program last Sunday? Now, we was matched against them quiz kids, and we won six to three. I'm ready for the big time now. I want them big boys. <laughs> 
But, Phil, the men on information, please, are geniuses. What geniuses? <laughs> I've seen their pictures. They look dead. They look like dopes. <laughs> dopes? Why, Phil, those three guys alone have enough gray matter to paint both sides of the big mo. I don't care. There must be some ways of getting on that show. Well, one way is to have intelligence and brains. What's the other way? The way you got on. <laughs> Now, look, Phil. I got enough gold, though. Just tell me what guy you pay off. I'll lay it on there. <laughs> Phil, you wouldn't even have a chance on information, please. Oh, yeah? If I start throwing hyphens around on that show, I'll drive them palookas crazy. But, Phil... I ain't so dumb. I got questions. Who wrote Shakespeare? <laughs> Who? Max Beth. <laughs> That's true. Now, who's the father of geometry? Who? Some square. <laughs> now, who invented the first yo-yo? Who? The same guy that found the lost cord. <laughs> Phil, take a friend's advice. You are not ready for information, please. Who ain't? I can raise my hand, can I? <laughs> but you've been working with Jack Benny. Ignorance is catching. He's a carrier. Wait a minute, Fred. Wait a minute now. I don't want to hear no slurs on my employer. Now, Jackson's got a heart as big as his head. Yes, and he has more hair on his heart than he has on his head. <laughs> Tell me, Phil, how was your trip from Hollywood? How was the train? What train? Uh, you mean Benny made you travel by bus? Not careful old Benny, no, sir. He told me that this time of year, buses was dangerous. <laughs> Well, how did you get to New York? Well, look, out in California, Jackson took me down to the Lincoln Highway. Yes? He handed me an orange and said, start walking. Start walking with the orange? That's right. He said, when people start coming up to you and saying, where did you get that yellow tennis ball? You're out of California. Keep going east. <laughs> well, now that you're here, I hope Benny found you a nice hotel room. Well, it ain't bad, but the chambermaid sweeps all the dirt under the carpet. It's bad, eh? Murder. To get to the bed, I gotta walk uphill. <laughs> Does your room have a nice view? Hey, no view. No view? No, the window's a mirror. When you look out the window, you're looking right back into the room again. <laughs> There's no air in the room? Well, we got a little air. The house detective comes up every hour and breathes through the keyhole. <laughs> look, Phil, what do you want living around in these flop houses, walking from Hollywood with an orange in your hand? Why don't you quit that guy, Benny? Me quit Jackson? What can I do? Well, you can come with me. You'll be happy on this program. Wait, I'll introduce you to the cast. Wait a minute. Uh, say, Fred. Yeah? Who are those guys sitting there with those uh, rented tuxedos? Phil. That's our orchestra. Orchestra? Them guys have got shoes on. <laughs> Now, look, Phil. Look, if that's an orchestra, where are the jugs? Jugs? Certainly. Where are the automobile horns? Where's the wash tub bass? Oh, Phil, this isn't like that band you have on the Benny program. These men are musicians. Well, then what is that guy down in front there? What's he doing? Weaving a rug? <laughs> Phil, that is the harp. That is the harp the man has there. <laughs> well, what are them other guys holding? Them wooden frying pans? Phil, those... Those are violins. <laughs> Phil, I'll show you how our violin section sounds. Mr. Goodman, a few bars on the strings, please. <laughs> Well, Phil? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. But, Phil... Somewhere under one of them guys is a jukebox. <laughs> you come with my program, Phil, and this orchestra will be yours. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, who are those guys sitting there chewing those black nightsticks? Oh, black nightsticks? <laughs> Phil, those are clarinets. Doesn't your band have wind instruments? Sure, six kazoos and a hot sweet potato. <laughs> Well, I'll show you how our woodwind section sounds. Woodwinds, Mr. Goodman. Well, Phil, how... <laughs> Phil Harris, you're crying. That was the most beautiful thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> You, uh, you liked it, eh? Well, I'm crying, ain't I? And I'm cold sober. <laughs> well, 
Well, wait till you hear the brass. Well, wait a minute. Brass, brass. Who cares about brass? That's one thing I got in my orchestra, too. Brass? Right next to every one of my boys is a cuspidor. <laughs> But our brass section is dry, Phil. All right, Mr. Goodman. Beautiful, isn't it, Phil? Fred, I'm as limp as a buggy whip in the rain. Listen, wait till I tell Spike Jones about this. Phil, how would you uh, how would you like to conduct our orchestra? Well, okay. Which guy do I kick to start him playing? <laughs> Certainly, and my band is Frankie, the guitar player. Phil, you don't... You don't kick anyone. Here, take this. Well, what am I going to do with this stick? Now, you just wave this little stick up and down and see what happens. Okay. Oh, Fred, did you hear that? That was me. That was me. I did it. Alice, baby Alice, Phyllis... That was me. Oh, 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 everybody. That was me, Fred. Now, that easy, was Phil, Phil. Well, it was me. That's ju- I know, I know. That was just a sample of what you have on this program. Now, what do you say? Well, I, I, it's, it's good, Fred, but uh, Benny gives me jokes to tell. Phil, you come with me. The whole program will be yours. You'll play music, tell jokes. You'll be the star. Little old Philzy, a star? And what a star. Now, here's how your program will sound, Phil. The music starts... <laughs> That silly so-and-so from the solid south, Phil Shut My Mouth Harris. Thank you, thank you. Hiya, folks, it's Phil Z again. <laughs> Tonight I'm as hot as the floor of a Turkish bath. Oh, what? Why are you so happy, Phil? Well, I just heard, heard from Uncle Fred. He's a policeman in Atlanta. A policeman in Atlanta? Yes, he's a Dixie cop. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, Harris, if anything happens to Abbott Costello, I have nothing to worry about. Well, Phil, I think it's about time to leave for Allen's Alley. Allen's Alley, nothing. This is my program, and on my program, it's called Tobacco Road. All right. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Ah, yes, it's so quiet and peaceful here on Tobacco Road, Fred. Well, it should be. Everybody's out in that play again this year. Yes, sir. But I see the senator's at home. A cottonmouth snake just come out of his front door running for its life. I'll now. Somebody has to Harris is the name, Claghorn. Phil Harris, that is. Well, I'm here. from the South, the Deep South. Well, I gotta... Where I come from, we refer to you as that silent senator from up north. I don't know what the you... The only mean. band I'll listen to is the Dixieland band. Now, look, My Senator... favorite singer is Ginny Sims. Cotton Ginny, that I'll is. I'll say to it. Speak up, Senator. The floor is yours. Out with it. Well, I got a... Start blabbing. Don't be another cruelty. Now, well, look here, Claghorn. Quit, you old flooded that is. Why are you standing Now, don't with... peel a possum. Go not Wait a minute, Phil. I'm from Phil, the solid. Phil, you were... Uh, Phil, you I'm solid, brother. Phil, wait a minute. Hold your southern temper. You can't talk to the senator like this. You keep your big northern nose out of this, you Yankee Christian fucker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Son, I want to shake your hand. you got a mouth after my own heart. Well, it's a pleasure, Senator, a pleasure. Well, Phil, what about the rest of the program? Forget the program, Fred, forget the program. When two Southerners get together, there's got to be a song. I come from a humming family, son. Let her rip. Okay, Senator. <laughs> Hot corn, bread, and black-eyed peas The smell of them magnolia trees Just laying around in your DVDs That's what I like about the crowd Those lazy naps in the afternoon Old Jeff Davis and F.E. Boone The greasy smell of big raccoon That's what I like about the South Hit it, Senator The way Southern folks all say you all The way the cotton comes up in fall The way the bull weevils eat it all That's what I like about the South where Coca-Cola's home and fizz, where man can live on land that's his. With his plenty of money, Confederate that is, that's what I like about South. Now, wait a minute, boys, it's my turn now. Give me the Bowery where folks go slumming, New York girls so becoming, where every house has indoor plumbing, that's what I like about the North. 
Old Broadway, those burlesque queens. Central Park with its grassy greens. Where Mammy's little baby likes Boston baked beans. That's what I like about the North. All right, boys, let's do it all together, huh? Where everybody, north or south, can get right right up, shoot off his mouth. We're kidding one another is all fair play. That's what we like about the U.S. Broadcast for our armed forces overseas. And now it's goodbye from Portland Hotham and Irma Pius, Mrs. Newsbaum, Alan Reed, who is Bob Stop Openshaw, Parker Benley, who does the part of Titus Moody, Kenny Delmar in the role of Senator Claghorn, the DeMarco sisters, Al Goodman and his orchestra, Fred's special guest, and Fred Allen himself. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. <laughs> Take a trip back to Dodge City with Marshal Matt Dillon in Gunsmoke, coming up next. Now, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just for every big and little Indian in your camp, a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor. Toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. <laughs>
You're a stranger in Dodge, Marshal. Well, I've only been gone a week, Sam. Hey, you got any rye left? Kitty over there has got the last bottle, Marshal. Oh? Uh-huh. I'll have some tomorrow when the Santa Fe gets in. Good. Meanwhile, I'll see if I can talk Kitty out of a drink. Sure. I heard you were back, Matt. How are you? Uh, you've been saving that bottle for me, Kitty? You know, I never drink rye. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, it's the closest I've been to civilization in a week. Did you find what you're after? Yeah, I found him. Yeah. Uh, what's that stuff you're drinking? This? Here. Keep the bottle on the floor. It looks better. Now, let me see that. Professor Bones Wonder Medicine. Celebrated vegetable pulmonic detergent. Well, I hope it tastes better than it reads, Kitty. It tastes fine, Matt. Makes you feel fine, too. Essential oil of worm seed, a new and valuable curative. Professor Bone, Ph.D. and Pulmist. Professor of Practical and Medical Botany, Natural and Civil History. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Where the world did you get a hold of this? Well... Everybody's taking it, Matt. Oh, I forgot you were away when Professor Bone arrived. What? You mean he's here in Dodge? Sure. Came last Thursday. Got a fancy wagon they lectures from every day. But this time, as a matter of fact, you should hear him, Matt. He's great. Yeah, yeah. He must be. No, he really is. Well, what's in that tonic, Kitty? You're kind of misty already. Makes you feel great, Matt. Try some. Here. Uh, no, 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 thanks. I don't need any worm seed oil. Liquor does me all the harm I need. You'll buy some once you've heard him talk. He's awful smart, Matt. Yeah, yeah, he must be. He's a professor. It says so on the bottle there. I don't care if he's a professor or not. He makes wonderful tonic. Yeah, I can see he does. Matt? Oh, I'm glad you're back. Yes, you come with me. Oh, uh, hello, Doc. Sit down. No, you? you come with me, outside. I want you to see this spectacle. Huh? Oh, well, what are you talking about, By Doc? this red-nosed old scarecrow, Loot Bone. He ought to be tarred and feathered, that's what. Uh, oh, look, look right there. There's a bottle of Kitty. That's yours. It's good, Doc, real good. I'm going to smash this bottle in the street. No. And if I find you drinking any more of it, I'll paddle you. That's what I'll do. Really, Doc? Oh. See, you see what it does to people? Come on, Matt. Okay, Doc. I might as well find out what this is all about. You'll excuse us, Kitty? You, not Doc. I mean what I said, Kitty. Boy. Yeah, let's go, Doc. Uh, there, there's his wagon. And look at that crowd of fools. Well, what's so wrong with it, Doc? I'll tell you later. First, I want you to hear him talk. The man's demented, that's what. Ah, uh, there he is, Matt, yes. Is he standing in the back of his wagon there? Yes. He's finished entertaining them now. We're just in time for the serious part. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. I discovered the formula for this famous elixir while serving as personal surgeon to the king of Santo Del Rio. Oh, that liar. Is he, Doc? Let's listen. Professor Bones' wonder medicine has cured more than 3,000 cases of ague, 2,500 of chronic inflammatory rheumatism, 2,000 of green sickness, 1,000 of mercurial diseases, 1,500 of liver infection, and 6,000 of general debility. Matt, he ought to be hung. It purifies, cleanses, and strengthens the fountain springs of life and infuses new vigor throughout the entire body. In fact, my friends, Professor Bone's wonder medicine will cure all disorders incident to the human rights, without exception, no matter what the age, circumstance, or place of residence of the afflicted patient. Hey, Professor, I live over near stinking spring. Will it cure me? <laughs> You're drunk. 
quite a day ever since I was weaned, Professor. I pity you, my friend. Professor, when I was 12, I got drunk and went to sleep at a hackerberry tree. I never did find out how I got down. <laughs> oh, don't laugh. Ladies and gentlemen, don't. Don't laugh. Pity the poor man, the poor wretch. Whiskey has him crushed in its foul trap. His eyes roomy, his brains awash, his manhood's gone. Are you shut up? Whiskey, I tell you. Whiskey did it. Any more talk about me, and I'll put a bullet in you, Professor. Evil man, drunken specter. I'm telling you, no more. No, no more. Now, ladies and gentlemen, about to appear on the wagon beside me is a man you all know and respect. One of your finest and most worthy citizens, a man whose very presence contributes mightily to the progress of your fair town, a man whose soul is pure, but whose body, ah, whose body has been the host of five separate diseases, any one of which would soon have been fatal. But now he is saved. Three bottles of Professor Bones' wonder medicine has done it, and, and here he is to tell you of this miraculous cure in his own words. Step forward, sir, and speak. Speak for the sake of your fellow man. Great heavens, Matt. It's Chester. Chester. Hello, Mr. Dillon. Get on from there. Why, yes, sir. But my dear sir, you've got to talk to the people. Hurry it up, Chester. Well, who are you, sir? Where are you going now? No, come right back here, you. Come back. Just go on with your lecture, Professor. Never mind about him. You should pick the wrong fine citizen, Professor. <laughs> hey, Professor. Yes, what? This here stuff of yours will cure anything? Anything, my friend. Every disorder known to the medical faculty. Well, my old man is 80, and he's got a beam stuck in his throat. <laughs> no, now, shut up, all of you. It's for true. How about it, Professor Willis? I'll come to see your father, sir. I'll visit him as soon as I'm able to pass a few bottles down among the good people gathered here. Uh, thanks. Hello, Mr. Dillon. Doc? Come on, let's get out of here. Yes. Of all people. I suppose he's got you all doped up with that stuff, too, Chester? Oh, it makes you feel great, Doc. Is that why you were up there? No, sir. I got a deal with the professor. He pays me $2.50 a day and gives me all the medicine I can drink. Free. It's idiots like you that made it possible for such quackery, Chester? Now, here, Doc, I'm not an idiot. You've been acting like one, but that's not what's important. Now, I've analyzed some of Bone's so-called medicine. It's got opium in it, for one thing. Well, you think it's dangerous? Doc? Of course it is. People can get in the habit, and what's worth is something is wrong with them, and they're taking the stuff they wouldn't find out until it's too late. You've got to stop this business, Matt. Yeah, I suppose you're right, Doc. Either you stop him or... Well, by heaven, I'll shoot him. Now, I'm serious, Matt. All right, Doc, all right. I'll talk to him a little later. And meantime, you stay away from him, Chester. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. I didn't know. All right, hold it, Sam, hold it. Uh, Professor Bone, I'd like to have a word with you. And who are you, sir? I'm a U.S. Marshal. Now, uh, let's sit at a table over there, huh? Come on. I'm at your service, Marshal. Oh, 
Not just sit down. Thank you. And uh, to what do I owe this honor, sir? It uh, isn't exactly an honor, Professor. I want you to stop putting opium in that stuff you're selling. Oh, well, come now, Marshal. Surely you don't believe Doc me. Adams has analyzed it, Professor, and either you make it harmless or I'm going to run you out of Dodge. <clears throat> yes, yes, I believe you would. Now, you're free to sell it and you're free to do all the talking you want, but that's all. I'm, I'm a lonely old man, Marshal, and I'm tired of wandering. I'll do what you say. Good. I, uh... I hope you don't get into trouble with your preaching about liquor, Professor. I have been fighting against drink ever since I was a youth. Oh? Well, what about opium? Isn't that just as bad? Well, I don't sell enough to do any harm, Marshal. Maybe, but why are you so strong about whiskey? When I was a child of 12, my grandfather got drunk and threw a pet owl onto a horse that was standing nearby. What? And he did. And it frightened the horse into kicking an orphan boy broke the rim of his belly. That boy died, Marshal. Oh, oh, I see. Professor Bone. Ah, Mr. Reeves. Welcome, sir. And how is your good father? Marshal, I'm glad you're here. Oh, what's the trouble, Reeves? This here now, Professor, he's a trouble. I'll tell you. My old man, he had a bean stuck in his throat. The professor told me to give him a steam bath and then throw cold water on him. And I was doing it. Well, what for? I well, suppose so he'd catch cold and get a cough and bring up the bean. Oh, well, of all... But it didn't work, Mr. Reeves. It killed him. It what? My old man is dead. Dead? Good heavens, poor fellow. Now, I'm going to kill you, Professor. No, you're not. No, but no man can die of a mere cold, Mr. Reeves. Some, something must have gone wrong. Something went wrong, all right. Uh, come on. We'll get dark and go see what this is all about. And you'll get the idea of shooting anybody out of your head, Reeves. Maybe I will. What goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go on to your breakfast table is Post Toasties. Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe. Then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Post Toasties heap good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heap good cornflakes. Post Toasties heap good cornflakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrapped Post cereals, guaranteed fresh, or triple your money back. Now back to Gunsmoke. Professor Bone wasn't a normal, everyday type citizen. But he wasn't a murderer, either. And whatever had gone wrong and killed Reeves' father couldn't be blamed entirely on him. Reeves had been a fool to follow his advice in the first place. Doc told him so, too, in as many ways as he could think of. We found the old man still lying in the steam bath Reeves had made. All he'd done was to dig a big hole in the ground with a fire pit in the middle and then stretched some canvas across the top for a roof. Doc climbed down into it, and after a few minutes, he came back out again. Uh, well, Reeves, all I can figure is your father died of a heart attack. I don't believe it, Doc. 
That old man was strong as a bull. Well, I know that, but there's nothing else that could have caused it. How long did you have him in there, Reeves? Oh, maybe half hour, Marshal. He was having a fine time when I left him. He poured a whole jug of vinegar on them rocks. I went up to the house to get some more. Oh, wait a minute. What would you say? Uh, vinegar? Sure. Professor here said it'd help him to sweat. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I thought so. What? It's the vinegar that killed him, Reeves. What do you mean? That's limestone you used in there, isn't it? Well, limestone is All strong. right. You put vinegar on hot limestone, and it'll make acid gas. Well, and that's what suffocated your pa. I'll be... A... I, I didn't tell you to use limestone, Mr. Reeves. No, you, you can't blame me for that. No, but the vinegar was your idea, Professor, and I still say you murdered him. Now, wait a minute, Reeves. You're not being sensible. This thing was an accident, that's all. Huh? I'm not a murderer. I never hurt anybody in my you life. You don't even know what you do, you old fake. Selling that slop of yours, loaded with narcotics. Did you tell him to stop that, Matt? Yeah, yeah, Doc. He said he would. My medicine is as pure as the dew, gentlemen. A newborn babe could drink Don't it. let me catch you giving handy newborn babes. I'm going to analyze it every day you're here. And I hope that won't be much longer. Oh, I'm a lonely old man, sir. The only home I have is in my wagon. Well, then go live in it somewhere else. Huh? You've caused enough trouble around here. Doc, take it easy, honey. Am I to be banished from the face of the earth? Am I not a man like any other man? Do you think I have no heart, no feelings? No soul? Well, why don't you just shut up and get out of here? I want to bury my old man. I would gladly help you in that task, Mr. No, Reeves. sir. No, sir, not you. Not by a long sight. You are unkind, sir. Gentlemen, I take my leave of you. Good day. <laughs> For some reason, the three of us stood there in silence and watched Professor Bone walk away. He stopped once and glanced back at us for a moment, then went on. Later, when we got back to Front Street, his wagon was gone, and we figured probably that would be the last that we'd see of him. Dodge was fairly quiet that night. And when somebody reported seeing a fire of some kind out on the prairie, I decided I might as well ride out and have a look. There's no flames left, Mr. Dillon. I guess it must be all burned out. I don't remember a house of any kind around here. I wonder what it was. Well, maybe just a prairie fire that didn't get really started. Yeah. Oh, there's something, Chester. Over there. Yeah. I can see a few coals. Oh. Well, uh, Why, it's a wagon, Mr. Dillon. It's all burned up. That's Professor Bone's wagon, Chester. I know I see you're right. That's his horse, too. Professor! Professor Bone? Now, let's take a look here. Where in the world could he be, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. Uh, uh, look out now. I'm going to move some of this. Yeah, I'll help you. Right there. Yeah. You think that's a professor? I'm afraid so, Chester. Poor old fella. He must have been asleep and his wagon caught fire. Maybe. Funny he couldn't get out, though. Unless he was drunk or something. Professor Bone didn't drink, Chester. That's right, I forgot. He sure didn't. 
say you think maybe somebody did this, Mr. Dillon? Well, he had two or three men pretty mad at him. Yeah, or, or maybe it was Indian. Oh, not this close to Dodge. No. No, I guess not. I don't know, Chester. A lot of things can happen to people who get too lonely. Now, oh, come on, let's get out of here. We'll take care of him in the morning. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there's sugar crinkles at every place. Sure, new sugar crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar crinkles... Every golden crisp nugget of them is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new sugar crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, sugar crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack for your breakfast or a snack, sugar crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try sugar crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right, sweet. So better get several packages. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Barney Phillips, Paul Dubov, and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, avenges a killing during his fight to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. America's favorite miser is coming up next. It's the Jack Benny program. More real fruit flavor blends it more skillfully and then brings it to you in six delicious flavors. Those are the reasons why Jell-O has become the fastest selling gelatin dessert in the entire world today. So when you want Jell-O, always ask for it by name. Insist on genuine Jell-O. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring you Waukegan's gift to the amusement world, that star of screen, radio, and Brewster's Millions, Jack Benny. Well, hello again. This is Jack Benny, the legitimate actor, talking. And thanks, Don, for bringing it up. Well, Jack, I want to compliment you on your excellent performance in the title role of Brewster's Millions yeah. last Monday night. I was really surprised. Surprised? Why, mm -hmm. Don, you've seen me play legitimate parts in several pictures, haven't you? Yes, but you were good Monday night. Mm. Okay. Thanks very much. Say, Jack. Yes, Phil? That part where you were throwing away money recklessly, that was rich. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got a kick out of that. You mean when I was spending money fast and furious? Yes, sir, you certainly are an actor. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. I'm not cheap. And furthermore, playing a straight part like Brewster is really my racket. My oh, meat. Oh, uh, Jack. Uh... <laughs> really? Is. That's my meat. <laughs> Can I go ahead now, Jack? Yes, oh, yes. All right. Sir. Well, did you happen to read the newspaper report in, on your Monday broadcast? Uh, no, I didn't, especially that one from Buffalo. I didn't well, I, <laughs> I thought you'd be interested, so I brought a couple of them over. Well, thanks, Don. Let me see them. Hmm, get this one. Warm weather to hold over the weekend. Oh, it's on the other side. But Mother thought he was atrocious. <laughs> Listen, Kenny, that wasn't any imitation. That was me. Oh, you wouldn't spend all that money. I wouldn't, eh? <laughs> You're as bad as Phil. He thinks I'm tight, too. Oh, I didn't mean that, Jack. Oh, yeah? Then what did you mean? All I meant was your wallet doesn't know the sit-down strike is over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's lucky you insulted my wallet, not me. <laughs> Say, you know, Jack, we forgot all about Mary. I thought her performance in Brewster's Millions was excellent. So did I. Me too. Well, she was great, but you know, fellas, I'm sorry I let her do it. Why? Why? Well, I, I can't do a thing with her since last Monday. No kidding, whenever I talk to her, she gets very ultra and dramatic. In fact, she thinks she's another Catherine Hepburn. Are there two of them? Kenny. <laughs> I tell you, fellas, I've never seen such a change Jack, in a girl. Right, here she comes now. Oh, well, remember, fellas, don't, don't encourage her. Hmm, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Oh, there you are, Kenneth. <laughs> Mary, you overlooked Phil. Oh, Philip's dreadfully sorry. <laughs> now, listen, Mary, snap out of it, will you? Where have you been? In the library, reading Way Down East by Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, cut out that bunk. We're doing a program, and you're here to tell jokes. So act like you always do. No, no, they'll only laugh at me. Oh, they will. <laughs> well, that's too bad, isn't it, Miss Bernhardt? <laughs> oh, you Americans. <laughs> there you are, fellas. What did I tell you? I've heard of people going highbrow over a period of years. But I want to tell you, Mary, this sudden departure from your normal self is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Yes, ain't it? <laughs> Ah, uh, what do you do? I just as well do a musical program tonight. Come on, Kenny, do your song. No, no, they'll only laugh at me. Mm. It's a fine Jello program tonight. Speaking of Jello, my dear friends, need I remind you that it is economic? Yeah. No, no. And don't let the fact escape you that it has most six most delicious flavors: Ooh. strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and uh, oh, let's see, what's that last one? Oh, yes, lime. Lime, yes, lime. That was awfully good, old fellow. Really, sing, Kenneth. I'm not too full. <laughs> When my dream boat comes home, then my dreams no more will roam. I will meet you and greet you, hold you closely, my own. tender love you bring will be sweethearts forever when my dream
Dream Boat Comes Home, sung by Kenny Baker. And you see, Kenny, nobody laughed at you. Yeah, they didn't laugh either. Yeah. You see? You were a hit. Sir. Oh, Jack, you mind if I retire this program? Mary, cut it out now, will you? Now get back to your normal self. Oh, all right. Give me a hunk of gum, will you? Here, and don't chew too loud. Hey, Jack, what about the B? Are you going to play it tonight or not? Now, listen, Phil, get this straight. I'll play the B just as soon as I find my violin. I've hired a private detective to look for it, and believe me, we're leaving no stone unturned. Did you hide it under a stone? Hmm. But, Jack, if you do play it, I won't be here to root for you. You know, I'm going away tonight for rest. A rest? Why? What's the matter with you? I read in Winslow's column that I'm sick. <laughs> Well, you, I don't know. You look all right. Did you see a doctor? Who needs a doctor when you got Winchell? <laughs> That's right. Well, we're certainly going to miss you, Mary. Uh, where are you planning to go? Oh, I'm <laughs> going to New York for a couple of weeks and recuperate. That's a nice place mm -hmm. for a rest, yeah. There's a lovely... Oh, yes, there's a lovely sanitarium there right on the corner of 48th and Broadway. It's called the... Uh, Oh, oh, what's the name of that place, Phil? The Cotton Club. That's it, the Cotton <laughs> Club. Yeah. Oh, you rest there beautifully. Huh? Yes, that's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Mary, will you do me a favor? Uh, sure, Kenny, what is it? Well, when you come back from New York, would you mind bringing me some oysters? Oysters? Kenny, can't you get oysters right here in town? Yes, but there's no R in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen... Then move to Burbank and shut up, will you? I did move there. Then all you got to do is shut up. That's right, Mary. We'll miss those answers next week. Ah, oh, but it's great to go back to New York once in a while. I don't know, you renew old acquaintances and see all your old pals. Bill Baker, Jack Pearl, Goody Ace, Ed Sullivan. Fred Allen. Quiet. I'm trying to avoid his name. And I don't blame you, Jack. Did you hear him last Wednesday when he kept saying how tight and cheap you are? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. So that's where Phil Harris got his idea for those smart cracks about me. <laughs> I knew he couldn't be original. Come here a minute, Don. Come here just a second, will you? You know, Alan talks about me being tight. Were you ever invited to a party at Fred Allen's house? No, Jack, no. Why? Well, he's the kind of a guy that fills you full of herring and then makes you pay for a glass of water. <laughs> No kidding, really? That's a fact. That's a fact. I got a drink there for nothing, but I swallowed a carnation. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, since those gags will be tough to follow, uh, Phil Harris and his orchestra will render a number entitled, He Ain't Got Rhythm. How about playing, Phil? Okay, Jack, as soon as I get my baton. Your what? My baton. That's better. You <laughs> killed my gag. There's no R in that either. Play, Phil. <laughs>
them from on the avenue, conducted by Phil Harris, who didn't know the number was over until the boys laid down their instruments. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I like you, too. Well, some orchestra leader. And now, folks... <laughs> I mean, if you haven't got a baton, I mean, how about a do? Poor boy. For our feature attraction tonight, we are going to present a sophisticated English drama entitled Lady Guinevere's Bracelet, or Ring Around the Wristy. I will play the part of Lord Stanley Beaverhead Boss. Mary Livingston will be Millicent, my granddaughter, and Phil Harris will be Phyllicent, my grandfather. The scene is the ancestral mansion of the beaver hat located at Hamhock on the Sauerkraut, England. <laughs> now, before going into this drama, I would like to point out that... Uh, answer that, Mary. Okay. Hello? Yes? Yes, Mr. Campbell, he's here. Oh, Jack, it's Lawton Campbell of General Foods. Well, the boss. Huh? Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Campbell. Yes? Yeah. What? Well, look, uh, look, Mr. Gamble, it, it would be silly to go back to that because we have no idea where Cactus Face is hiding. <laughs> no. No, look, we, we planned this English play and, well, I... What? Oh, I can either look for Cactus Face or a new job. I, <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, you're the boss. <laughs> uh, goodbye. <laughs> Hmm. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we will do a command performance. <laughs> the twelfth episode of our Western serial, Buck Benny Rides Again. <laughs> we'll do it, but we won't do it good. I hope I fall off my horse. You will if you get on. Well, get our cowboy suits on. Gosh, help me off with this frock coat, Mary. Kenny, throw out the tea and crumpets. Okay. Such waste. Bring in the horses, Don. Mary, have you seen my spurs? They've been in your back pocket for a week. Hmm, I thought it was arthritis. <laughs> anyway, this play will go on immediately after... Oh, Jack. Next... Jack. Uh, Mr. Campbell seemed just a little bit upset. Uh, maybe I ought to say something about Jello just to please him. Well, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I care. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're thinking of a tempting, delicious dessert to serve tonight, why not think of Jell-O? Oh, yes. Remember, it has the new extra-rich fresh fruit flavor, and it tastes twice as good as ever before. Oh, that's being conservative. So insist on genuine Jell-O. Look for the big red letters on the box. Oh, by all means, do. I've been uh, wasting my time looking for the silver lining. Play, Phil. You can't even do a high-class play.
And now for our sponsor's play, Buck Benny Rides Again, or Theodora Goes Wild West. <laughs> I hope it flops. I will play the part of Sheriff Buck Benny, as tough an hombre as ever wore a wildcat for a muffler. A happy, snappy, nappy, don't give a rappy. Are you sappy? Shut your trappy. <laughs> The opening scene is the home of Buck Benny early in the morning where we find his mother in the kitchen chopping wood and Buck in bed sawing it. <laughs> Curtain. Music. Better get up, Buck. It's six o'clock. Six o'clock? Doggone it, I had that rooster set for nine. <laughs> What's the matter with him? Well, he's a Rhode Island red. Guess he's still on Eastern time. Hmm. From now on, I'm going to buy my alarm cocks in the West. <laughs> Turn him off, Maul. Okay. Oh! <laughs> Well, that's too bad. It's, it's, it's tough losing that timepiece. It's going to be tougher eating them. Well, Ma, I reckon I better be getting down to the office. I've got to get Cactus Face this time. Uh, say, Buck, when are you and Daisy going to get married? I don't know, Ma. We can't have a church wedding, you know. Why not? We can't get her pappy past Ike Muller's saloon. Well, why don't you take him up north and back him in? Might try that. Got to get going. Now, where's my horse? Under the bed. Doggone it, he always gets the lower. <clears throat> Come on, partner. Sleep well? <laughs> Glad to hear it. Open the door, Ma. Hello. Ooh. Morning, deputies. Morning, Morning Sheriff. Sheriff. Any news about Cactus Face, Deputy Wilson? Nope, not a word. You got any report, Baker? Well, you know that $500 reward you posted? Yeah. He came here and collected it. Who did? Cactus Face. Cactus Face, you darn fool. Why did you let him go? And that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Oh, I've done dumber things than that. <laughs> Baker, that's a fine thing after the way I worked day and night to catch that vomit. Well, I came closer than you did. Hmm, he wants to argue yet. <laughs> Never mind, Buck. You sure been hot on his trail. Mr. Campbell don't seem to think so. <laughs> now, listen, deputies. There's been a report the Cactus Face was seen walking into the Bucket of Blood barbershop. <laughs> and I want you boys to go there right away. Okay, Sheriff. Be sure and look under all lather. <laughs> but if he's not there, take a look next door at the goody-goody tea shop. Shucks, I'm no sissy. Now I'll do what I tell you to. I'm going to stop over at Daisy Carson's house and I'll join you boys later. Come on, Buck Benny rides again. Woo, <laughs> partner, woo. Come in. Hello, Daisy. Hello, tall, dark, and double chin. <laughs> Well, gal, your Adam's apple ain't exactly out in the open. <laughs> Why, Buck, gals don't have Adam's apples. Too late now, it got a snicker. <clears throat> Say, Daisy, I ain't seen you around for the past five weeks. What you been doing? Just sitting here knitting. Is that so? What you knitting? I won't know till it's finished. I hope it's a sock. I'm tired of wearing just one. <laughs> Speaking of socks, reminds me of soaks. Where's your pappy? He's out in the backyard working on his still. His still? Yep, he's making his own liquor now. What does he do with the stuff? Bottle it? Nope, he just drinks it as it comes out. Impatient old cuss, isn't it? You know, Daisy, I see him out riding once in a while. How can a man drink so much and stay on a horse? It was kind of hard until he taught the horse how to stagger. <laughs> He's out there uh, working on his still, eh? You know, Daisy, he better be careful. Them stills is mighty dangerous. Here comes Pappy now. Hello, Buck. Frank Carson, that's the worst thing you could have done. Well, that still blew you right across the yard into the house. Well, I was coming here anyway. 
That was quite an explosion. Where are your boots? Don't know. I had them on when I went out. <laughs> you ought to be careful with those steels, Frank. Wonder what made her blow up, Buck. Only built a small fire. You must have breathed into it. <laughs> Frank, you better stop drinking that stuff or them pink elephants will get you. Shucks, I got them trained now. One of them can play the bee. <laughs> Can? Yes, if someone doesn't steal his trunk. Hmm. Well, Buck, see you later. I gotta go out and get an expert to help me fix that still. Where are you going? After that brandy fella? No, after the gin man. Oh. Well, Daisy, I was just on my way to get cactus face and thought I'd drop by and talk to you. Something I won't ask you. What is it, Buck? Well, Daisy, I was just wondering if you reconsidered my offer of marriage. I ain't got time to talk about it now, Buck. I'm leaving for New York right away. New York? Yep. I just thought a little vacation would do me good. Well, well. Oh, say, Daisy, there's a gal I know who's making the same trip. Her name's Mary Livingston. You might meet up with her on the train. Mary Livingston, that big radio star? Yeah. Gee, I like her. <laughs> Doggone it, seems like everyone's going to New York. Oh, Miss Daisy, I got the buggy waiting outside to take you down to the train. Be right with you, Scooter. <laughs> Here, I'll help you with your carpet bag. You mind if I ride down the train with you, Daisy? Fine. <laughs> I was hoping you would. Well, come on, let's go. Well, Daisy, it's kind of nice sitting here alongside of you. Gee, I sure hate to see you go. When you get to New York, you want to watch out for them city slickers. Pretty gal like you can't be too careful. You set it and move over. Oh. Say, Buck, I hope you catch Cactus Face before I get back. Chucks, I plumb forgot about him. You're more important to me than anybody. Uh-huh. One more crack like that and I won't get on the train. Ha, <laughs> Say, Daisy, I just happen to think. And you're in New York. If you go into Macy's, bring me back a plug of tobacco. I understand they got the fancy kind. <laughs> well, Buck, we're getting near the depot. I feel awfully lonely all of a sudden. So do I, gal. But don't worry, just have a good time. I'll see you when you get back. Hmm, better hurry up, Scooter. Here comes the train. Okay, Buck. Come on, get out. Here's a new way to make an old favorite, chocolate pudding, and it's just about the easiest way of all. Use Jell-O chocolate pudding. It's the modern, up-to-date dessert that gives you the satin-smooth texture and that just-right consistency. It has the same homemade taste that made your mother's chocolate pudding so good. It's richer, creamier, more chocolatey, and it's amazingly easy to make. Just mix the contents of one package of Jell-O chocolate pudding with milk. Cook and stir over a low flame until the mixture comes to a boil and is thick and smooth. It takes only a few minutes. Then cool and serve in sherbet glasses. One package makes six servings, and everybody is bound to give this grand chocolate pudding the enthusiastic reception it deserves. And the Jell-O chocolate pudding is delicious, too, if you add to it raisins, nuts, or chopped up marshmallows. Try it plain or with one of these variations sometime. Remember, Jell-O chocolate pudding sells for the same low price as Jell-O. Ask your grocer tomorrow for Jell-O chocolate pudding. number of the 21st program in the new Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And don't forget, folks, next Sunday, I will definitely play the B. No kidding! On the level this time, fellas. I'm starting to practice it tonight. da 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 That's only a sample. Good night, folks. Oh,
Graham starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston comes to you from Hollywood over the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony Incorporated. Lux Radio Theater brings you another classic story coming up next. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard in Front Page Woman with Roscoe Carnes. Lux presents Hollywood. It's a fast-moving romance comedy we bring you tonight, the love story of two reporters, the boy who thinks that journalism is purely a man's profession, and the girl who won't say yes till she shows him that he's wrong. Starred are Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard with Roscoe Carnes. And as special guest, you'll hear that ace news gatherer, Mr. Floyd Gibbons. Louis Silvers is our musical director. Just a word now before our producer takes over. We are grateful to all of you for your loyalty to Lux Flakes. It is your purchases of our product that makes it possible for us to carry on with this program. And Lux can help you carry on with the many household tasks you have every day. Its rich, pure suds make short work of dirt, yet leave your hands soft and smooth. Yes, Lux gives you double help. It gets rid of dirt fast and protects your hands, too. Yet you pay so little for this extra help. A little goes so far, makes such fine, rich suds. Lux is thrifty. Keep a large box of Lux Flakes in the bathroom and in the kitchen. Another in the laundry. And now, your host and producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil D. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Front page women are not new in history. There was, for example, that fabulous creature, Anne Royal, who wrote a column signed Paul Pry. Finding John Quincy Adams bathing in the Potomac, she sat on his clothes, which he'd left on the bank, until the embarrassed Mr. Adams gave her the most extraordinary interview ever granted by a president of the United States. The front-page woman of my boyhood was that darling of the press, Nellie Bly. She aroused international attention when, in 1889... Armed with two knapsacks, a toothbrush, flannel underwear, a cap, ulster, and stopwatch, she dashed around the globe on behalf of the New York world in the then incredible time of 72 days. Songs, games, and a racehorse were quickly named after her. And I still have a dim recollection of that beautiful reporter, Nora Donnelly, called the Tut-Tut Girl. On the day Admiral Dewey returned from Manila, Nora boarded his ship for an interview. Rushing up to the admiral, she waved an American flag in his face and promptly burst into tears. Whereupon the admiral remarked, Tut, tut, little girl, don't cry. That gave Nora her new name. Tonight's front page woman, Paulette Goddard, is a star after only three pictures. Her latest being the Selznick International film, The Young in Heart. Born on Long Island, Miss Goddard is a former Ziegfeld Follies beauty and is heard tonight as Ellen Garfield. Hollywood knows Fred McMurray as the man who said no. In the days when he was a five-dollar-a-day extra, working in a mob scene, the director singled him out from a hundred others and offered Fred what to every extra is the opportunity of a lifetime, the chance to speak a line. But Fred was frightened, turned down the offer, and went happily on at five dollars a day until Paramount featured him. He stars soon in the new picture Cafe Society, and tonight he's Kurt Devlin, one of the screen's most reliable comedians, that perennial favorite, Roscoe Carnes, is heard as a news photographer who answers to the name of Toots. And so we go to press as the Lux Radio Theater presents Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard in Front Page Woman with Roscoe Carnes. <laughs> the reporter's room at North Prison. At a long table running halfway round the wall, a dozen telephones stand ready for service. They're silent now, but soon the wires will be screaming news as a woman pays the supreme penalty for murder. The reporters converse in hushed tones, nervous as the hour approaches. In a corner of the room, a lone girl reporter waits quietly. She's outwardly calm, but her heart thumps wildly. From the doorway comes Kurt Devlin of the Daily Express. Hiya, fellas. How 
with everyone on this festive occasion? Hard guy. Huh? Just oh, had a talk one. with the warden. It won't be long now. And well, that suits me. I hate these affairs. Yeah, the sooner the better. How are you, Mr. Devlin? What? Well, I'm a so-and-so. Hmm, that's what I always thought. What are you doing here, Garfield? Well, I'm covering the story for the star. You mean to say Have Spike Kiley handed you this assignment? I asked for it. You asked for it? Well, why not? It's a big story, isn't it? Oh, look, Tidbit, an electrocution is no place for you. Why not? I'm a reporter. No, you're not. You're just a sweet little kid whose family let her read too many newspaper novels. Now, take my advice and oh, get up. Oh, shut up. You think you're so cute, don't you? It's a wonder you don't talk baby talk. All right, all right. By the way, I don't suppose you've attended one of these high-tension parties before, have you? Well, there's always got to be a first time. Yeah, but uh, somehow it always seems a little worse when they burn a woman. Well, why make an exception because she's a woman? Sure. Well, it ought to be quite an experience for you if your knees hold out. Don't worry about me, Mr. Devlin. You know, I'm really grown up now. Sometimes I even cross the street without taking the policeman's hand. Yeah? Yes. Listen, little Miss Frontpage, it's okay for you to chase fires and ambulances, but this is different. It does something to you. It chews you up inside. Look at those guys. They, they've seen them before, and they're really tough. Don't go through it, kid. You don't have to. I'll cover for you. No. Not for me, you won't. I was sent here to, to see it, and I'm going to. Oh, come on. Let me get you out of here. I'll write your whole story for you. No. I can take it if you can. Okay, Tidbit. Here's the warden, fellas. Well, what do you say, warden? All right, boys. You can go in now. Okay. Well, it's time for the slow music. Uh, Helen, uh, how do you feel? Well, I'm, I'm fine. Well, come on, then. You wanted to join the parade, and I'll keep step. Oh, honey, let me cover for you. No one will ever know. No. I'm going myself. I'll write my own story. I'll... Oh. Ellen! Hey, Nick. Mac, give me a hand here. Yeah. Little Miss Front Page just pulled a faint. <laughs> How you doing, honey? Oh, I, I guess I'm all right now. Where are we? Almost back to town. It's all over and you're all covered. I phoned a story in for you. Oh, kid, I'm, I'm so ashamed. Thanks. No, that's all right. Ellen. Uh-huh? If you were me, would you ask me if I loved you? Uh-huh. Do you? Sort of? Not sort of. Lots of. Yeah? I know a guy that's married. He likes it. How about his wife? She wishes the guy were twins. So she could commit bigamy and be twice as happy. What do you suppose it would be like, Kurt? Heaven with all the modern conveniences. Gee, Ellen, why not? All this stuff about being a newspaper woman, that's kid stuff. You don't have to work. No, but... Well, I just want to prove to you that I can be as good a reporter as the next fellow. Oh, stop it. Look, we could get one of those studio apartments with a fireplace and... What do you say, hon? Oh, you make it sound nice, Kurt. I... Hey, wait a minute. The paper's on the street. Guys in chair. Here you are, Hey, boy, give me the express. Yes, sir. Let me have a star, please. Yes, ma'am. Keep the change, kid. Thanks. Hey, R, get your paper. Read all about hey, it. Hey, here we are, honey. Listen. By Kurt Devlin, express staff correspondent, North Prison, November 10th. <clears throat> With a song on her lips, Mabel Gay, Broadway's female Boniface, walked to the electric chair last night to expiate the murder of dapper Rudy Spain. Ah, boy, that's beautiful. Kurt Devlin, you're a rat. Sure. What? Well, you're a low, sneaking, vile, desperate. What are you talking about? I'll show you what I'm talking about. Listen to this. By Ellen Garfield, star correspondent, North Prison, November 10th. With a song on her lips, Mabel Gay, Broadway's famous female Boniface, walked to the chair last night to expiate the murder Boy, of Dapper. Why, it's the same story. You covered me, didn't you? Oh, yes, you covered me beautifully. Well, you sent them the same thing word for word. Oh, but I told them to rewrite it. Ellen, honey, you I didn't... You double-crossed me. What do you mean I double-crossed you? Do you think this is going to do me any good? They, they, they'll can me. Hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? I'm getting out of here before I slap your face in. Well, how are you going to get home? Well, the subways are still running. Yeah, but not to where you can go as far as I'm concerned. Goodbye. Hey, Kurt. What do you want? Are you going to eat that sandwich? What do you care? Well, if you ain't, I will. No sense letting all that mustard go to waste. Oh, go ahead. Take it. Thanks. Say, what are you beefing about? You ain't been fired. Not yet, anyway. Oh, <laughs> boy, that was a swell story you two had. I looked at the Express, and I looked at the Star, and I thought I was seeing double. Oh, get out of here, will you, Toots? Go on. Go on, take some pictures. Pictures of what? Oh, I get it. You want me to beat it, huh? Smart guy. Okay, okay. Kurt Devlin, the sarpus of the press cafe. I'll get a picture of you like this someday, and you won't know you from a lemon. Hello, Kurt. Ellen! Oh, hello. Thought you'd be out of the newspaper business and taking a course in domestic science by this time. Kurt, I found out you really did try to cover me last night. Oh, you did? I'm sorry, Kurt. I should have believed you, I know, but... Do you, do you think I'm a sort of a rat? Well, no. Just a little mousy, that's all. 
Did they give you your notice? No, but I got a piece of our Mr. John's mind, and it was certainly no present that a gentleman should give a lady. <laughs> what about you? Oh, Hartley was really quite pleasant about it. All he said was that he'd appreciate it if I could arrange a suicide pact with you. <laughs> well, I guess we're both in the doghouse. Yeah, don't worry about it. I've been in the doghouse for so long, I'm commencing to bark at strangers. Well, I'm not so worried about you. It's myself I'm worried about. Uh, two more weeks, and you'll be back covering the Dahlia shows. Are you going to start that again? Sure. Why don't you marry me? I'd make a swell husband, even if I am a reporter. I don't write novels and newspaper plays, and I take off my hat in the house. Perfect. Well, don't forget that I'm a newspaper woman, too. Yeah, and don't forget that women make uh, pretty rotten newspaper men. Oh, is that so? Listen, I'm as good a reporter as any man, and I can prove it. Pecans. And what's more, I'll make you admit it. Almonds. And I wouldn't marry you for anything in the world. Walnuts, both English and black. Why, you? What's that? That? Why, that's the fire alarm bell, remember? They keep it here for the convenience of ambitious reporters who like to chase the engines. Yes, I do seem to recollect, but thank you anyway. Hey, Kirk, you, you hear that? Uh, that's a three alarm. Well, now, what do you know? Toots has learned to count. Congratulations, Toots. Well, ain't we going to cover it? It's at the Granger Arms, that snooty apartment joint. I ought to get some pictures, maybe. Take your time. I'm having a talk with Miss Front Page. Well, the interview's ended, Mr. Devlin. I'm going to that fire. Fine. If it starts to burn out, put some kindling on it and keep it going till I get there, will you? You're so smart. Good day, Mr. Devlin. Hurry up, and maybe they'll let you ride on the hook and ladder. Straight behind the fire lines. Go on, now. But, officer, I tell you, I'm a reporter from the star. This press card says so. No, I'm not drunk or estrating any woman through the fire lines. I don't care if it says you're a billy goat. You can't get through. Well, I'll be a billy goat if I want to. <laughs> oh, no, you won't. If you're going to be a goat at all, you'll be a nanny goat in black. Officer. Huh? Officer, tell me, could you get me a cab? A cab? Oh, am I the doorman? Will you please do as I say? I've got Mr. Stone here. Oh? He's, he's been overcome by the smoke. Oh, Mr. Stone? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, let the cab through here. Oh, how are you, officer? Oh, Mr. Stone, what are you doing here, sir? Showing remarkably good sense by, by leaving a burning building, that's all. Oh, officer, <coughs> Mr. Stone is very shaky. Would you hurry that cab? Oh, sure, sure. I'll, I'll have it in a jiffy. Hey, cab, cab! Stone, are you all right? I... I don't know. Did... Did she get out of the apartment all right? I think so. She slipped out the back way. No one saw her. Find her. Tell her... Tell her I'm sorry. It was all my fault. Here's your cab, Mr. Stone. Thanks. Go ahead, driver. I'll tell you where to go. Now, young lady, are you still here? Yes, officer, I'm still here. And would you mind moving over just a little bit? You know, I can't see through a person. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> you can see through me, Uncle. He's a skeleton. <laughs> morning, Spike. Good morning, Miss Garfield. And where have you been? And why don't you go back? Well, what's the matter, Spike? Didn't you like my story of the fire? Oh, that was literature. The hungry flames greedily licked the paint from the building. I don't think my goose pimples will ever go down from that line. I'll bet we've given a million readers duck bumps. Yep, you got everything there was to get. Everything except the story. If you want to get the real thing, take a look at this copy of the Express. Marvin Stone disappears after fire. Broadway producer missing after apartment house fire by Kurt Devlin. Spike, how do you suppose he got that? By being a newspaper man, chickadee. There are 200 fires in this town every day, but only one Marvin Stone. You know, to me, you're just another dame that missed her calling. You ought to write poems on birthday cards. Go on, give it to me. I have it coming, but... Stone. Stone? There was a stone at the fire. Spike, I think I've got a scoop. You couldn't scoop the insides out of a cantaloupe. Give me 24 hours. I think I've got something. Yeah, I think so, too. Sleeping sickness. You hand me that phone. Huh? Just 24 hours, Spike. Just let me start off by finding where that cab took him. Took who? Stone, Marvin Stone. Hello? Hello? Brown and white cab? This is the Daily Star. Listen. One of your men picked up two men at the Granger Arms last night about 9.30. One of them was sick. Dark coat, gray fedora hat. We want to know where the driver took him. All right, I'll hang on. They're checking. Well, who was the other man? I don't know. I heard Stone mention a woman, too. Well, what woman? I don't know. No, I didn't expect you would. Oh, please, Spike, give me a break. A break? You've had your breaks. One more and you'll break the whole newspaper. Hello? You... Hello? Yes? Oh, I see. Thank you. Well, well? This is it, Spike. The driver took Stone to the Plaza Hospital. Plaza Hospital? I'll get a man over there right away. Oh, no, you don't, Spike. You've got a woman and she's on her way now. <laughs> Plaza Hospital. One moment. Hello, Plaza Hospital. I'll see if he's in. Miss, 
Will you please tell me? Go ahead, please. I did tell you. There's no one here by the name of Stone. Well, look. Was there anybody admitted about 10 o'clock last night? A man? Well, James Craig at a quarter to 10. Well, that's it. I want to see him, please. You aren't family, are you? Family? Oh, no, I just... Well, then you can't see him. Mr. Craig died a half an hour ago. Died? Died of what? Well, I'm not supposed to tell, but it was a stab wound. Stab wound? Are you sure of that? Well, that's what Miss Ohms said. She was the nurse in surgery. Miss Ohms, get her here for me, will you please? Give me two minutes with her and I'll make her famous. Oh. Yes, and you too. Hurry up. Here we are. The star makes another beat. Marvin Stone dead of stab wounds. Entered hospital under an alias by Ellen Garfield. Lucky little Ellen. Marvin Q. Stone, theatrical producer, was found dead of a stab wound in the abdomen. That's the stomach, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought, yeah. In the Plaza Hotel last night, search is being made for an unknown man and an unseen, unknown woman referred to as she by the mystery man in stone. In an overheard conversation... Overheard conversation? (laughs) I'll bet she overheard herself. Oh, to think of you being beaten by a dame. Yeah. She pinned a rose on me, all right. I got a hand of that. Uh, pardon me, isn't your name Devlin? Well, well, how are you? Mood of my delight? What's on your mind? Oh, nothing. Just wondered if you'd been reading The Star lately. Yeah, there was an interesting article by Lydia Pinkham in your last edition. Oh, you mean your yarn. Oh, you just had a lucky break, that's all. You stumbled over something and it turned out to be a corpse. (laughs) Really? You know, I think I hear a noise like the sound of crunched sour grapes. Hmm. Listen, you haven't got a story. All you've got is a lead. The real story is digging up the unknown man and the unseen she and the guy who did the foul deed. That's where I come in in my quiet way. If I don't beat you to it. All right. If I turn up this murderer, will you give in and marry me? Kurt, are you proposing? Sounded like that to me. Shut up, Toots. Will you or won't you? Maybe. If you find the murderer. It's the deal. Read all about it, honey, in the Daily Express. The curtain falls on Act One of Front Page Woman, starring Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard with Roscoe Carnes. In our short intermission before going into Act Two, let's turn to our friends, the Brownings. It's late afternoon, and 16-year-old Dot, home from school, finds her mother in the kitchen. Mother, may I make some fudge for the crowd tonight? Why, Dot, I'm right in the middle of getting supper, but... Oh, please, Mother. I'll wash all the dishes. Well, perhaps. What? Did I hear fudge? Dibs on licking the pan, Doc. <laughs> pan lickers or pan washers, Bobby. Aw, oh, shucks. There's too much washing up around this house all the time. Aw, oh, but you wouldn't mind, would you, Bobby? It's easy. Well, you should know. You're the demon dishwasher around here. Gosh, I never saw anybody like washing dishes the way you do. Well, gee, it's easy. With Lux Flakes, there's nothing to it. <laughs> You're right, Doc. Dishes are easier with Lux. Easy on your hands, too. Yeah, and Archie Smith said... Bobby, you hush up. Well, anyhow, Archie oh, Smith did Bobby, say... Bobby, please. Bobby, you better run along and play. Well, sure. Archie Smith did say, your hands are like rose petals. Well, people will always say nice things about Dot's hands, and yours, too, if you depend on gentle Lux for your dishes. These fine, pure flakes help hands stay lovely. In fact... Lux is so mild, beauty experts advise it for dishwashing. Lux contains no harmful alkali to dry the natural oils in your skin and make your hands rough and red. And it's inexpensive beauty care, too. You need just a dash of Lux to give you a fine big panful of real beauty suds that protect your hands and make speedy work of your dishes. Yes, a little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. Buy Lux Flakes tomorrow for your own dishes. And be sure to get the large size box for extra economy. Mr. DeMille. We continue with Front Page Woman, starring Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard with Roscoe Carnes. It's the following day. In the office of the Daily Express, Kurt and Toots are hot on the trail of the mystery woman. The desk in front of them is piled high with clippings from the newspaper file. Clippings of the murdered Marvin Stone. Toots is furiously writing names on a pad. As he comes to the end of the long list... He looks at Kurt in despair. 
Oh, the mystery woman. Boy, she is a mystery. Yeah. As far as I can make out, this guy Stone has kept company with every dame in the world except Whistler's mother. Yeah. Well, look at this list. You can interview the Follies line for ten years back and be only half through his address book. Yeah, never mind. You got them all down? Yeah. Well, come on, let's go. Oh, Kurt, we ain't gonna look up all these dames, are we? You think I'm crazy? <laughs> I wish you hadn't asked me that. Well, the first dame we're gonna look up never twirled a toe at the bald heads in the first row of the Follies. We're going to see the nurse who was present at the death of the late lamented and punctured Mr. Stone. Say, wait a minute. Are we on the expense account? Sure, Sam. Okay. Hello? This is Toots. Call me a taxi cab. Yeah, never mind the old guy. Well, well. So this is the room where Marvin Stone breathed his last. Yes, it is, Mr. Devlin, but I'm afraid I can't help you. There aren't any details at all, and he never regained consciousness. The body's been taken to the morgue. Mm-hmm. Are his uh, clothes still here? Yes, but I'm afraid they won't give you any clues. Police took everything out of the pockets. Nothing has less, less personality than a vacant suit, but uh, I'd like to take a look at it, if I may. Well, it's not regulation. Oh, come on now, beautiful. What do you care about those old regulations, huh? Mm-hmm. Very well. It's in the closet. Uh, this is the suit he was wearing. Hmm, beautiful piece of material, ain't it? You'd toast marshmallows on the candles around a coffin. Uh, do you mind if I examine it a little more closely? Not at all. Hmm, perfume. Have a sniff, Toots. Mm, it smells like foolish gardenia. Say, Kurt, what's perfume doing on a guy's suit? That's what I'd like to know. Uh, by the way, Toots, why don't you take a picture of the little lady in white here? Huh? Make a good human interest story, you know, the modern Florence Nightingale. Oh, now, really? Well, that's an idea. Now, 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 don't pose, honey. Just try to look like a cross between an angel and an ambulance going to a wreck. Oh, but I look too awful. You look very retrogravy to me. Hold it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Miss Nightingale. All right, all right, Toots, we're in a hurry. Goodbye, Miss, and thanks. Goodbye. Hey, Kirk, what was the mush about taking her face? We can't use her picture. Shut up. I just wanted you to keep her busy while I was cutting myself a slice of suit. Stone suit? Yes, stone suit. I took myself a small piece of lapel smelling of foolish gardenia. Okay, so what? Let's find out who used to clean Mr. Stone's clothes. I think I've got an idea. For years I cleaned the suits. Fine. Uh, do you happen to remember this piece of material? Material? Say, this is a good piece of good. Sure, that's off a Mr. Stone suit. A double-breasted. I cleaned it the day Mr. Stone was killed. Yeah? What time did you uh, deliver it to him? Well, the same night at 8 o'clock. Personally, I delivered it. 8 o'clock, huh? The fire was at 9. Sure. Are you a detective? I'm beginning to think so. Much obliged. Come on, Toots. Say, would you be violating a confidence if you told me what we're doing? We're smelling out a murderer. What we need now is a perfume shop, some place with class. Now, what we need, Mr. Chenard, is an educated smeller like yours. Just take a whip of this cloth and tell me what you can about the perfume. Mmm, it's very fine, expensive perfume. Not a standard brand, an individual creation, very feminine. Did you blend it? Oh, no, but whoever did is a fine parfumeur. It's heavy without being soggy. It has a distinct personality. In other words, the uh, perfume might have been blended to reflect the personality of the woman wearing it? Oh, undoubtedly. What sort of woman? Well, naturally, I couldn't be certain, but I definitely know it is the kind of perfume I would blend for a dark, decidedly Latin type. Latin type, huh? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chenard. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your poking your nose into my business. Oh, not at all, not at all. Toots, my good man. Yeah, what do you want, brains? We're going hunting for Latin. I tell you, I've got it, Toots. When Stone was stabbed, the mysterious woman was with him. All right, Sherlock, I'll bite. How do you know she was? Simple, Watson. The suit was delivered to Stone at 8 o'clock. The tailor said so. Yeah? It couldn't have come from the cleaner smelling of perfume. No. Therefore, the perfume must have permeated his clothes between 8 and 9. Right? Mm-hmm. He was stabbed between 8 and 9, so the woman was with him. Still right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Now, the Latin type was with him when he was knifed, so we go looking for Latins. Yes. Yeah. So we've seen a dame on our list named Cochita Rinal. Check. 
A dame named Marcelli. Mm -hmm. A dame named DeCosta. Mm -hmm. And a dame named Volini. Right. And where are we? We're on our way to the Gay Gaiety Theater, my friend, to see a name named Inez Cordoza. So I says, I'll get my chance if I have to break the leading lady's leg myself. Yeah, that's the way I feel sometimes. Gee. Hello. Huh? Hey, what's oh, the idea of breaking in on our rehearsal? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could either of you two lovelies tell me if Miss Inez Cordoza is around? Inez? No. She quit the show about a month ago. Oh, she did? Huh? Where is she now? She moved. I know that, because I called her up this morning to get the dirt in her boyfriend being murdered, and they said she left. Mr. Marvin Stone was her playmate, huh? Hey, what are you, a detective? With dainty little feet like mine? <laughs> No, sister, I'm a reporter, and if you help me out, I'll pay off with some good publicity. Well, my name's May LaRue. M-A-E. M-A-E. Take that down, Toots. I got it. Mine's Olive Wilson. Fine. Now, uh, what do you know about our Inez? Oh, I don't know so much, except that Stone was pretty crazy about her. Oh, she went for him, too. That is, until Mr. Coulter came along. Coulter? You know, Maitland Coulter, the big shot polo player. And what Stone burned up. Yeah. He tried to take a poke at Coulter one night right outside the stage door. Yeah, it was disgusting. They both led, but they're right. Mm-hmm. The next day she quit the show and nobody's seen her since. Hey, this is wonderful. I'll bet you were, you're the girls that, uh, the kind of showgirls that write novels and sculpt statues on the side. How'd you know? Hey, you have minds. Huh. Uh, by the way, did Inez leave any dresses or handkerchiefs around? No, she took everything. Inez was that way. Oh, she left a slip hanging on my rack in the dressing room. But I don't see what good that'd do you. Get it for me, will you? Okay. Yep. Leave it to babyface Inez to get publicity like this. You know, if I thought for a minute that I'd get splashed all over the front page, I'd slip a little cyanide to Butch. <clears throat> the, the, who, who, who's Butch? Well, that's my boyfriend. What's the matter? Don't you like him? Yeah, sure I like him. He's swell, but a girl has to think of her career. Now, there's a girl with a brain, Toots. I'll bet she has a Ph.D. Who told you? Here's a slip. Oh, do you mind giving it to me? Of course not. Thanks. Perfume, huh? Hey, Toots. What? That's the perfume, the same as on the coat. Toots, the unseen she is Inez Cordoza. Yeah, try photographing an unseen she. Hello. Hello, Mac. This is Kurt. Hold the first edition for a stop press and get a picture of Inez Cordoza and Maitland Colder out of the files. And send them down to me at police headquarters. I'm waiting there now. Have I got something? Listen, I've got a story that'd curl the hair on an eggplant. Hey, Sergeant, is the lieutenant still busy? Yep. He'll see you in a minute. Hello, Sleuth. Well, how's the future Mrs. Kurt Devlin? Fine. And the disappointed bridegroom? Mm, aimless, just aimless. How are you doing? Oh, up a tree and no coconut. Just got some routine stuff from the lieutenant. Anything to pick up your ears about? Not much. They found a loaded automatic in Stone's apartment, but no knife. The gun had never been fired. Gun, huh? What happened to the knife that did the deed? That's what the lieutenant would like to know. Yeah, I'll bet. Any signs of a struggle? Yes, and the Negro houseman says a man asked the number of Stone's apartment and went up about 8.30. And just before the fire broke out, neighbors complained of loud voices. Add that up and what do you get? A question mark. I suppose you've made some startling discoveries. Mm, no, no. In fact, it looks as though you're going to have to marry me out of love and not defeat. Maybe I will when you admit I'm as good a newspaper man as you. Oh, come on, Ellen. Let's call it a draw right now and never talk about it anymore, huh? Look, I made a bet with you on this Stone case. If you back out, you're a welcher. Okay. How about having dinner with me tonight? I'll meet you at the Roma about seven. Dutch? Oh, let me take you for once, will you? I'm commencing to feel like a Dutch uncle. You're commencing to talk like one. See you at Roma's. Okay. The lieutenant will see you now, Devlin. Oh, thanks, Sarge. Oh, and by the way, you'd better notify the homicide squad. Tell them to dig up a guy named Maitland Colder and a Latin lovely named Inez Cordoza. I've got a hunch the lieutenant will want to make a couple of arrests. Hello, Roma. Ah, Mr. Devlin. <laughs> the lady is waiting for you over here. Hello, honey. Do you think I'd never get here? Oh, I didn't mind waiting for you. Sit down. Thanks. Ah, gee, I like you. I'm sort of fond of you, too. Don't know why, except to remind me of an Irish terrier I hmm. had once. Smart dogs, Irish terriers. Well, this one wasn't. He bit me. All of which shows us Irish terriers will just stand so much. Which reminds me to tell you, you're through playing newspaper. You're going to get off that sheet and marry me. That's right. When you admit I'm as good a reporter as you. Listen, I'm tired of humoring you and trying to save your face. You're not a reporter and you never will be. You're just another name getting in the way around a newspaper office. In fact, you don't even know when you've been taken to the cleaners. So that's what you think, is it? Yeah. Here, take a look at the express. 
Go on, read it. Coulter and woman implicated in stone murder. Maitland Coulter, wealthy polo player and Inez Cordoza showgirl, were definitely identified by an express representative as the mystery man and the unseen she who were in Stone's apartment the night he was stabbed. Why... Sure, look. Coulter was arrested in his luxurious bachelor quarters at the exclusive town apartments at 6 o'clock this evening, but refused to make any statement. Police are searching for Inez Cordoza, who has disappeared, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Well? All right. You win. <laughs> Good night, Kurt. Hey, where are you going? You forgot to find Inez Cordoza. I suppose I've got to do it for you. So long. Oh, two women who are what goiters out of science, a pain in the neck. Give me Spike. Hello, Spike. This is Ellen Garfield. Spike, I've got a lead on Inez Cordoza. I found out where Devlin picked up his stuff. He went down to the gaiety and pumped the girls. Well, I did too, and I've got Cordoza's slip. <laughs> yes, but it has a laundry mark on it. Well, what do you mean, what good is it? Don't you know human nature? People don't change their laundries. Now, all I have to do is to find out which laundry it is, who the mark belongs to, and then wait for someone to call for some clean shirts. I'll tailor home, and ten to one, I'll find Inez Cordoza. All right, twenty to one. Goodbye, Spike. There's another laundry, miss. Thanks. Wait for me, will you? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, miss. What can I do for you? I've been to every laundry in town. Maybe you can help me. I'd like to know if this is your laundry mark. Yeah, let me see. Oh, yes, yes. This is one of our marks. It is? Uh-huh. I'm from the Star on the Marvin Stone case. Can you tell me whose mark it is? Well, not the name, miss. But there's a gentleman who calls for laundry with this mark. In fact, I have a package for him now on a rush job. Today? Well, yes. He said he'd be here just about... Oh, pardon me, please. You got my laundry? Yes, sir. Right here, sir. How much? One dollar and a half. Thank you, sir. Good day. Good day. Oh, miss. Yes? That man, he's the one. He just took the package with the same mark as you showed me. He did? Then where does he live? Do you know? Well, no, miss, I don't. But I uh, might be able to find out. Well, never mind. I'll follow him. Thanks very much. looking for Inez Cordoza. Come in. Oh, thanks. Sit down. You followed me from that laundry, didn't you? Well, no, I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. I saw you there. Robert. Come here, Inez. Inez. So you're Inez Cordoza. Robert, what does she want? Who is she? She's a dirty little fly. You're crazy. I'm no cop. Shut up. Sis, go in the other room. No. Robert, don't. Give me that girl. Get away from me. Go on, do as I tell you. Wait, listen. You've got me all wrong. Oh, no, I haven't. I got you dead to rights, sister. So if you know what's good for you, you'll sit tight and keep your clapper shut or you'll be going back to headquarters on a slab. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Just completed Act Two of Front Page Woman. Fred McMurray, Paulette Goddard, and Roscoe Carnes are heard soon in the third act. Now it's intermission time, and time for Mr. DeMille to introduce the evening's special guest. But before he does, just a word about our product. Lux is the world's largest selling package soap for fine fabrics. And here's why Lux contains no harmful alkali. It's so mild, so pure, it's safe for anything that's safe in water alone. A little goes so far. Make such fine, rich suds. Lux is thrifty. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. We've just been hearing about the adventures of a front-page woman. Right now, we're going to hear from a man whose stories have been printed on page one many times with date lines from Paris, London, Berlin, Shanghai, Madrid, and a hundred other cities around the globe. If I were to tell you the story of Floyd Gibbons in one sentence... I should say that he was there when it happened, because for many years he's shown an astonishing ability to get to the scene just in time for a big news break. 
I can't see all the way to New York. But I know exactly how Floyd Gibbons looks as he waits in a New York studio. He's a brawny, strapping fellow with a red face and bristly hair, sitting before a microphone with his hat hanging precariously on the back of his head. He's full of nervous energy. When he talks, his fist flies out, driving home his words. Over one eye is that familiar white patch, a relic of 1918 and Bello Wood. Speaking to you now from New York is the headline hunter, Floyd Gibbons. Thank you, Mr. DeMille, and hello, everybody. Here in New York, I've been listening to Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard in Front Page Woman. Now, that's the, well, that's a play about my kind of people, newspaper men and newspaper women. We make fun of ourselves, but we do our darndest to outwit each other on the job. For many years now, I've been, well, trying to figure out just what it is that changes a normal, happy, everyday sort of a person into a newspaper man or woman, and by golly, I still don't know. One day, some 20 years ago, I stood in a boxcar down in Mexico talking to Pancho Villa, the revolutionary leader. I was just a kid, and I threw questions at him one after another. I was so dumb, I didn't know that nobody dared question Pancho that way. Pancho got sore as a boil on the neck. He snarled at me in Spanish, What do you want to come down here for, gringo? You have a nice soft bed at home. Well, sir, I couldn't think of the answer to then, and I still can't. But I stuck it out with Villa and his army, and I saw plenty happen during that frightful war, including a 300-mile uh, retreat, which I think I led. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here tonight. The newspaper reporter tries his doggone to be there when it happens because the best and most truthful report of any happening is that of the personal eyewitness who can honestly say, I saw it. I was there when it happened. He has to keep in mind the importance of the main event, but must not overlook the apparently unimportant little facts that prove the truth of the story. I was on the 19,000-ton liner Laconia when it was torpedoed and sunk in mid-Atlantic. We were carrying a huge cargo of explosives. The thing I remember most is what a Canadian aviator named Dugan said when the torpedo hit us. Three of us were sitting in the smoking room listening to a phonograph playing Poor Butterfly. Dugan passed a pack of cigarettes and offered a light. He was the third man on the match. A few seconds later, the ship gave a sudden lurch. The deck began to slant and the foghorn began to blow the signal of distress. That was when Dugan became one of my candidates for immortality. He blew some smoke out of the side of his mouth and said, Hmm, that was a lousy torpedo. It didn't even blow up the mun munitions. Well, sir, the boat sank, but we got away all right and were picked up by a patrol boat without wireless the next morning. It took us so long to reach the Irish coast that American newspapers thought we were lost. The boss printed my obituary in the papers, and oh boy, was his face red when he got a 4,000-word cable story on the sinking of the Laconia from me the next morning. Of course, my clothing, trunk, and typewriter, and, and everything went down with the ship, and they also went down on the old swindle sheet. I mean the expense account. It isn't just ability to write that makes good reporters like these kids, Ellen Garfield and Kurt Devlin, in the play tonight. One of the best writers I know is my pal Westbrook Pegler. But Peg would still be a great reporter if he couldn't write a grammatical sentence. When King George V died, Pegler and I were covering the story in the, of the funeral in London. Newspaper men had to stand in line like the tens of thousands of mourning subjects of the late king. A line that stretched out for four miles, moving slowly forward in the rain. It looked as though it would take us ten or twelve hours to reach Westminster Hall, the place where the body was lying in state. Peg found a fellow who had a little sympathy for us when he found we were newspaper men, and he slipped us through the back door of Westminster Hall. That's just across the street from the abbey. And Peg... Well, Peg beat the other correspondents by several hours. It cost us eight bob each to get in. That's two dollars, you know. That was the first and last time I ever got into a royal funeral by the back door. There was nothing irreverent in our act, but it really was crashing the gate. A newspaper man does get around to a lot of places, and incidentally, Cecil B. DeMille... So does that product of yours. I've run into Lux Flakes all over the world. I've seen it in store windows from Shanghai to London. How do you do it, Mr. DeMille? And now, good night. How do we do it? Hmm, you've got to be good, Floyd. You've got to be good. That goes whether you're a reporter or a flake of soap. Good night and our thanks to you, Floyd Gibbons. And happy headline hunting. We're back in Hollywood and ready to star Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard in the third act of Front Page Woman with Roscoe Carnes. A few minutes have passed. Ellen, worried but calm, gazes steadily at the revolver which Robert Cardoza holds pointed at her head. Then she smiles quietly. You wouldn't really use that gun on me, would you? You never can tell, fly cop. But I'm not a fly cop. I tell you I'm a reporter. Robert, maybe she is a reporter. Miss Cardoza, believe me. I'm the only one who knows you're here. 
I want to get your side of the story because every day you don't tell the story, the public gets more and more convinced that you're guilty. But I'm not guilty. Well, then tell the world you're not. Stop trying to peddle that phony chatter or I'll fold you. Well, I'm only trying to help her. Shut up and sit down. Listen, Inez, you're leaving here tonight. Go inside and start packing. All right. But, Robert... Get inside. All right. Nice place you have here, Mr. Cordoza. You know, if you'd listen to me, I said maybe... shut up. All right. May I smoke? Some cigarettes on the table. Thanks. Hmm, my brand, too. Lucky Ellen Garfield. Now, where are you going? Get away from that window. It's awfully stuffy here. I thought you wanted to smoke. I do. Yeah, you better come back here and sit down. Listen, I... There, what are you doing? Look out! The curtains! The curtains are on fire! No, rotten... Well, pull it out! Do something! We'll be burned to death! Uh, well, you'll never get it off that way! Pull the curtains down! There. Jump on them! We'll be burned! There. There, it's out. I ought to bust you in two, you... I wouldn't if I were you. You? Where'd you get that gun? Thanks, Mr. Cordoza, for putting out the fire, and thanks for putting your gun down when you did. Now, Mr. Cordoza, you wouldn't believe me when I said I was trying to help your sister, so I'll have to prove it to you. Call Miss Cordoza, please. We're going to see the D.A. Now, Miss Cordoza, I want you to tell your story and tell it as straight as you can. Not only to help me, but to save yourself. Go on, Inez. The D.A. doesn't bite. Well, I went to Mr. Stone's apartment for dinner. When I arrived, Mr. Calder was there and Stone was sick. Calder wanted to call a doctor, but Stone wouldn't let him. He said it was nothing and, well, I thought he'd been drinking too much. We got to arguing. Stone struck Calder. I got frightened and ran out of the apartment. That's all I know, everything, I swear. Well, why did you hide out? I was afraid Calder might be drawn in. I didn't want to testify against him. I love him, but he's innocent, I tell you, innocent. You've got to let him go. Please, Miss Cordoza. No hysterics. You can go now. We've assigned a matron to stay with you until Calder comes to trial. Go on, Inez. They won't hurt you. Thank you so much for everything. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, Miss Garfield, congratulations. You did a splendid job finding Cordoza. Oh, nothing at all. Hello. Said you wanted to see me here. That's right, Devlin. I want to thank you for what you've done on the stone case. I think Miss Garfield's done fairly well herself. Well, thanks, Kurt. Well, I guess Cold is your man, all right. Looks open and shut. Open and shut? Hardly. Where's Exhibit A? A man who brings a gun to commit a murder doesn't bring a knife, too. A man who thinks to take a knife wouldn't forget and leave his gun in the middle of the floor. To build a case, we've got to have Exhibit A, the instrument with which the murder was committed. The knife hasn't been found. Well, how can they find it? They've searched Stone's apartment from stem to stern. I... Sure. But what that search lacked was the Devlin touch. Leave it to old Slewfoot, folks. I'm practically there now. Brandishing the knife. Oh, sure. I clean up apartment for Mr. Stone. Every day I clean with vacuum. Uh, you did a very good job, too. I cleaned up after murder. You sure did. Pipe down, Toots. Now, look, uh, I wonder if you'd be a good boy and let me see your vacuum cleaner. I go get. Ooh. Say, what do you expect to find in that Bronx bagpipe? I don't know, but our little Chinese friend Swing out here says he cleaned up the mess in the living room with us, so we might as well take a chance. Say, and... Mug, you get more and more elementary all the time. Here, uh, vacuum cleaner. Oh, thanks. And uh, now let's see what's in the vacuum bag. Here, just make yourself useful. Help me dump out the dirt. Here. Oh, I wish I'd never loaned you that Philo Vance book. Wow, look at the Sand. Sand. What do you suppose that got here? Maybe swing out clean the spinach with it. Oh, wait a minute. Sand. What's in that big vase standing over there by the door? Well, what's in it? Sand. 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 Oh, but you see, you sound like delirium tremens lost in the Sahara. It's an ash urn. They're always full, full of... Full sand. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, give me a hand with this. We're going to dump it. Maybe you'd like to put up a few beach umbrellas. Come on, help me here. Uh, let's see. Cigar, cigar, cigarette butts... Court, cigarette so you know you could get a job cigarette. in the nightclub doing that act. Cigars, cigarette butts, cigars. All cigarette. right, wise guy, look at this. Here it is. Oh, for the love of Mike, the knife. Yeah, the knife. And this little instrument, my friend, is going to give the D.A. a thrill and Mr. Colder the shock of his life. Hi, Kurt. Hi, Toots. Hey, hide that knife, Toots. Well, look who's here. Oh, I felt a great need for you, Kurt, and I knew you'd be here. Mm -hmm. What a mess. I see you've been looking around. Find anything? Me? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, such luck. Like There's a knife in this room, and it'd take Lady Macbeth to see it. Well, too bad, Kurt. Yeah, certainly is a shame. 
Extra, extra, colder indicted. Express finds stone murder knife. Kurt Devlin finds knife. Paper. Paper extra. Call the trial news in. Call the trial news in. Get the extra. Then, ladies and gentlemen, the knife was found in an ash receptacle. Why? Because this is what happened. There was a quarrel. Colter drew his revolver. In the struggle, Stone knocked it from his hand to the floor. Then Colter snatched the paper knife from the table and plunged it into the man he hated, committing the crime for which he came. Murder, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Premeditated murder. A crime of which the people demand you find him guilty in the first degree. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state rests. Ellen. What do you want, double-crosser? Say, we've got plenty of time to hang around the courthouse. Uh, you better stick with me. I really got something this time. I'll cut you in. Mm, no, thanks. You might slip and cut my throat again. Okay, if that's the way you feel about it. Hey, Toots, wait for me. Okay, well, what's on your mind? Listen, Toots, I've got an idea. I'm sick of your big ideas. I hang out with you, and I never get a chance to take any pictures. Toots, come with me to the uh, superintendent's office. Everybody's gone out for air but the jury. Well, what do you want in the super's office? Keys, Toots. One key, to be exact. The key to the broom closet. Listen, I can't take no pictures in a broom closet. Oh, shut up, William. I've been studying the plans of this courthouse, and I find the broom closet's got a double door. One opens into the hall, and the other opens into the jury room. And I, my friend, am going to listen at the keyhole. I get it. You scoop the verdict. Brilliant. Come on, Toots. Here's the key. All right, hurry up. Open the closet. If we're too late, I'll kill you. What do you mean? You spent four hours getting the key out. Come on, didn't... come on. Open it up. It's dark in here. <sighs> Close the door. It smells like old mops. Shut up. Listen. We'll vote once more. And this time, Mr. Harrow, I hope you see the light and vote guilty. I'll vote the way I like. It's 11 right. to 1. Holy shit. Vote shut up. All once more. Smith. Guilty. Vance. Guilty. Noise. Guilty. Adamson. Guilty. Norris. Guilty. Phillips? Guilty. Barkley? Guilty. Warburg? Guilty. Stacy? Guilty. Sorosky? Guilty. Ten for guilty, and my vote makes eleven. And now, Mr. Harrow, how do you vote? I vote the way I please. I, well, I, it's guilty. Guilty. Uh, Coulter's guilty. What a scoop. Uh, Better hurry and phone that news in. Yeah, that's where I'm going now. But look, Toots, the judge is out to dinner. That means the jury will have to wait in the outer room. You get in the jury room when they leave and mark the ballots, not guilty. Not guilty? What for? The jury just said he was guilty. Yeah, I know, but will you do as I tell you? Mark all the ballots not guilty and leave them lying on the table. I'm manufacturing a newsbeat for Little Miss Front Page. You mean she scoops the verdict and it's the wrong one? Right. She'll be hanging around the press room with the rest of the boys. I'll go and tip her off. Now remember, not guilty. Sorry, Spike. No news yet. Signed your dead and dying Garfield. Hey. Hey, Garfield. What do you want? Come closer. I know a secret. What secret? You'd better hurry to the jury room through the broom closet. Through the broom closet? With mm -hmm. what? With the key. Toots is there, and he's got the key. Go find Toots if you want to scoop. I'd like to believe that. Listen, go in there and read the ballots. I know the verdict, but you wouldn't believe me. Go in there and see for yourself. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Stop. Next three, get your express. Colder guilty. Next get your star. Cola not guilty. Next three, colder guilty. Next the cola not guilty. He is so. He is not. Next three, thank you, man. Order in the court. <coughs> Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. The defendant will rise and face the jury. What is your verdict, gentlemen? We find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Bailiff. Yes, Your Honor. That reporter, Devlin, knew the verdict before it was brought to court. I want to see him in my chambers at once. Hello. Hello, Spike. Spike, I steered you wrong. Yes, Colter's guilty. Yes, guilty. Signed your loving but fired Garfield. Hey, Garfield, what's the matter? What, what's it? Say, you say, well, what are you crying about? Oh, I'm washed up to it. I don't need Spike Carly to tell me I haven't got a job. Oh, gee, tough luck, kid. I'm sorry. Well, you're not as sorry as I am. Oh, I'm going over to the press cafe and drown my sorrows. Well, you can console yourself, honey. The judge just put Devlin in the can. <laughs> As for you, Devlin, you look swell behind bars. 
You can rot in jail. I wash my hands of the entire matter. But, Lester, you, you're, you're my editor. For heaven's sake, get me out of here. No, and don't call me Lester. You brought this down on yourself. The Express disclaims all responsibility. All right, the turnkey's gone. Now what? <laughs> Fine, great stuff, kid. Congrats. You did a great job. Don't worry, we'll spring you. So long. So long. Hello, Kurt. Well, look who's here. What's the charge on you? Nothing. I've been fired, that's all. I'm through, washed up. Oh. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry I tripped you up in that yarn, but... After all, you should have known better than the fall for that. Well, you don't have to rub it in, Kurt. I know when I'm late. Well, I guess you're right. No job for a woman. Sure. Women make bad newspaper men. But not too bad, you lug. Look huh? at what's in this copy of the Star. Start memorizing this one. I kill Stone. Inez Cordoza, showgirl, fiancé of Colder, confesses fatal stabbing by Ellen Garfield. Say, where did you get you the You know, story? Kurt, you see, I had a hunch about that uh, girl from the very beginning. I met her at the press cafe after the verdict. She was all set to break down, so I broke her down. She told me how it happened. When Colter drew his gun, Stone grabbed it. Inez said that he'd have killed Colter if she hadn't grabbed up that knife in desperation and let him have it. Yeah, but the fingerprints, those were Colter's prints on that knife. Yes, but Inez was in evening dress. She had on long white gloves. And the minute she stabbed Colter, Stone, Colter grabbed the knife out of her hand. Well, for the love of Mike. That's the way to work. That's being a good newspaper man. Do you mean that? I hate to say it, but I do. Well, that's all I wanted to hear. Give in, darling. I do. Oh, darling. Nice clinch, folks. You can cut out that silly stuff now. I've got the picture. <laughs> So ends Front Page Woman, starring Fred McMurray and Paulette Goddard with Roscoe Carnes. Our stars will be back in a few seconds for a personal interview. But right now, here's something I bet is news to a lot of housewives. Did you ever stop to think how much walking you do every day in the course of your housework and shopping trips? Well, I can tell you, it's nearly eight miles every day. Yes, and that comes to 3,000 miles a year. Why, that's the distance across the United States. And you get more exercise than that, too. What with all the kneeling and stretching and stooping you do around the house. Think what that does to your stockings. They're apt to get runs if they aren't nice and elastic. Elasticity, you know, helps your stockings give under strain instead of breaking into runs. Now let me tell you a way you can help your stockings wear longer. Every night when you take them off, give them a quick dip in a basin full of rich Lux suds. Lux flakes save stocking elasticity and cut way down on runs. Soaps with harmful alkali or rubbing with cake soap weakens elasticity. Gentle Lux has no harmful alkali. It's safe for anything safe in water alone. So give all your nice things this special care to help them stay new-looking longer. Your under things and nightgowns, your washable dresses, and all the little accessories that make or mar your appearance. And remember... A little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. And for even greater thrift, buy Lux Flakes in the large size box. Now, Mr. DeMille. Now for a three-star final. A short session with tonight's headline makers. Here's Fred McMurray, and here also is the new star, whose brief but brilliant record is holding the attention today of every Hollywood studio. Uh, well, uh, CB, perhaps not uh, every studio, but um, I know what you mean, and I... I want to say it's darn white of you, and I, well, uh, <laughs> I hardly know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then suppose we skip it, Roscoe, until I finished introducing Paulette Goddard. Huh? Oh, excuse me, I'm... It's all right, Roscoe, and thank you, Mr. DeMille. But let me stay in character as a reporter for just another moment, because I'm sure it's news to many Lux listeners that you're making this broadcast from a stretcher. Oh, not just this broadcast, Paulette, it's a uh, picture, too. What was the disaster that swept you off your feet, Mr. DeMille? And just a little accident on the set, Miss Goddard. But it has its advantages. The cast of Union Pacific felt so sorry for me today, directing from a stretcher, that they accomplished two days' work in one. With results like that, I'm seriously considering remaining in this perambulator till the picture's finished. <laughs> Once I uh, fell for a stunt something like that, Mr. DeMille, it, uh, 
Seems he just couldn't play a scene the way the director wanted it. So finally, we drove him into such a fit of rage that he snatched his watch from his pocket and smashed it to bits on the floor. There was a dead silence as we watched him get down on his hands and knees and pick up the pieces. Tears streamed down his face as he told us that the watch was his most prized possession. His father had given it to him years before. Nothing had meant quite as much to him. The cast felt pretty bad about it, and finally the uh, director dried his tears and we went back to work. This time, of course, we played the scene perfectly, and he sent us out for lunch. As I was going out the door, an electrician stopped me and said, Don't let it get you, Fred. He whispered, uh, Well, just a dollar watch. I've seen him pull that stunt a dozen times, and it's never missed yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now, I can tell you another time that Fred failed to live up to expectations, Mr. DeMille. When he was born, his folks were hoping he'd be a girl. Well, what's wrong with that? Mine were hoping for a boy. That's why I'm Paulette, the feminine version of Paul. Yes, but they were going to call Fred Rose because he was born on St. Rose Day. Can you picture McMurray with a horticultural handle like that? <laughs> you take it easy, Mr. Kahn. Fred spent the last six weeks learning to box. Yeah. After being called upon to uh, sock somebody in almost every picture he's made, they've finally given him a pair of eight-ounce gloves and turned him into a professional slugger. Do you like the idea, Fred? I like it, but it uh, has a couple of good drawbacks. The uh, first of them was that I'd planned to take a hunting trip, and I had to forget all about that and take boxing lessons. And the second drawback is the plaid suit I've got to wear. It's got checks bigger than the first uh, the first prize of the Irish sweepstakes, but <laughs> as I always say, that's the movies for you. So long, C.B. Good night, Mr. DeMille. And many thanks for this chance to appear on a program which I listen to with so much enjoyment. Yes, me too. And I hope, Mr. DeMille, that you don't have to take it lying down much longer. <laughs> Thank you, Lester. Mr. Mr. Report here soon again. There's an outstanding dramatic event awaiting you here next Monday night. Listen for Mr. DeMille's announcement of it in just a moment. Assisting tonight's stars were Inez Seabury as Olive Wilson... Margaret Brayton as May LaRue, Lindsay McHarry as Officer Holohan, John Fee as Maitland Coulter, Lee Millar as Marvin Stone, Lou Merrill as Spike Kiley, Ralph Sedan as Robert Chenard, Abe Reynolds as a tailor, Frank Nelson as Robert Cordoza, Mary Jane Carnes as Inez Cordoza, Ted Osborne as District Attorney, Edward Marr as Laundryman, David Starling as a Chinese cleaning boy, Harry Humphrey as Judge, Joe Franz as Bailiff, Elizabeth Wilbur as a nurse, Eleanor Harriet as telephone operator, Sidney Newman as taxi driver, Ross Forrester as Warburton, James Eagles as newsboy, and James Robbins as a reporter. Our musical director, Louis Silvers, appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios. He was in charge of music for their new picture, Jesse James. Front Page Woman was produced on the screen by Warner Brothers Studio. Here is Mr. DeMille. Next Monday night, the anniversary of his first appearance on the air in drama... Mr. George Arliss returns to the Lux Radio Theater. This beloved artist will be heard in our adaptation of one of his most popular screen triumphs, the dramatic story of an uncrowned king of France, Cardinal Richelieu. Our play is the story of one of the world's greatest statesmen, a man who matched his wits and life against the intrigues of the nobility that France might be united. Supporting Mr. Arliss, you'll hear an all-star cast featuring Florence Arliss, Cesar Romero... Heather Angel, Montague Love, and Douglas Dumbrill. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents one of the world's greatest actors, George Arliss in Cardinal Richelieu, with Florence Arliss, Cesar Romero, Heather Angel, Montague Love, and Douglas Dumbrill. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our Lux Radio Theater presentation of Front Page Woman has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those fine, gentle soap flakes used in the wardrobe departments of all the leading studios here in Hollywood and by housewives everywhere. Join us again next week. Be part of the large audience that gathers each Monday to enjoy an hour of dramatic entertainment and a chance to meet Hollywood and its famous people. This is your announcer, Melville Ruick, bidding you all good night on behalf of our guests, our cast, and the staff of the Lux Radio Theater. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
the warrior of the woodland, Ranger Bill, is coming up next. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Hi there, this is Ranger Bill. Say, did you ever stop to think about water? Nowadays, when we want water, all we do is go turn on a tap in the sink or turn on the hose, and there we are. Water's fun, too, fun to swim in or go canoeing on. But did you ever stop to think that man can't live without water? You have plenty of it, but in places like, oh, Palestine, for example, where Jesus lived, water was very scarce. And out here in our own great west, water is often hard to find, too. Today, I want to tell you about a very strange adventure we had, one that proved to me that even a forest ranger like myself can't, well, just doesn't know everything. I call it... The River That Wasn't There. Martin, I declare, are you going to stay out there all day working on those irrigation ditches? No, just got the last one banked and ready for the night. Hey, do you know any bride around here anywhere who might have a glass of lemonade all ready for her husband? <laughs> I do just happen to know a bride like that. And here it is. <sighs> oh, it tastes good after a hard day's work out in the sun. Yeah. It feels good to sit down, too. <laughs> you poor man. You're not going to have to work all night, too, are you, Fred? No, no, a couple hours, most likely. All I've got to do is go down to the river and open the sluice gates. That lets the water into the little irrigation ditches. <laughs> all those little ditches. It took you more than five whole months to dig them. Uh, it'll be worth it, Martha. More than worth it as soon as you see our crops coming up. Lettuce, mostly. There's always a good market for that. And beans and... <laughs> well, you know, you help plant it all. <laughs> <laughs> but I still don't see why you have to run that water in at night. Well, it's too hot in the daytime. The sun's too hot and no rain out here in this part of the West. I see. My Fred, just think. All our savings out there in those brown fields. Ah, wait till the green begins to show. Won't be long now. <laughs> no, I guess not. Everything depends on our river, doesn't it, Fred? Our river. It's not very deep and not very wide, but it's our river. <laughs> I wonder why it had such a funny name. A name? Mm -hmm. When I bought this land, built this homestead, and dug those ditches and planted that lettuce, I never even knew the river had a name. Well, I've always just called it the river and let it go at that. It does have a name, though. Well, what is it? An old Indian woman told me they call it Rio Perdido. Rio Perdido? Well, what does that mean? The Lost River. Gonzalez. Uh, senor. How long have you been uh, mayor domo of this ranch? Oh, many years, senor. More than I can count. Very easy. I worked here when Supade, your father, was here. And each year we grow, you and I and the ranch. More cattle, more money. Uh, gracias, I am real. What? <laughs> I say in Spanish, thanks to the river. Thanks to our river, we grow ah, bigger. Right, right. Without our river, we wouldn't, why, we wouldn't even be here. The cattle wouldn't be here. Nothing would be here except desert. Ah, si, senor. Now, did you get the tally from the foreman? <laughs> si, senor. How many head of cattle this year? Oh, more than ever before, senor. Eight hundred head. Eight hundred big ones, senor. <laughs> the best yet, Gonzalez. If we get all those steers to Abilene, 
I'll get you the best silver-mounted saddle you ever saw. Oh, thank you, senor. We get them there for certain. As long as we got our river. <laughs> our river. Oh, a plenty funny. Uh, me mujer, uh, she tell me senor Martin, he call our river his river. Well, <laughs> it ain't. Anyway, we should worry about that miserable homesteader. The West ain't no place to grow lettuce and parsnips. Next thing you know, he'll be growing sweet peas and pansies. <laughs> <laughs> he can no grow lettuce. We can no grow steer without the river. Our river. River always there, no dry up. Make us rich. Yeah, rich is right. And besides, we're upstream from Martin and his crazy little farm. Upstream. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> sure thing, senor boss. We can get water first. Us first. Senor Martin, second. We got it the agua fresco. Viva el Rio Perdido. You comprende those Spanish words, senor? <laughs> yes, Lost River. I wonder how it ever got a name like that. Lost River. Say, what you got there, Henry? A book. I know it's a book. I've seen more books in my day than you can shake a stick at. I didn't know you liked to read that much. Well, I didn't say I read all those books. I said I saw them. I don't hold with too much book learning. Why, when well, I was a boy... Don't you want to know what this book is? Huh? What's that? Oh, yeah, come to think of it, I did ask you that, didn't I? Yeah, what is it? You've had your nose stuck in that book for most a week, seems like. It's powerfully interesting. What's your name onto it? Elementary Principles of Geology. Elementary Principles of Geology? <laughs> geology. Huh? What's that? Something to do with geography? Not exactly. Well, well, in a way, sort of. But it's mostly about rocks and rock formations and, and how mountains get to be mountains. And quartz and shale and mica and granite. Whoa, and... whoa there. Back up a mite. You're going too fast for me. Uh, what's the name of that stuff again? Geology. Say, is there anything about cowboys and Indians in that there book? Uh-uh. <laughs> Don't reckon I'll read it then. Hey, what are you reading it for? Well, we were studying geology at school, and I got interested, so I got this book out of the library. What are you reading it for? You having to collect rocks or something? <laughs> no, it's just... Well, interesting, that's all. But what good will it ever do you? You're going to be a ranger, not a geologist. So why study that there great, big, thick, heavy book on geology? Well, you can't tell. Knowing something about geology might come in handy sometime. It's a good thing to know something about. Why, I think everybody should know something about elementary principles of geology. This is the time, and here we are at the first sluice gate. Would you like to pull it open? I'm afraid how sweet of you. Oh, wait a minute. Martha, we've worked and prayed for this moment for months, for years, actually. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for our little farm, our dream come true. Bless us now as we turn on the water, open the sluice gates, and turn the river water into our irrigation ditches for the first time. We ask you to bless our work here. Amen. Amen. All right, Martha. Open the first gate. You know how to turn that big round handle? I think I do. You sure have to turn it a lot of times. Yeah, no, don't fall in the water. <laughs> I won't. It's only about two feet deep in the deepest part anyway. There, the wooden gate is lifting up now. There. There's our water, dear. Yes, yes, I see. Oh, that's funny. Is something wrong? Well, I don't think so. Well, at least I'm not sure, but that water, there ought to be a lot more water than that coming through the gate, a whole lot more. Are you sure you opened it all the way? Yes, I'm sure. Hmm. Well, let's get the other gates open. Now, funny thing, I, I'm sure there ought to be a lot more water than that. A lot more.
Is that your boss? Yes. Let's go and take a look at stairs. <laughs> okay. But you won't be seeing stairs, though. You'll be seeing that silver mounted saddle. <laughs> es verdad. Senor boss, uh, this saddle, is she silver plated or solid silver? Oh, solid silver. After we get those stairs to market and sold. <laughs> bueno, I wait. Hey. What, hey? And those stairs seem like they're farther off than usual. Oh, well, it must be the morning sun or something. It just seems like we're walking farther from the ranch house to the pens than we use. We're almost there in the house, senor. Yeah. Here, help me with this gate, Gonzalez. Uh, See. Si. Uh, 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 pretty bunch of stairs, uh, senor boss. Hide shine pretty in the sun. Huh? Yeah, they are healthy. That's a true fact. Plenty of water is what makes the difference. Uh, See. Si. No plenty water, still she die pronto, plenty quick, I think. Yeah, you think right. Well, there they are. Finest little herd in the West. A four-legged bankroll. <laughs> Mucho dinero, see? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, think... <clears throat> hey. Que es? <sighs> mud. I hate to get mud in my boots. I never recall seeing mud here before. Not me, either. Where's all this mud come from? Some says door the river had gone down some. That never happened before. Still, she cannot drink river all up. Too much water. No, of course not. I guess I'm just imagining things. <laughs> what could happen to a river? Hey, Davy Crockett! How much further or farther we got to get to go before we get to get where we're going? Oh, maybe a mile or two, maybe three. Oh, I see. Henry, let's sit down a spell. All right. What you carrying around in that bag? Rocks. Rocks? One of the hottest days of the year, and you get me out here traipsing around with you while you gather up a bag full of rocks. I'm making a collection. That's for geology. I'm writing a composition on geology for my term paper. But when you learn all this stuff, what good will it do you? Oh, I don't know. Like I told you before, it might come in handy sometime, Stumpy. Well, I'll ride herd along with you. Now give me that bag. I'll tote it for a spell. Uh, only there's just one thing. Uh, what's that? I wish it when you decided to collect something that instead of collecting rocks, you decided to collect feathers. <laughs> You're walking so fast. You're almost running. I can hardly keep up with you. I'm sorry. It's because I'm well, I'm worried, I guess. Oh, we're going to the riverbank. Yes, Martha. You see that pole sticking out there in the water, about four feet from shore? Why, yes. Did you put it there? Yep. But what for? Come on. Come with me. Walk right into the river? Why, Fred, I'll get wet. Have you gone crazy? Yeah, maybe I have. Slip off your shoes. I want you to check something with me, so come on. The water's only about a foot deep. Well, yes, certainly, Fred. Well, take my hand. Now, take a look at that stick now, Martha. I put it here yesterday. You see that notch mark? Yes, I see it. Looks like you made it with your knife. Well, it's just about eight inches above the level of the water. Uh Uh-huh. I wanted you to come down here and tell me what I saw and couldn't believe. Martha, I stuck that stick in here yesterday on purpose and made that notch with my knife exactly even with the water. Martha, in the last 24 hours, our river has dropped at least eight inches. But the irrigation ditches, the lettuce, are far. I know. Without water. Without water, we're finished. Finished before we've ever begun. Well, speak up, and it better be good. 
You'll be a sorry mayor tomo. Send your boss. Send your boss. Wake me up out of a siesta and drag me down to the river bank in a broiling sun. You you going loco? No, 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 send your boss. Send your uh, that rock. These rock. These are big rock here. Well, what about? Send your. You stand on these rock when you fish. Uh, of course I do. Half for years. Keep my feet dry. See. Si. Look here. I, I think you are loco. Did you bring me all the way out here just to talk about fishing? No, 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 Senor Boss. Uh, this rock, she is always right at the edge of the water, no? Why, sure, but... Uh, what... Senor Luke, the water, she is not here anymore. Not by fishing rock. The water, she's gone way down over there. Oh, Rio, she gets smaller. <laughs> It's dry. The gates are bone dry in the irrigation ditch, too. The river isn't there? What are we going to do, Fred? I've got to think. Oh, drink this coffee. I don't want any. Longhorn Larrabee. What about him? Well, you know him. He has the cattle ranch upriver from us. And he's brought his whole herd in off the range to fatten them up for market. Has them in big pens by the river. Do you suppose... I suppose nothing. I'm going to find out right now. Fred, what are you going to do? I'm paying a call on Mr. Longhorn Larrabee. But your rifle... Fred, don't take your rifle. Oh, oh Fred... <laughs> What's the herd count this morning? Over a night, we lose six, seven steer, maybe eight. Not too much agua now, not much big river now. Steers all want drink same time. Crowd, push, shove, some get knocked down, cannot get drink water, so... So we lose. Every day lose more this way. Gonzales say, hasta luego. Say goodbye to Silver Mountain, sad. Uh, yeah. The river has got small for sure. It weren't much of a river to begin with. Not ain't much more than a creek. I can't figure it. How many head did we lose, all told? Maybe five team, maybe twenty. That's a bad dry spill, I guess, that's all. We'll start shipping to Ambulane before too long anyway. Another couple weeks. Oh, that's for that. Oh, send your boss. Huh? We have the company. Hey, looks like that simple-minded homesteader. The lettuce grower. A lettuce grower with a rifle. Yeah. Get the shotgun off the wall and go stand just behind the door, out of sight. If it begins to look like trouble, you know what to do. Uh, uh, see, si, senor boss. Mr. Larrabee. Yeah, come on in. Howdy. Been deer hunting? Mr. Larrabee, I'll get to the point quick. You know, I started homesteading down the river, planning to grow lettuce, run a truck garden. The West ain't no place for green stuff, farmers. The West is for cattle. With modern irrigation planning, I could grow anything. Anything as long as I have water. Well, what's ailing you? You got water. No. Now, this morning when we got up, our river was gone. Vanished. Just not there. So all them cute little ditches you dug don't mean nothing. <laughs> That's a good one. So your river's gone, huh? Where'd it go to? The river you call yours flows past my place first, you know. I still got my part of it. That's the point, Mr. Larrabee. I think those cattle of yours, all collected here in one spot... Just I think... what do you think, Tenderfoot? I think they've used up all the water. In just a few days, without water, my whole crop will die and I'll be ruined. I ain't concerned with your crop. I ain't studying about what happens to you. Mr. Larrabee, I'm desperate. I want you to open all those gates on your cattle pens and run the steers back out onto the range. And if I don't, Mr. Martin, I have this rifle here, and I'll... And you ain't I... going to fire him, please, Mr. Martin, because I have very big gun pointed straight into your back. Please put your rifle on table. Please, Mr. Martin. Now, go on home. And thank you, lucky stars, I didn't have my mayor Domo shoot you. I don't like homesteaders, and I don't like irrigation farmers. And most of all, I don't like any man who think he can grow lettuce. Now get out. You, sir, 
certainly understand, Mr. Martin. Over the years, I've had occasion to study many thousands of reports, and I've never even heard of cattle actually drinking up a whole river. It's not possible. But our river is gone. You refer to your river. Have you looked at it between your place and Larrabee? Yes, I drove alongside of it the whole way between my farm and his ranch. And Larrabee hasn't built a dam or cut a new channel to swing the river away from your land? No. After it leaves his place, it just gets shallower and shallower and narrower and narrower, and then, well, it just peters out. Mr. Jefferson, those cattle are drinking all that water. No, that's just not so. Oh, isn't it, huh? Well, what is wrong, then? You're the forest ranger. You're supposed to know everything. Nobody knows everything, Mr. Martin. Well, I know one thing. I'm ruined, that's what. And I know another thing. I used to believe in God until this happened. And... And now I don't. You folks looking for me? Uh, in a way, uh, Henry, get Mr. Larrabee a chair, will you? Right. Call me Longhorn. I was way out in the North 40, running up a few strays when I seen your fancy dude out of an airplane flying around my place. That one that flies straight up and down. The helicopter. Yeah, that's what I said. So I drove on into town. Figured you might want to palaver some. Why? Well, on account of that helpless lettuce farmer, Martin. I'm more interested in that river you and he share... Uh, Mr. Martin thinks your cattle are... Well, he's off his head. Oh, perhaps. He's losing his farm, you know. He's at the end of his rope. Told me he threatened you with a gun. Ah, forget it. Look, Mr. Jefferson, my steers ain't drinking up that river, and you know it. I got water in my place. Not much, not like before. The old river has fell off, but my steers got water. Martin's ditches are empty. Who cares about his ditches and say, for all we know, maybe them ditches are to blame. Upsetting the laws of nature... Shoving a river where it was never intended to go, and just where did the river go? I don't know yet. You don't know. <laughs> That's rich. Mr. Forest Ranger don't know. Well, I don't know either, and I don't care. As long as my steers can get water, that's all that matters. For bed. The patron, the senor boss. Oh, Gonzalez, what do you want? Stand out there, staring through the window. Uh, senor boss, uh, you listen, the steers. Oh, I sure I hear the steers. They ball like that all the time when they're not in the range. Their sound is music, money music. You listen good, senor boss. Huh? Yeah, they are bellering kind of loud. Maybe they got spooked by a coyote. Maybe a wolf. Well, let's get down there. Senor, you look where I look. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at the river. It's gone. It's dried up. A river. It's gone. So we're done. Finished, Martha. With no water in our, our whole crop will die in two or three days. This is the end of everything. Listen to them cattle ball. They're thirsty. They can't last more than two or three days. There ain't no water I can drive them to. I'm a goner. Without water, them cattle die. It's that Larrabee, him and his cattle. It was his steers that drank all our water. That's where our river went. Well, I'll fix him. I'll get Larrabee. Them ditches, them crazy ditches, what's done this? I'm draining away my water from my river. That shipless homesteader and his digging and draining, Martin, I'll fix his wagon. Fred, if you love me, if you ever loved me, listen to me now. Please do what I ask. Let's go to the forest ranger office. Let's get Ranger Bill. Senor boss, listen to your old mayor domo. You're amigo. No, do these a bad thing. We go by Los Federalistas. Please, we go see a Lorraine's or a Bill. A homesteader so no has just as much right to come out here as any man, 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 the richest man, 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 one at a time, please. We've got to act more sensibly. There, that's better. 
Do you realize we've been talking here all night long and we haven't gotten anywhere? I tried to establish that, in my opinion, this tragedy isn't your fault, Mr. Larrabee. <laughs> and neither is it your fault, Mr. Martin. Well, then it must Watering be... Watering cattle and controlled irrigation can't make a river disappear. What did, then? I simply don't know. If those steers and that lettuce doesn't have water in a few hours, We're though, We're both I... finished. But where did that river go? And can we get it back? Bill? Mr. Larrabee? Mr. Martin? I'm just going to high school, and I feel funny talking like this, but I think I know where the river went, and I think I know how we might get it back. We're listening, Henry. Go ahead. Well, I've been reading a lot about geology. Geology is a science of rocks, sort of. Well, I read that sometimes a river, a river that has always been just a regular river, time past your farm and my ranch following this lost river and there she is dry as ever yeah i still can't understand oh, that what river this... kept backing up first it dried up at the farm then upstream at the ranch we got to find out we where... found it there's the river you see it over there wait it runs right down into the ground sinks right out of sight right hop out everybody we've got to work fast <laughs> yeah. careful with that box longhorn no, it ain't heavy don't stumble that's all <laughs> no <laughs> now then Henry explained that sometimes a river will suddenly just disappear. Some fault in the rock formation of the river bed, maybe a tiny shift in the earth's surface, maybe just gradual erosion, but it's enough to make the river disappear, to flow into a subterranean channel. Go underground. Yes. Then sometimes, not always and not for sure, if you can shift that rock formation, shake the riverbed so it settles... You can close up the underground opening and get the river back. With this here dynamite I'm carrying? No, dynamite explodes upward. We want something that explodes down. And that's compound C. Our army engineers developed it not too long ago. It has to be detonated, not ignited. That means you have to hit it. <laughs> and that's what I'm carrying? Yep, hand it over. I have it all ready to go. I'm going to carry this out and set it right down in the bed of the stream, right where the water disappears into the ground. Then I'll attach this long, flexible wire to the detonating mechanism, and then come back here and crouch down behind this ledge with the rest of you. All clear? Well, what do we do now? Press your faces right down into the dirt. Say, Henry... This is your idea. How'd you like to pull the wire and detonate the compound C? Right, Bill. I'll count. One, two, three, fire. A river. A river. It's back. Oh, thank God. Thank God. It is the river. The steers and the lettuce. And us, we're all saved. I thank God, too. That's right, man. That's the river. So the river did come back, and the lettuce and the steers were saved. But more important things than that happened when the explosion returned the river to us. Poor, bewildered Fred Martin regained the faith he almost lost and hard-bitten old Longhorn thought about God for the first time. And it wasn't I but Henry whose knowledge saved the situation. We found the river that wasn't there. Thanks to him. Well, see you next week for more adventure with...
first couple of radio comedy are Burns and Allen are up next. Are you reducing tooth decay with Amident ammoniated toothpaste? Well, answer the man, George. Of course, Gracie. I use Amident twice a day. You can smile when you say that. <laughs> Yes, it's the Amadent Show, transcribed in Hollywood and starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. With yours truly, Bill Goodwin, D. Benadaret, Hal March, Marvin Miller, Wally Mayer, Harry Lubin, and the Amadent Orchestra. For healthy laughter, it's George and Gracie. And for healthier teeth, for fewer cavities, it's Amadent Toothpaste. As we look in at the Burns' home, we find George engaged in his favorite pastime. Lazy. I want to be lazy. Want to just lie in the sun. With no work to be done. Oh, under that awning, they call the sky. Stretching in your horn. Oh, that's beautiful, Sugar Throat. <laughs> Isn't that a great song? Mm -hmm. To me, that's one of the greatest things Irving Berlin has ever written. Why don't you sing that on our radio program again? So you'll get that nice present Irving Berlin promised you. You could use some new clothes. Irving Berlin promised me a present? Don't you remember? The last time you sang it, he sent a telegram and said, Sing my song again and I will bring suit. <laughs> he can afford one with two pairs of pants He's a very rich man Been writing songs for 35 years oh, How did he make his money? Selling pickles <laughs> Gracie, he just, he just sits in the house And money keeps pouring in Well, why doesn't he get the house fixed? <laughs> You know, you can make a lot of money composing songs. Do you know that Stardust has made over a million dollars? Really? What did he compose? He wrote a tune called Hoagie Carmichael. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why I spend that lonely hoagie dreaming of a Carmichael. Like it? Well, the melody isn't much, but those are beautiful words. Pretty words, words. aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> You know, Gracie, years ago I started to compose a song. I never finished it. Uh, well, let's hear it. Okay. Seeing is believing. That's a story all and true. Don't believe all you hear. You've often heard that, too. You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule. Dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. That's the line always stopped me. I couldn't get the right thing to rhyme with rule. Oh, uh, well, maybe I could help you. Mm, let's see now. Uh, does school rhyme with rule? That's right. Oh, I think I've got it. You do the last line and I'll do mine. Okay. You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule. Oh, so look on the bright side while the stars are shining high above and I'll see you in my dreams after school. <laughs> well, too sentimental? Too short. <laughs> You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule. Yeah. Come in. Oh, hello, Blanche. Gracie, I heard George clear outside. If he's got a broken leg, shoot him. <laughs> Blanche, I happen to be writing a song. That's right. George's song will make people forget Berlin. Well, that'll even drive the Russians out. <laughs> Look, girls, go into the other room, will you? I'd like to try and fix up the song. I've always had trouble with the lyrics. Well, then forget the lyrics. Just write the words. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Now go. Come on, Blanche. Say, Gracie, I see you had another accident. The fender on your car is folded up like an accordion. It is? Oh, my goodness. Now, when did I do that? George will kill me. You don't remember doing no. it? No. Oh, why don't automobile companies make their cars with the fenders already dented? 
<laughs> what? And then when you hit something, it would straighten them out. <laughs> Gracie, why don't you send that idea to General Motors? I did. But I didn't sign my name to the letter. Good. Three days later, I got an answer saying, Gracie, forget it. <laughs> They probably recognized your handwriting. Yeah, the way I dot my E's. <laughs> well, if George sees that fender, he'll dot your eyes. Yeah. You know, he gets awfully upset about my driving, and he shouldn't. It's helped us a lot socially. You know, that's how we met Mr. O'Keefe and Mr. McDonald. Who are they? Insurance adjusters. <laughs> and, and we've gotten to know Mr. Fredericks very well. Who's he? Only the prosecuting attorney. <laughs> and we'll never meet a sweeter couple than Mr. and Mrs. Davis. Where'd you meet them? I drove into the garage one night, and there they were, sitting on my front bumper. <laughs> well, Gracie, you better get that fender fixed before George finds out about it. Oh, I will, Blanche. I'll tell him I'm going shopping for vegetables, but instead I'll take the car to the garage. Yeah, well, I'll run along, Gracie. Good luck. Well, you better say goodbye to George Blanche. He'll never forgive you. You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule. George, Blanche is leaving. Thank her for me. Uh, thank you, Blanche. Thank you. Goodbye. You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule. Uh, dear, I'm going up and change clothes. I've got to go out and get some vegetables. Good, good. You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule, but you'll change your mind, dear, dear. Come in. I'm in the den. Sam the tailor at your service. <laughs> Just hang Gracie's dress over there, Sam. My pleasure. By the way, Mr. Boynes, I heard your program last week with Al Jolson. Isn't that Jolson a great singer? Oh, magnificent. <laughs> How'd you like me, Sam? If you don't mind, I'd like to keep your business. <laughs> goodbye, Sam. <coughs> Sam, goodbye. I'm busy. I'm not leaving till you're noticing something. <laughs> what? I happen to be wearing new shoes. <laughs> so what? These are imported. They were made in England, sold to an exporter, exported to an importer, bought by a wholesaler who sold them to a retailer, who in turn retailed them to me. I can't understand it. Can't understand what? How all those people can make a living from shoes that I haven't paid for yet. <laughs> Sam, please, I'm writing a song and I'm having a little trouble rhyming the words. So that's easy. Rhyming is second nature with me. I take a word and piff, puff, poof, I got a rhyme. Piff, puff, poof. Poof, yeah. Right. Take the void you. Mm. There's true, do, glue, flu, navy blue, <laughs> chartreuse. Oh, hold it, hold it. Hold it. <laughs> chartreuse doesn't go with you, but it goes nice with navy blue. <laughs> I'll see you later, Sam. Okay, daddy boy. <laughs> Goodbye. Toodle doodle. Toodle doodle. <laughs> I'm going out to get the vegetables. Just a minute, Gracie. The vegetable man was here this morning. Well, the spinach he sold me wasn't ripe. I had to throw it out. It was all green. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Hello, Frank. Do you know what happened to me? Which fender, Mrs. Burns? <laughs> Left front. How long will it take? I have a look. Hey, I got good news for you. Your frame is okay. Well, you don't think George married me for my money, do you? <laughs> hey, what's this bucket of water doing in the front seat? Oh, don't tell anybody about that, Frank. It was George's idea. You know, I'm a little worried about him. It was your husband's idea? Yeah. When I drove to the beauty shop this morning, he told me to be sure and put some water in the car. <laughs> uh, no, you see, he meant to put the water in the radiator. Oh. You see, if you don't do that, you'll have a cracked block, and that'll make two. <laughs> oh, 
what? Nothing, nothing, nothing. It, it'll only take about an hour to fix this fender. Oh, but I can't wait that long. Oh, I've got an idea. I'll go get George, and we'll go to the movie tonight, and then while we're gone, you come by and fix it in our garage. Okay, Mrs. Burns. I'll be there at 8 o'clock sharp. Oh, before you go, would you like me to look at your tires? Go ahead, but I don't think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> when you've seen one, you've seen them all. Uh, never mind, then. I'll, I'll be at your house at 8. All right. Goodbye, Frank. <laughs> See, I don't want to go to a movie tonight. I want to stay home and fool around with this song. But, George, I've already said you'd go. Bill Goodwin's going to pick us up at 7.30 right after dinner. Well, you should have asked me first. I'm not going. Oh, please, darling. It'll be just like a second honeymoon. Second honeymoon? Well, don't you remember our wedding night? You took me to a movie. Oh, yeah. I remember that nosy usher. Oh, you know, it was wonderful. <laughs> George, what? how many women can say that they spent their wedding night with George Burns and William S. Hart? You can count them on the fingers of one hand. Mm -hmm. Let's go out and see if we can find that same picture tonight. Nah, this song is driving me crazy. Why don't you go by yourself? Well, I can't, George. They won't let me in the movie when I go by myself. Why not? Well, I don't know. I've tried hundreds of times, but every time I hand my ticket to the door, Manny tears it up. <laughs> well, I'm staying home tonight. Oh, but, George, movies are so educational. You can learn lots of things from them. Let's go see Gregory Peck. What can I learn from Gregory Peck? Will you be mad if I tell you? <laughs> I withdraw the question. Oh, uh -huh. please, George. We've got to go to a movie. The mechanic is coming at eight. What's that? The, oh, uh, <clears throat> that's the, um, the, 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 the title of the new picture. The mechanic is coming at eight. <laughs> I've never heard of it. The mechanic is coming at eight. Sounds like a picture Jessel would produce. <laughs> Okay, let's go and see it. Oh, no, no, no. You see, it's, um, it's a foreign picture. We wouldn't understand the dialogue. Where was it made? England. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we speak nothing but Spanish. Uh, well, let's go and see 12 o'clock high. No, I think we'll enjoy it more if we stay sober. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do it. This is Bill Goodwin, folks. If any member of your family had any cavities last year, I'd like you to listen to this. For fewer cavities, change your toothpaste. Yes, for fewer cavities, for less tooth decay, change to an ammoniated toothpaste. Change to Amadent toothpaste. Tell me, Bill, exactly what will Amadent do for my family? Just this. The original Amadent formula was subjected to extensive and rigid scientific tests. And here are the results. Better than four out of five who used Amadent reduced tooth decay. And they reduced it by almost 50%. So if your family is like the average, that's what you can expect. Yes, the discovery of Amadent and the ammoniated dentifrices was revolutionary. In fact, the results you just mentioned, Bill, were written up by the leading dental journals in the country. And today, more dentists recommend Amadent than any other dentifrice. You know, I think the most important thing about Amadent is how it helps youngsters. Mothers, you owe it to your children to help them prevent unnecessary tooth decay every time they brush their teeth. So please don't delay. Get Amadent for your family. A-M-M-I-D-E-N-T. Amadent is available in both toothpaste and tooth powder. <laughs>
lunch at 7 o'clock, Bill Goodwin will be here in a half hour to take us to the movies. Okay, I'm ready. Seeing is believing, that's a story all and true. By the way, Gracie, dinner was delicious tonight. Oh, thank you. You know, I was going to serve corn, too, but we ate too early. 7 o'clock is too early to eat corn? Well, yes, it says right on the can, economy size, should serve between 8 and 10. <laughs> Uh, I'll take it to the movie and we'll eat it later, yeah. <laughs> Say, that, that chocolate dessert was delicious. Well, I know how you love chocolate. Mm -hmm. You know, you're always saying, put enough chocolate sauce on it and you're going to eat sawdust. That's right. <laughs> and you really can, too. <laughs> Gracie, you didn't. Oh, afraid it'll make you fat. Yeah, huh? that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Will you answer the phone, Gracie? All right. And close the door. Hello? Hello, Gracie. This is Bill Goodwin. I just called to tell you I can't go to the movies with you and George tonight. Oh, but, Bill, we need your car. Well, I'm sorry, Gracie. I'm at the airport. My girl is coming in, and her plane will be an hour late. Oh, but, Bill... Well, gee, Gracie, if it were any other girl, I'd ditch her for you, but this girl is it, my, my one and only. For the first time in my life, I'm really in love. Uh, oh, excuse me, mister. I didn't know this phone booth was occupied. Oh, that's all right, baby. Come on in. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> oh, Bill! Bill! You comfortable, baby? Oh, sure, handsome. What's your name, beautiful? It's Gracie. <laughs> it's Doris. No, it isn't. It's Gracie. Hey, Doris, you're pretty cute. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. Well, I had to slap you, baby. I'm engaged. <laughs> Yes, Bill? I'm sorry about the plane being late. Maybe I can go with you some other time. Oh, all right, Bill. Goodbye. Exceptions to the rule. George. Yes? Bill Goodwin can't go to the movies with us. Well, that's okay. We'll go along. All right. Well, we better get started. It's a long way to walk. <laughs> walk? We got a car in the garage, remember? But uh, walking is good for you. Look what it's done for my family. That's why I don't want to walk. <laughs> now, take my sister, Bessie. Now, I don't say this because she's my sister, but nobody walks like Bessie. Nobody is built like Bessie. <laughs> you know how some people have a hobby of collecting stamps? Bessie likes to walk. Yes. She even goes into department stores and tries to walk up escalators that are coming down. Nice hobby. Mm-hmm. I'm going to visit Bessie tomorrow. Where is she? Between the second and third floors at the May Company. <laughs> I'm still not walking three miles to the movies. We're taking our car. Well, I'll be right back, dear. Seeing is believing. Okay, Gracie, I'll talk Harry into it. Oh, thanks, Blanche. Goodbye. Bye. Harry, we've got to go to the movies with the Burnses. Oh, no, no. I'm not going to a movie with Gracie, Blanche. It's, it's too embarrassing. <laughs> the last time we walked in, the usher said, Would you mind sitting down in front? And she said, We can't. We bend the other way. <laughs> So she's not a Einstein. Look at that hammy husband of hers. He even thinks he can compose music. Well, maybe he can. Maybe he can. George has got a lot of talent. Yeah, but it's all in his wife's name. 
Oh, no, it isn't. If you think George Burns is so loaded with talent, name one thing he can do. Are you kidding? (laughs) Well? (laughs) Well? (laughs) Did you ever see him mix a salad? your hat. We're going to the movie. Oh, no, we're not. For once, I'm going to make the decision. I'm the boss in this house. I'm the breadwinner. And picking up that rolling pin won't make me change my mind. We're going to the movies. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's better. Tell him to pick us up. Oh, no, we got to take our car. Oh, we can't. I let Harvey down at the office use it. He went to Yuma to get married. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, but Harvey doesn't know it yet. <laughs> uh, I've got to phone Gracie. Hello? Gracie, this is Blanche. I've got bad news for you. Harry just told me a friend of his took our car to Yuma to get married. Oh, don't let him kid you, Blanche. Cars do not get married. (laughs) No, no, the friend is getting married. Oh, well, well, I've got to get George out of the house. Well, bring him over here. We'll play bridge or something. Oh, okay. Goodbye, Blanche. Bye. Uh, George... We're not going to a movie tonight. Good, I can fool around with my song. Oh, no, no, we're going next door to the Mortons and play bridge. Oh, no. I'd rather go to a movie. You even said, you even said I could learn things from Gregory Peck. Oh, I was kidding, George. You've already got Peck's charm and technique. Even your kisses are like Peck's. <laughs> I don't understand this. A minute ago, you were begging me to go to a movie. Well, can I change my mind? Believe me, I wish you could. <laughs> Look, honey, I don't want to play bridge. I love you, but not as a bridge partner. But, George, I happen to be very good. Just ask me any question about bridge, any question at all. How would you indicate a strong no Trump hand? Any question at all. <laughs> How many cards in a deck? Keep them coming. Make them tough. <laughs> what color is the ace of spades? Black. Mm. And you thought I couldn't play I made bridge. a mistake. I made a mistake. <laughs> Look, we're not playing bridge tonight. Um, if, uh, if that's a mechanic at the door, he's my dressmaker. She's going to a masquerade. <laughs> this I've got to see. Come in. Hi, George. Hello, Gracie. Hello. See, I just dropped by to tell you I can drive you to the movies after all. <gasps> oh, wonderful. Uh, let's go, George. Say, George, I hope you and Gracie won't mind sitting in the back seat. I've uh, got my fiancé out in the car. Well, I didn't know you were engaged. Congratulations. Nice girl? Yeah. Met her in a phone booth at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds romantic. We'd love to sit in the back seat, Bill. George can watch you and learn something. <laughs> Are you kidding? I know Bill's technique backwards. Just give me two beats so I can get started. All right. One, two. <clears throat> Come here, baby. Let me put my arms around you. Oh, Mr. Burns, please. <laughs> I'm a married woman. <laughs> Turn your pretty little face up to me and pucker up. All right. There you are. That's Bill's technique. George Burns. Bill Goodwin would never stop there. (laughs) You want the rest of it? Of course. Okay, you asked for it. Gracie. Yes, darling? Are you reducing tooth decay with amadent ammoniated toothpaste? (laughs) Amadent is a grand wake-up toothpaste. It tastes delightful. Oh, now, wait a minute, George. When a girl has got her face turned up to you with her lips ready and waiting, that's no time to tell her about Amadent toothpaste. That's a time for action. Brush your teeth. (laughs) 
Let her see for herself how Amadent leaves her teeth bright and sparkling, her mouth feeling fresh and clean. She'll learn why more dentists recommend Amadent than any other dentifrice. Well, come on, it's almost 8 o'clock. Let's get to the movie. Yeah, well, if we're going to see a picture, let's get going. I promised my girl I'd have her at Ciro's by 11 o'clock. Relax. The floor show doesn't start until 12. I know, but she starts parking cars at 11. <laughs> Bill, as long as we're using your car, maybe I can have the garage man come over and straighten out my fender. When did you find out the fender was dented? When I hit that truck yesterday. <laughs> you, you mean you're the one who bent the fender? That's right. Well, the nerve of you letting me take the blame. I didn't blame you. Well, I did. <laughs> You did... ought to be ashamed of yourself bending fenders. That's a woman's job. Look, will you stop acting giddy? Well, you may think I'm giddy, but believe me, I'm no fool. Now, look. You may think I'm giddy, but believe me, I'm no fool. Hey, that line will fit my song. Well, then what are we waiting for, Sugar Throat? Get to the piano. Wait, wait a minute. George is going to sing? Yes. Well, believe me, I'm no fool either. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Sing is believing that's a story all and true. Don't believe all you hear, you've often heard that too. You, dear, and I, dear, are exceptions to the rule. You may think me giddy, but believe me, I'm no fool. I just wrote that line. I know I was there when you did it. <laughs> uh, well, have you got a chorus? I've always had that. Well, let's hear it. Oh, I love you, love you, love you, dear, across my heart I do. Do you believe me? I do. That's right. Oh, you're the one and only girl I ever told that to. Do you believe me? I do. Good. And when things go wrong and skies above are gray instead of blue, you wouldn't have to worry because I'd know just what to do. I'd get up early mornings and I'd find a job for you. Do you believe me? Are you kidding? You did. I did it, Dad, didn't I? <laughs> George and Gracie will return in just a moment. Join us again next Wednesday when we'll all be back. George Burns, Gracie Allen, Harry Lubin and the Amadent Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Goodwin. Brought to you by the makers of Amadent, the ammoniated toothpaste and tooth powder, recommended by more dentists than any other dentifrice. The George Burns and Gracie Allen program was transcribed in Hollywood, written by Paul Henning, Sid Dorfman, Harvey Helm, and Stanley Shapiro, and produced by William Burns. Now here are our stars. George, now that you're writing songs, will you write one called the Sidney Schultz Blues? Sidney Schultz? He's our butcher. Yeah, I know. Business is bad, and I thought a little publicity might help him. Good night, folks. Girls, riddle me this. What shampoo cleans your hair without water? Silly, there's no such shampoo. Oh, yes, there is, lady. It's Minipoo, the marvelous new dry shampoo. Restores limp, oily hair to fragrant, shining freshness in only ten minutes. Minipoo doesn't disturb your wave because it doesn't wet your hair. This I can use. Yes, use Minipoo when you have a cold, when time is short, between regular shampoos. Ask for Minipoo. M I N I P double O. Minipoo. Next Wednesday and every Wednesday, listen to the Amadent Show, starring George and Gracie. Good night. Stay tuned for Lum and Abner, who follow immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Next, hunt the biggest of all game with 
the Green Hornet. The Green Hornet. the biggest of all game, public enemies who try to destroy our America. In the interest of our government, the King Trendle Broadcasting Corporation asks you to accept Uncle Sam as the sponsor of the Green Hornet program. To win this war, we've got to get the right workers in the right war jobs. Some cities need war workers badly, but they can't take in any more outsiders because they can't house them. That puts it right up to the people who already live in those cities. They've got to take war jobs, and they've got to start learning war jobs now. Free training can be secured by applying at the nearest local office of the United States Employment Service. As for you who do not live in a war production center, be patient. Your turn will come. Don't move into a city hoping to find a war job. Go to your local United States Employment Office instead. That office knows where the war jobs are and where you can get both a war job and a place to live. With his faithful valet, Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with racketeers and saboteurs, risking his life that criminals and enemy spies will feel the weight of the law by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed in the thrilling adventure, Sabotage finds a name. The Green Hornet strikes again. dark outside the drugstore. The street lights were dimmed and the lights in the drugstore window were shaded. The man paced nervously in front of the store. With his thumb, he flicked a coin into the air and caught it over and over. Then suddenly he stopped. No, that's too much. I got to have no part of it. Daily Sentinel, let me talk to one of your reporters. Hello, are you a reporter? Hello. I got a tip for you about Mariana. <gasps> Double crossing rat. <laughs> Holy mackerel, Casey, I never got such a shock in my life. My ears are still ringing. Right at the other end of the line, can you imagine? I certainly can, Lowry. Yeah. How would you like to pick up a phone, start talking to somebody, and then hear machine gun bullets? I've been jumping like a typewriter ribbon ever since. Hello, Miss Jane. Hello, Mr. Reed. Hey, boss. Have you seen this morning's Sentinel? Yes, I read it coming downtown. That is quite a story you have. Well, thanks, but it's no credit to me. It might have been anyone. My, my, he's getting modest. Well, I just happened to be the guy that answered the phone, that's all. I gather you went right over there. He used up half my gasoline ration. You know, it's a lucky thing the phone was left off the hook. I was able to get the location and beat the opposition reporters there by an hour. Any idea who fired that machine gun, Laurie? No, no. Police haven't got the slightest idea. It looked like a gangster job. What about the drugstore clerk? Why don't you read the paper, Casey? The clerk was in the back of the store. He didn't see a thing. At least that's what he says. The man who was killed, his name was Boots Lanigan. You mentioned that he had a police record. Is that right? A rec record as long as your arm, boss. As far as crimes committed, he was almost in the class of the Green Hornet. Oh, I see. That's probably why he called the newspaper instead of the police. Well, that's how I figure. But I still don't get it. What's that? Well, what he said. I picked up the phone, and all he said was, I've got a tip for you about Mariana. Now, why should an ex-thug like Landigan mention a girl's name? 
What kind of a tip is that? Mariana. You sure? Well, that's the way I heard it. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, you figure it out, boss. I can't. That Mariana. Mr. Britt, it's quite possible that Mr. Lowry heard wrong, huh? According to what he say, gangster only have time for that one sentence. Well, he might have gotten it wrong. But Lowry usually hits the nail on the head. Lanigan, very bad gangster, huh? Yeah, that looks like a crime war, Cato. Who Lanigan connected with? What gang? The waterfront mob, Cato. But they broke up more than a year ago when Dutch Fogel went to jail for... Hey, wait a second. Come to think of it, Fogel's out now. Yes, that's so. Hmm. But this killing is the first sign of gang war. Why should Fogel bump off one of his own men? Maybe Lanigan removed by other gangs, hmm? On top of that, it doesn't sound like Lanigan to turn informer. You know the criminal code, Cato, no matter what happens, never squeal. It's all very strange. Let me see that paper again, will you? Yes. Now, oh, here's the follow-up story. I already see that. Nothing has been added, Mr. Brick. No, just a little family background on Lanigan. Parents are dead. Only living relatives, a younger brother serving with the Marines in Guadalcanal. Too bad Boots Lanigan not like young brother. Yeah, with the Marines. Oh, maybe dead man say Marines instead of Mariana. Perhaps. Oh, the other... That's funny, I never thought of that before. Huh? Well, what are you doing, Mr. Britt? You can see it tonight, except for the dim out, Cato. What are you saying, Mr. Britt? You know who Mariana is? Perhaps I do. It is girl? It's usually referred to as she. Got the hornet mask and the gun, Cato. We're taking the black beauty. A few moments later, stepping through a secret panel in the rear of a closet in his bedroom, Britt Reed and Cato went along a narrow passage built within the wall of the apartment house itself. The passage led directly to an adjoining building which fronted on a dark side street. Though supposedly abandoned... This building served as the hiding place for the sleek, super-powered Black Beauty, streamlined car of the Green Hornet. Where are we going, Mr. Britt? Get in. We're going to take a look at Mariana. <laughs> Britt Reed pressed a button. The great car roared into life. The section of wall in front raised automatically, then closed as the gleaming Black Beauty sped into the darkness. <laughs> Cato. Who? Marianne, of course. I see no one. You're looking right at her. I see nothing but only salvage job on big boat next to wharf. That's it, Cato. You can see her name on the bow. That boat is named Marianna. Well, if it ain't the boss. How'd it go, Fogel? We, uh, we figured you'd be in jail overnight anyway. So me, Dutch Fogel, in the jailhouse overnight? Don't be cuckoo, boys. I'm just down there to talk to the police about poor Boots. Yeah, that's what we meant. They don't suspect me. Lanigan was my pal. Hmm? They remind me to send some nice flowers to his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to worry about you either. Just dropped in to tell you boys that. Also to ask a little question. Turn around this way, Chopper. Any of you others feel like Boots did? Anybody else want to turn patriotic like Boots did? Maybe you, Chopper. <laughs> well, that's not me, Fogel. I ain't got no brother in the Marines. Nobody? That's fine. We feel like you do, Fogel. We get us plenty of moolah. What do we care where it comes from? A stick-up, bank robbery, or from that Gestapo in Berlin? That's all, boys. Pretty soon we get to work on that ship. I'll tell you when. It better be soon. That salvage job ain't gonna wait. Let me worry about that. So I'll say to you now. Chopper. I'm looking for... Well, if it isn't my old pal, Chopper. I see you're informal tonight. What do you mean? You're not wearing your brass knuckles, boy. Uh, chopper, <laughs> Chopper. Better wait a whack. 
Hello, Mr. Lowry. How's the newspaper racket? Better than yours, Dutch. It pays regular. <laughs> some sense of humor, this fellow, huh, boys? <laughs> yes, yeah, some sense of humor. <laughs> you were in the police station when they questioned me. You come after me for something? Yeah. A little information. I told the police everything oh, I know. It isn't that. It isn't that. Holy mackerel. I know you didn't bump off one of your own men. It's just that I want some local color. We have to keep this story about Boots alive. <laughs> oh, yes, I see. Boots is dead, but you uh, keep the story alive. Sure, it's good for the circulation. <laughs> I mean the newspaper circulation. So how about it? I guess you knew Lanigan as well as anybody did. You got a car outside? No, I grabbed a taxi. All right, I have my car. You drive home with me. Well. I'll tell you about Boots. I'm all broken up, I can tell you that. You know, it doesn't do to fool with the law. Somebody's going to pay for shooting up poor Boots. <laughs> Listen to you. Oh, man, do I get a bang out of that. You've got a record that covers three pages of a police blotter, and you talk like a Dutch uncle. Police blotter? <laughs> That's all wrong. No, sir, I'm a good, honest citizen. It's all a mistake. But what happened to Boots? You ride with me, I'll tell you. Good night, boys. Don't stay up too late playing poker. Uh, good night, boss. <laughs> that Fogel. <laughs> Ain't he a pip? Hey, he makes me nervous. Like a cat. Come on, come on, do it. No, I ain't gonna play no more. I'm tired. What's the matter? You got weak knees about boots? I'm weak. I'm tired, I tell you. Oh, oh my. Okay, okay, that's the way you feel. Here, it's just five bucks worth. Cash me in. Thanks. Now, give me my hat. <laughs> so long, punks. Don't jump at your own shadows. Those lily livid. Okay, you. What do you follow me for? Come on, speak up. I said. Have you got a match? Yeah, listen, I got no time for. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I can manage. What's wrong? Nervous? Me? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I bud has... Hey. Hello, Chopper. Bring your horn it. You better drop it, Chopper. You'll burn your finger. Uh, what do you want? You're bad about poor Boots, wasn't it, Chopper? Hey, hey, hey. I feel awfully bad about Boots, Chopper. What do you say you and me go someplace and talk about it? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Oh, I told you you'd burn your fingers, didn't I? Who is it? Chopper, boy. Go away, Chopper. Just beginning to retire. Oh. and every porter. But every good reason for this chopper. I don't like being disturbed. You get a plenty good reason. I run into somebody tonight, boss. So? Is he dead? Will you stop your kidding? Why didn't you tell us Lanigan was a pal of that guy? Boots Lanigan had no friends. Only his one brother, and he's far away. Besides, do I guess it riddles? Give it to me straight. Did you meet? The Green Hornet. Oh, you're the one who's making jokes. You don't believe me. Where'd you get that? He gave it to me. Seal of the Green Hornet. I tell you, boss, I'm still shaking. There's something about that guy. What did he want? He said he didn't like the idea of landing and getting murdered. That he felt like he ought to make up for it. Revenge, huh? But uh, you're still alive, Chopper. Sure, I couldn't let him... Go on. All right, I'll finish for you. You couldn't let yourself be shot, so you told him I was the one who killed Boots. That's not nice, Chopper. No, no. All, all I told him was it wasn't me. you got to believe me for I it. don't believe you, Chopper. So I'm going to give you some bitter medicine like I gave Boots. A little lead poisoning, yes? Oh, God. I tell you... No, I'll tell you. Don't try to square him, Chopper. I may be fat, but I'm also strong. You're going to die. Drop him, Fogel. Oh, the green hornet, eh? Huh? 
I'll give you what I was No, you won't drop it. I'll get back. Dutch, this isn't the gun you used on Boots, but it'll do. Hold it. Hold it, wait now. Before you go to shoot me, let me point out how useless a thing like revenge is. No one ever benefits from it. (laughs) You always come up with a moral lesson, don't you? I'm very sorry. I didn't know Boots was a particular friend of the Green Hornet. But if you would have done what I did, I had to shoot him for strictly business reasons. He was going to squeal on it. Is that right, Chopper? Yeah, yeah, sure. It was a very important business matter, Hornet, about... But uh, you wouldn't be interested. About the Mariana? Chopper sometimes talks too much. I didn't... What's in your lip, Chopper? Well, Fogel, I don't know. Maybe you had your reasons for getting rid of Boots. Yes, be sensible about it, Hornet. Why have shooting when it's not necessary? Besides, you're a smart operator. Perhaps we can arrange something. The only kind of arrangements I can understand are about money, Fogel. Hard cash. (laughs) Yes, a man after my own heart. But of course, hard cash on it. I'll tell you, I get, uh, well, the people who want the Mariana sabotage given. Don't hedge. You mean the Gestapo? Say the Gestapo. All right, the Gestapo. They furnish all the money I need. You're welcome to a generous slice, my friend. As a matter of fact, a man of your reputation can come in very handy. What do you say? Hmm. Sounds all right. I'll think it over, Fogel. Boss, I hear footsteps. Yeah. He's right, out in the hall. Lock that door, quick. Hey, Fogel, open up. The police are here. They want to ask you a few more questions. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. But first, in modern war, the worker behind a machine is as much a soldier of democracy as the man behind a gun. America needs every skilled worker who can be found. Machine set-up men, tool designers, draftsmen. Our war industries need more workers with skill in almost every trade. If you've had experience which you think might fit you for a war production job, and if you aren't now engaged in war work, Register at once with the nearest office of the United States Employment Service. That office will tell you where you're needed, where you can serve the war effort best. You'll find the address in your phone book or ask at your post office. Now back to our story. When a rap on the door announced the presence of police, the three men in the room froze abruptly. Britt Reed's eyes narrowed behind his hornet mask, and he flung a low-voiced question at Fogel. Is there another way out of here? No other way. If we're cut with a green horn. Quiet, you fool. Oh, he's right. If I'm caught, you'll be jailed, too. We'll never be able to explain this away. But there is no other way. This is four stories up right below the roof. Fogel! Fogel, wake up! Stall them. Stall them. Yes, yes. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I'll open the door. I won't hold them long. You'll have to. What's that? I heard it, too. It came... Well, I'll be... Look, why didn't you tell me you had a rope hanging from the roof right outside your window, Fogel? Well, I never knew. You can open the door in ten seconds. Uh, sure takes that lug a long time to come to the door. Hello. Hello. You cops are always waking a man up. What is it this time? You and Chopper, eh? Who else is here? Well, I guess you were wrong, Lowry. There's just the two of us, Copper. I'm Fogel's bodyguard. Yes, with Boots dead, I thought perhaps whoever got rid of him might uh, have me next on the list. What were you looking for, Mr. Lowry? Uh, skip it, Dutch. I just thought I saw somebody else come in this joint after Chopper did. Guess I must have been seeing double. Yes. I guess that's so. You 
Saved my life that time, Cato. It's always very pleasant to do so, Mr. Bridge. If you hadn't spotted Lowry and the police and dropped that rope from the roof, the capture of the Green Hornet would be headline news tomorrow. I wouldn't care for that, even as a scoop for the Sentinel. <laughs> we'll put the black dirty to bed and then get some sleep ourselves. Plenty of sleep. I have a feeling we won't do much after tonight. Not until Fogel's caught in that sabotage job he's planning. It is uh, Mariana? Yeah, we guessed right on that one. Well, correction, please. You guess right. Fogel said we could work together on the job. I said I'd call him tomorrow night. What do you think? Fogel tells the truth like a Japanese ambassador. <laughs> You're right. But don't worry. I'm not trusting him further than I can throw the Sentinel building. The only trouble is I still don't know what he plans to do or when. You look a little tired, Mr. Reed. Hmm? Oh, do I, Miss Case? Well, I suppose you were out until three or four again this morning. Oh, gosh, Mr. Reed, you can't burn the candle all night long at nightclubs this way and expect to be on your toes in the daytime. Why, well, be on my toes. I'm no toe dancer. Besides, look at this view, Miss Case. How can anybody work in this kind of weather? Ah, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Look at the view of the riverfront. Mm, it is lovely. Look, they're still working to salvage that ship. I haven't spotted that in a long time. The Mariana? Mm-hmm. I guess they're almost done, aren't they? Mm, I don't know. I haven't heard, Miss Case. Oh, it's much too nice a day to stay in an office. I'm leaving, Miss Case. You're leaving? Yeah, you know all the work that has to be done. Goodbye, Miss Case. But, Mr. Reed... Oh, I've made up my mind. See you tomorrow. But, Mr... Well, if that doesn't beat everything. All play and no work. Oh, still, it is a beautiful day. Uh-uh, Casey, none of that. You just work here. Hey, Casey, where's the boss? I got news. Well, you didn't just see him. He just left. No. Oh, I guess I missed him. Well, whatever your news is, it'll have to keep till tomorrow. He's gone for the day. Oh, well, it may not work out anyway. Well, what is it? The police. They just got a tip on where the Green Hornet will be at midnight tonight. The Green Hornet? Yeah, I'm going there with him. Casey, can you picture the headlines if this is on the level? Mm, certainly switch around, Lowry. Yesterday, you were all hopped up about the Lanigan murder. That? Uh, it's old stuff, Casey. Can't run a paper on yesterday's news. No, I was just remarking. It seemed like such a mystery at the time. Uh, good grief. Hey, what gives? You look like a moonstruck goldfish. Sorry, come here. To this window. Now it's all the fuss. Do you see that boat out there? The one that's rolled on its side? Sure. Do you know its name? I mean, the new name the Navy gave it when they took it over for transport service. Yeah, it's the, uh... Oh, I got it. The Mariana. Yeah, that's it. The... Mariana. Casey. Holy mackerel, do you suppose that's what Lanigan meant? I think you'd better call the police, Lowry. Might be a good idea if they doubled the guard on that ship. Yes, yes, that's right, Hornet. Perhaps we can meet tonight, huh? To discuss the, uh, the boat, you know. Well, a good place would be the old reservoir north of the city, not being used. And it is a good dark night, hmm? <laughs> How about midnight? Yes, it is too bad our plans are not yet completed to do the little, uh, shall I say, job on the boat tonight. But there will be other times. Then midnight, yes? The old reservoir. We shall meet later on it. Goodbye. <laughs> well, you got him out of the way. The old reservoir. The police will be waiting for him, not I. We'll be, we'll be at the waterfront, under the wharves, ready to blow the Mariana to bits. Some of the boys who've been watching say that they doubled the guard on the Mariana. So? Then twice as many of them will be killed, huh, Chopper? I don't worry about them. I worry about the Hornet. And that worry will soon be over. Forever. Well, how goes it, Sergeant? Did you find the Green Hornet? That tip was for me, Lowry. We searched this old reservoir from rim to rim. Green Hornet isn't here. It's already midnight. Hey, Sergeant! Sergeant! Huh? What's up? I just got a message on the short way. Police call. No wonder the Hornet ain't here. He was spotted near the waterfront. All right, 
chopper. Out of drift. Like it's pitch under these docks. Them piles are covered with barnacles. I scraped my hand. Silence. We've prepared for this long enough for us to know this place blindfold. Right about here should be where we hid the oil barrels. Not yet. First, uh, now we got it. It should be. Yes. Uh, how many times have we rode down here with these oil barrels, Chopper? Twenty times. A barrel each time. I ought to know. I got blisters on my hands. Yes, yes, enough, enough. Uh, we open them up and let the oil out. It'll flow directly down the Mariana. I hope you're right about the current, boss. Don't be a fool. The current is downstream, just right. Fast. Ten minutes after the last barrel is drained, the oil reaches the boat. Then we light it from here and... <laughs> Goodbye, Mariana. Here's the first one, boss. That's one. I'll hold the boat steady. Here goes for the next. <laughs> That's the last one, Fogel. Good. Twelve minutes. Now push the boat upstream a little ways. Guess that's okay. Good. Now the flame so I can throw it toward the oil. <laughs> uh, so simple and so effective. I light this paper and set the oil flame, and the oil sets the Mariana flame. A match, Chopper. Yeah, yeah, I got one right here. Hey, oh, what I almost missed you, didn't I? Turn off that flashlight. You'll be seen. Green Hornet. Hornet, Hornet, turn off that flashlight. Oh, I want it to be seen, Fulgham. By the time they look at it, you and Chopper... Watch out! No, you don't drop that match. Chopper! Let go! Let go! Let go! Let go! Now! Take it, Rats! All right, Kettle, that does it. Put the light in there, boat, and let's get out of here. What a story, Sarge. Do you mean to say those babies were all set to put the Marianne on fire? Twenty barrels of oil on the water, Lowry. If it hadn't have been that we spotted that light under the dock, they'd have done it. It sure was a close call. Yeah, but what I can't figure out is they were both unconscious. Hold and chopper, both of them. It couldn't have been the fumes from the oil, could it? It wasn't oil, Sarge. Why, your eyes. It was gas. Gas with that gut and the green horn it carries. And don't ask me where he's gone to. I'm a reporter, not a magician. <laughs> Men and women who are not yet working directly in the war effort are asking, where can I serve? Where am I needed? Am I needed now? And if not, when will I be needed? The answers to those questions are waiting for you at your local United States Employment Office. If you live in a war production center, they'll probably tell you either that you're needed now or that you soon will be needed, and where you may get free training for a war job. If you don't live in a war production center, they'll tell you not to move into one until they first find you a job and a place to live because most war production centers already are overcrowded. For answers to every question about your individual place in the war effort, go to your local United States Employment Office. You have just heard the adventure, Sabotage Finds a Name. These exciting dramas are sent to you each Saturday at this same time. They are copyrighted features of the Green Hornet Incorporated. All characters, names, places, and incidents used in this drama are purely fictitious. This program has come to you from the studios of WXYZ in Detroit. This is the Blue Network. Hi-ho, Silver! Away to those thrilling days of yesteryear with the Lone Ranger. Up I 
fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high old silver, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> of the western United States is also a history of transportation. First prairie schooners, then the Pony Express, and finally the railroad helped bring civilization to the new country. It was the mask rider of the plains, however, that did most to establish law and order on the frontier. He fought crime and criminals throughout the length and breadth of seven states, and the memory of his deeds will remain as long as the memory of the early West itself. Now return with us to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. We're riding east to the railroad. Someone's waiting for us. Hi, old Silver. Zeke Hackett had once ranged cattle all the way from the town of Hinsdale through Cedar Valley and beyond. In the days of his prosperity, he had befriended numberless men and women who had come to him starving or sick or homeless. With the end of the days of the open range, Zeke's prosperity faded away. And with his prosperity, the fair-weather friends who had taken advantage of his generosity. In the end, he had been able to retain title only to Cedar Valley and a small strip of land to the westward and here grazed the shrunken remnants of his once vast herds. We see Zeke now, sitting on the porch of his home with his wife, Martha, watching the approach of their nearest neighbor, Duke Bradley, with two of his men. Well, there he comes, Martha, riding up here just as bold as you please. And ten years ago, I'd have taken my shooting iron and run him off my place so fast he'd have scorched the air getting away. Times have changed, Zeke. Not for the better, neither. Now, when he gets here, you treat him just as nice as you're able. It don't do to go looking for trouble. Marthy, I feel like to bust. Well, you can just hold in that temper of yours. There ain't nobody else willing to give us cash for Cedar Valley right now. Just because Duke's got everybody so blame scared, they're afraid to offer anything. I ain't saying that's not so. And if I could only prove my suspicions, I'd be willing to bet every last penny I got that Duke's the fellow to blame for them water holes in the valley being pison. Now, Zeke, you have no reason to say that. Huh? Don't need no reason. All us could tell a crook by the way my rheumatics act. <laughs> Won't you ever get over that notion? Well, it's so. I get within ten yards of a crook, and I get to aching like somebody's using me for a pincushion. <laughs> I've heard you say that for 40 years. Oh, no, I can feel it coming on right now. You behave yourself. Howdy, Zeke. Howdy yourself. Didn't you hear me? Hmm. Well, you ready to talk business, Zeke? Oh. Something ailing you? It's them dog-blasted rheumatics. Never did have them so bad afore. Well, now, I'm sorry to hear that. Didn't know you was troubled that way. Oh. Don't you pay any attention to him, Mr. Bradley. Zeke's just like a big baby with his ailments. You keep still, Marthy. It's 
So you come to make me an offer for Cedar Valley again, is that it? I heard in town you changed your mind about selling. It wasn't because I wanted to. No? But there ain't no use trying to run cattle where they die off like flies from pies and water. It's just terrible. We've lost half our critters already. Uh-huh. I was afraid of that. Now, if you'd sold out to me before, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. How much you offering? Well, last time I said I'd give you 3000 Wasn't that it, Sawbuck? Yeah. yeah. That's why I recollect it, boss. Mm-hmm. Well, it ain't much, but I guess I'll... Now, wait a minute, Zeke. Huh? That 3000 was for the valley and all the critters in it at the time I made the offer. But, of course, you wouldn't expect me to offer as much now... Seeing that half your critters have died off since. You you mean you won't give us these thousand even now? Two thousand's my best price. Oh, my rheumatics is something fierce. Duke, two thousand's the same as robbery. Why, five years ago, I could have sold the valley and the cattle for thirty thousand. <laughs> this ain't five years ago. Then, then make it twenty-five hundred. Nope. I just give you my first and last price. I ought to... You ought to what? I ought to tell you to... Don't say anything you'll be sorry for. We need that money mighty bad. But, Martha, to have nothing left but that strip of land over westward and a little handful of cash, after all we used to have. Oh, it's hard. But we can't hold out longer. (laughs) You're a real sensible woman, ma'am. I just wished I wasn't. But at our age... There, there, honey. I'll take the offer, I reckon. That's fine, Zeke. But I just wish I could figure out why you're so anxious to get the Valley Duke. Them water holes will be pison no matter who owns them. Well, you see, Zeke, I got to figure this way. Most likely it's something underground seeping in and poisoning the springs. Maybe in time it'll all be washed away. Maybe. You can't afford to wait, of course, but I can. You're sure it ain't something else poisoning the water? Meaning? Well, never mind. I said I'd sell, and having no choice, I'll keep the bargain all right. <laughs> Your rheumatics ain't so bad you can't get to town this afternoon to sign the papers, are they? Oh, I reckon I can make it. Then come on, fellas. I'll be expecting you at Lawyer Winton's office about three. I'll be there. And don't you forget the 2,000. Oh, these rheumatics will be the death of me yet. <laughs> that old fool and his rheumatics. <laughs> All right, fellas, get to your saddles. We're riding to town. Something underground pies in the springs, eh? <laughs> Zeke can't prove no different, can he? Shut your mouth, you two. <laughs> Come up. on, get up there. Get up. In the meantime, some distance to the east, rumors that the railroad planned to extend its lines westward became a practical certainty. A small group of surveyors started making their way across country with chains and transits. And one day, the lone ranger and his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, rode up to the crew. Hello there. A masked man. What the... Who's over? Who wants chains? Outlaws. What do you want here? We're not outlaws, Jerry. You know my name. You're Jerry Duncan, aren't you? We never met before that I can recollect. Your superintendent told me about you. Mr. Stanley? Yes. How come outlaws like you know him? I said we aren't outlaws. Tonto and I became acquainted with him a long time ago. Mm. We help him when him in plenty trouble. Yeah? He told us the railroad would build and that you'd be in charge of the surveying crew. Glass that he shouldn't have talked so much. He knew that anything he told us would be held in confidence. Look here, stranger. If that information gets out, it's going to cost the railroad a fortune to buy the land it needs. But we won't repeat what we know. I'm afraid most of the people through here suspect your purpose already. Maybe so. But they ain't so blame sure that they're going to turn down a fair price for their land. Tonto and I have been watching the route you're laying out. From what we've seen, you'll have to go through Cedar Valley. Yeah. Well, that's a long ways off yet. But it's directly on the way to Hinsdale. (laughs) For all you know, maybe we ain't going to Hinsdale. Maybe we're going to Perryville instead. Stanley said that Hinsdale had been definitely decided upon. Mister, you know too blame much. Either you're an awful good friend of Mr. Stanley's, or you've blackmailed him into saying a lot of things he shouldn't have. Which do you believe? Well, I ain't so sure. You're wearing a mask like an outlaw right enough, but somehow I got a feeling you're different from what you seem to be. Thanks, Jerry. I give you my word that we're to be trusted. 
But what makes you so interested in where the railroad's going? Everybody's interested in that. But I particularly wanted it to go through Cedar Valley. Why, you... you... watch out. Careful, Jerry. Put down that gun. I see it now, you dirty crooks. Coming here with your smooth talking. I don't understand. What's wrong? Don't know what's wrong, huh? You're two of Duke Bradley's hired gun hands. Of course, you wouldn't know what it's all about. Duke Bradley? Ooh, him. Playing innocent, huh? But I don't know... All what... you did was cheat the best fellow that ever lived out of that valley. Zeke Hackett owns Cedar Valley, doesn't he? You don't blame well he don't. Your boss found out about where the railroad is going and bought it from Zeke for almost nothing. Feller named Duke by Valley? All this talk of yours about Mr. Stanley telling you the things you know. Last year you got your information straight from Duke Bradley. How did he find out about the railroad? The way he always finds out things, by cheating and bribing and dirty gunplay. You'll have to believe me, Jerry. This is the first we knew about it. Yeah? We hoped the railroad would go through Cedar Valley because we thought Zeke owned it. If the railroad bought from him, he'd have a chance to rebuild his fortune. You ain't pulling the wool over my eyes. Wait. You polecats. Zeke put me through school when I never had a cent to my name. Put down that gun. And right now I'm paying back part of what I owe him. Men, grab these fellas. Come on. You not get us. Come on, fellas. Come on. Shoot. 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 We scared him off anyhow. Bastard crooks. All right, all right, men. There ain't no use chasing them. We'll settle them fellas later on. <laughs> The masked man and Tonto raced away from the crew of surveyors, then decided to continue on to Zeke Hackett's ranch many miles distant. They had known Zeke in the days of his prosperity and had sympathized with him when his fortunes declined. Now learning of Duke Bradley's action for the first time, they determined to investigate. We see them at the end of their journey, reining in their horses beside the corral where Zeke is standing. Zeke! My hide if it ain't the masked fellow in Tonto. <coughs> Been a long time since we've met. Uh, too blame long. <laughs> Tonto, glad to see you. Well, <laughs> Tonto, there ain't so many feel that way anymore. I can recollect when I had more friends than I knew what to do with. But it seems like when a feller's down, they sort of forget about him. I know one who hasn't, Zeke. Yeah? Jerry Duncan. <laughs> Jerry? <laughs> Say, now, there's one of the finest young fellows ever was. Met up with him when he was just an orphan kid. All the sort of felt toward him like I would have if he'd been my son. And he thinks a lot of you. Your friends are his? No, I'm afraid he thought us outlaws. <laughs> Recollect when we first met up. First I figured you was outlaws myself. Then when my rheumatics didn't get to aching, I says to myself, Zeke, there's an honest feller, mask or no mask. Jerry gave us some bad news. Yeah? He told us that you'd had to sell the valley. Yep, I did all right. Mm, Tonto, not like that. Well, Tonto, I never thought to see the day I'd sell it. But me and Marty got down to where we just had to have some cash. Duke Bradley bought it, didn't he? Uh-huh. I don't suppose he told you what he wanted it for. Oh, he'll graze cattle there, I suppose. That wasn't his purpose, Zeke. He knew the railroad would have to buy that property. Huh? What's that? It's true. I wouldn't have told you about the railroad's plans, but Duke seems to have known them, and he used your ignorance to cheat you. Well, I'll be... So he did poison them water holes. He poisoned the water holes in the valley? He must have. I can't prove it. But just as sure as I'm standing here, he did that very thing. And he can't be brought to justice? There's no way at all. But there's something else he can be brought to. Yes? And that's the business end of shooting iron. You stay here Wait, while I get Zeke. My... But I... Listen to me. Perhaps there's another way to punish him. I don't know what to be. Oh, golly. Just thinking of that critter's brought on them pains again. You can't fight a man like Duke Bradley with guns. That's the surest way I know of. No, Zeke. I have still a better plan. Huh? And from what you've told me, I'm sure it'll work. Now listen to me. The curtain falls on the first act of our thrilling Lone Ranger drama. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Now 
to continue our story. A week after Duke Bradley had bought Cedar Valley from Zeke Hackett for a fraction of its true worth, the rancher was talking with one of his men. Well, Lim, <laughs> before the day's over, I'll be banking about forty or fifty thousand dollars. Will it be that soon, boss? Yep. I heard today that the fellow representing the railroad would be in town to buy up land. <laughs> Good enough. Huh? When Zeke hears about it, I'll bet he'll be fit to be tied. I can just see him. He'll be yelping about his rheumatic so as he could be heard clear the next county. We it? ain't worrying about him. You reckon the railroad will pay that much cash? They'll pay. It'd cost them ten times as much to cut across the hills. Yeah, anyhow, that much. <laughs> I'll be making myself a nice profit. Two thousand a Zeke for the valley... And 500 to pay that fellow in the railroad office for telling us which way the line's going to be built. Golly, and all the rest clear. The best part of it is we couldn't have lost no matter which way the railroad was built. Uh huh. If they'd decided to go to Perryville instead of Hinsdale, they'd had to cross that land over to the west as he goes. <laughs> if that had been the case, why, maybe them water holes over there might have been poisoned. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing about water holes. Can't never tell where they're likely to go bad. <laughs> they saw Buck riding up. I was hoping he'd be getting back. I aimed to send him into town after some supplies were needing. Yeah, maybe I'll go with him. I need a boss. Huh? The surveyors are here. <laughs> Going through the valley, eh? But well, they ain't. What's that? The railroad's changed his plans. You're local. I ain't. The railroad's not coming to Hinsdale. What I can... It's going to Perryville. Them surveyors are on Zeke's land. That western strip of his? Yeah. You, you seen him yourself? No, not exactly. But I heard it in town. It can't be. We ought to see for ourselves. Come on. That's just what we're going to do. I never believed it at first. But even the sheriff said he'd seen it. If that fellow in the railroad office double-crossed me, I'll... He might have, figuring you couldn't prove nothing. And figuring if he gave out the wrong information, the railroad couldn't prove nothing either. He'll pay for it if he did. Did he there, blast you. Let's hurry. I'm ready. Get up there. Get up there. Almost this same time, the Lone Ranger rode swiftly into town on his great horse, Silver, reined in before the sheriff's office, and hurried inside. What the? Don't go for your gun, Sheriff. A masked man, a mole of blasted. You're nerve. going to do what I say. You... I'll explain later. But there's no time to waste now. You'll be jailed for Perhaps, this. Perhaps, but right now you're coming with me. <laughs> Duke Bradley led his men at a swift gallop toward the narrow stretch of land which Zeke Hackett still owned. As they approached their destination, Duke saw that the report he had received was correct. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Yeah. You there. You calling me? You heard me, didn't you? Uh-huh. I heard you. I didn't care much about your style of calling either. Don't get smart, oh. mister. Uh, you Shut up, Lim. I'll talk to this fellow. Now, what I want to know is what you and your men are doing over here. What we're doing is our business. But I'm making it mine. Yeah? Let me handle them, boss. Maybe a little gun weapon would do them some good. Anytime you fellas want to start something, I'm willing. Look here. I thought the railroad was going through Cedar Valley. You did, huh? It was supposed to be built to Hinsdale. But this is the way to Perryville. And what if it is? Just this. I own Cedar Valley. I paid good cash for it. But if the railroad's going to Perryville, I won't be able to sell it. Well. Now, ain't that just too bad? You... You're Duke Bradley, ain't you? That's me. Well, I heard about the way you cheated old Zeke. You thought you was going to collect big money. But this is Zeke's land, and now it's him that's going to collect. Duke, we ought to fill that fellow in the railroad office full of land. It was him that got you in this place. Serve you right. I'll oh, Sawbuck. But I Come tell Come on. You. Get back on your horses. We ain't licked yet. <laughs> Ever since the day Zeke Hackett had spoken to the Lone Ranger, his bitter mood had passed, and his puzzled wife frequently observed the old man chuckling to himself. When questioned, he refused to give his reason, and Martha found her curiosity increasing. 
we see the elderly couple in the living room of their home. <laughs> For pity's sake, Zeke, quit your laughing to yourself. I declare sometimes I think you're losing what little sense you ever had. <laughs> do you now, Martha? <laughs> I do. Oh, now, Zeke, you tell me what it is you're keeping to yourself this way. It hasn't got anything to do with the valley, has it? Uh, you'll find out all in good time. But why can't you tell but me? Right now, all the talking and begging in the world won't make me say a word. I give my promise to the masked man, and I ain't going back on it. Oh, you're still just as stubborn as when you was courting me. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's how I got you, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, for heaven's sake, Zeke, now what ailing uh, Just look outside. Why? Why, it's Duke Bradley with them two no-count gun hands of his. The polecats. Come in, blast you. Oh. Oh, them rheumatics. They're at it again. Zeke, I changed my mind. Yeah? I don't want the valley no more. Don't want the valley? Kind of late in deciding, ain't you? Maybe, but not too late. You, uh, you want we should give you back the 2000 you paid us? Well, if that's it, we can't do it. Most of it's spent. I don't want the cash. But you... I'm here to make a trade. A trade? I got the papers here for you to sign and everything. Lemon and Sawbuck can be the witnesses. Why, you ain't even said what you want to trade for yet. I'll give you back the valley for the land you got over west. Oh, so that's it. You're getting all the best of the deal. <laughs> like blazes I am. You seen them surveyors over there and you want that land to sell to the railroad. Well, Duke Bradley, you listen to me. That land's mine and I ain't selling it or trading it or giving it away. And that's flat. Yeah? Now you can get out of here, because we can't do business. I reckon we will. I said get out of here. Please, Zeke, don't fight with him. I'll sit down. Oh, you shoved him. Blast you, I'll... You'll trade me that land, that's what you'll do. You can't make me. <laughs> yeah, that's what you think. I ain't got the time to waste on you like I did before. So we're getting this over with right now. The land's mine, and I'm keeping it. <laughs> Maybe you'll change your mind after I tell you a few things. You... First off... How do you think them water holes in the valley got poisoned? I got a blame good notion. Uh-huh. It was me and the boys done it. That was when we figured it was the valley the railroad wanted. You, you beast. <laughs> Maybe that'll show you we ain't to be fooled with. Go ahead and poison all the water holes you want to. That don't make no difference now. It's too late for that. It wouldn't make no difference now if we did. But there's other ways of changing your mind. Ways you maybe wouldn't like. I ain't afraid. Show them, Sawbuck. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh, you almost hit him. When do I get my gun? Stay where you are. Go ahead, Sawbuck. <laughs> oh, my base. The base I brought with me from the east. Changing your mind yet, Zeke? I'll have the law on you. No, you won't. There's three of us and only two of you. The law will have to take our word again yours. Oh, Zeke, don't hold out. They might kill you. You, you got the papers with you, you say? <laughs> uh-huh, right here. Give them to me. I'll sign. Now you're showing sense. You just put your name right there. <laughs> Fellas, didn't I tell you we weren't through yet? Now I reckon maybe next time you'll believe me. point of a gun, Zeke was forced to sign the papers which returned him Cedar Valley in exchange for the strip of land where the surveyors were active. This done, he accompanied Duke and his men to town where the papers were notarized. But Zeke did not return to his home. Instead, he remained in town until evening. We see him now in the cafe, watching the approach of Jerry Duncan and the second man. Howdy, Jerry. I've been waiting for you. Gosh, it's good to see you again, Zeke. Shake hands with Mr. Stanley. Glad to meet you, Mr. Stanley. It's a pleasure. Mr. Stanley's our superintendent. Uh-huh. Uh, sit down, won't you? Yeah. Thanks. Look, Zeke. There's Duke Bradley and them two men of his. They're right where they can hear everything that's said. <laughs> Let them. That's what I want. I understand you're the owner of Cedar Valley, <laughs> Mr. Hackett. <laughs> that I am. Would you be interested in selling? Not for no $2,000. What's that? That's all right, Mr. Stanley. It's just a little joke, is he? Oh, <laughs> you uh, got any particular price in mind, Mr. Stanley? I have, and it's fair, I believe. $30,000. Well, now, that's something. Hey, what's going on here? You're trying to pull some kind of a slick deal, Z? Jerry, who are these men? Oh, they're the fellows who own Cedar Valley for a while, Mr. Stanley. But it weren't for long. Oh, gee. <laughs> I think I've heard of them. I ask a question, I want an answer. One moment. 
What business is this of yours? I'll tell you what business it is of mine. If you're buying the valley for the railroad, then I've been cheated. Cheated? You heard me. And by that fellow sitting right there. <laughs> He's pinting at you, Jerry. I never cheated nobody. No? I suppose you didn't tell me the railroad was going to Perryville. Nope, I didn't. It was you who said that. I just didn't bother to put you right. Boy, <laughs> you. Duke, they tricked us. And we're stuck with that land that ain't no good to us. Well, we won't be for long. You better be mighty careful, Duke. You sneaking old fool. You ain't tricking me like this. Zeke, watch out. Oh. 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 Now it sounds oh. like you got the rheumatics, Duke. My hand, it's smashed. No, oh. listen, Duke. I just hit your gun. What a mess, man. So you want a gunfight, huh? Well, Raise I Raise your you. hands, all of you. And keep them raised. Sheriff, jail that mask, fella. He just... It's you I'm jailing, Duke. You and your part. You ain't got nothing on us. That's where you're wrong. Go ahead, Sheriff. Jail the coyotes. You can't. You ain't got no reason. It's your own fault you're going to jail, Duke. But I tell you... and I were outside when you forced Zeke to trade back. You made him accept the valley at the point of a gun. The masked man's telling the truth, Duke. I seen it all. But Zeke told us not to do nothing unless you tried to make trouble over this deal. It's a frame-up. But you're getting exactly what you deserve. And it was the masked fella that done it. It was him and Tonto that got Jerry to bring his crew here to survey that other land so as Duke could think the railroad had changed its plans. <laughs> the first time I met up with the masked fella, I figured him to be an outlaw. I sure learned different. All right, Duke. You fellas are coming along with me. I got a sail already picked out for you. If I ever get out of... You won't, Duke. This is the worst luck I ever seen. To think that we forced Zeke to take back the land he wanted all the time. And then on top of that, they have to go to jail for beating ourselves out of all that cash. I don't care what you call it. That ain't justice. Come on, Silver! We're heading for the Rio Grande! you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Groucho Marx meets some of the most interesting people you could ever hope to hear on radio with in You Bet Your Life, coming up next. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is clock. C-L-O-C-K. Really? You bet your life! The more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You'll Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is, 
the one, the only... Groucho! That's me, Groucho Marx. Well, here I am again with $1,000 for one of our couples. Fenneman, who's first to try for it? Well, Groucho, just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a clerk from the unemployment office, Mrs. Louise Ludwig, and her partner, Mrs. Marjorie Kendall, was selected because of her unusual occupation. And here they are. Ladies, come right up here and meet Groucho Marx. Well, welcome, kids, for the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. And if you say the secret word and divide $100, it's a common word, something you see every day. Mrs. Uh, Louise Ludwig? That's you. Where, where, where are you from, uh, Louise? I'm from Honolulu. From Honolulu? Yes. Oh. How long have you been away from uh, Honolulu? Uh, since It's been uh, many years since I was 12 years old. <laughs> it's been I... many years since you were 12 years you old? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think Shall I tell you how many years? <laughs> well, I don't want to pry into your private life, Mrs. <laughs> Ludwig. You're a very attractive young girl. I'll keep my mouth shut. And you're, you're, you're married, huh? Yes, Mr. Murray. And, uh, what does your husband do? Uh, he's a driver's license examiner for the motor vehicle department. Oh. Well, I'll be mighty nice to you. <laughs> Marjorie Kendall, you were chosen because of your unusual occupation. Now, what sort of work do you do? You do? I'm a secretary and part-time genealogist. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what is a, a genealogist? One who I uh, trace family lineages, family trees. Now, Margie, how, how did you become interested in family trees? Were you looking for termites or...? Uh... No, I was looking at my own family history. Uh-huh. I started looking at my family once, but I stopped when I got to Chico. It was frightening. <laughs> <laughs> now, how far did you trace your family? To 445 A.D. I'd be satisfied if you could trace me back to 445 A.M. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure I want to go back there again. <laughs> now, Marjorie, why should people want to know their family trees? Uh, isn't that a little snobbish? Oh, no. It's, an in, it's a curiosity on the part of almost everyone to know what their family name means. How about the name Marks? Could you, could you look up the family tree? Oh, I did several years ago with you did? several other Hollywood personalities. Is that so? And wh why should you look up my name? Well, because it was uh, you were an interesting person, and I've always admired you and was my favorite... Uh, Comedian. <laughs> I've never did anything that any other boy couldn't do. <laughs> now, what did you find in my family tree? Oh, mostly, of course, the, you have a beautiful crest. <laughs> Say, you look pretty good yourself. <laughs> what do you mean, a beautiful crest? I'm... Well, there's... Um... In a crest? You mean a family crest? Yes, sir. Like two horse thieves swinging from a potted palm? <laughs> two uh, wings that were partly crossed and uh, oh, a little bit of gold embellished on them. And... You mean I had wings? Uh, part of the, that uh -huh. was the crest of the Marx family? Yes, sir. You mean my forefathers were fan dancers, eh? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mrs., uh, you're with the unemployment uh, office? Yes, Mr. Marx. Uh -huh. where, where is that? Uh, I work in the harbor area. In the water? <laughs> and uh, uh, what are your duties there? Well, I attempt to uh, find positions for people who uh, are in need of them. Could you find a position for me? Well, very possibly. What kind of work are you interested in? <laughs> Why should I be interested in work with the racket I've got? <laughs> now, suppose I'm unemployed. Uh, you can never tell about sponsors, you know. Uh, of course, the DeSoto Plymouth is <laughs> different, huh? In a DeSoto, you drive without shifting. <laughs> you ought to be very happy with me. I'm about as shiftless as they come. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, oh yes. Uh, what kind of jobs do you have the most calls for? Well, uh, uh, highly skilled technicians, and, uh, of course, uh, good secretaries are always hard to get. Yes, they are, especially <laughs> for a man of my age. <laughs> Even fair ones I'm having difficulty with. <laughs> now, how is the unemployment situation out your way right now? Uh, as I say, that uh, demand for highly skilled uh, remains uh, prevalent, uh, but the mackerel season is uh, The mackerel under... season mm -hmm. is on now? Yes. Well, how many unemployed mackerel are there? <laughs> That's as fishy a story as I ever heard. <laughs> 
Now, let's see if you two will get a chance at the $1,000. But first, here's exciting news I don't want anyone to miss. It's here! It's new! It's designed for you! DeSoto! DeSoto is the car that's a revelation to ride. DeSoto famous dealers now presented nationwide. So drive a new DeSoto before you decide. The 51 DeSoto, that's a revelation to ride. Yes, the brand new 1951 DeSoto is a revelation to ride and drive. The amazing combination of features that brings you a new concept of driving pleasure. Your ride will be more pleasant because underneath that hood is a new, big, higher-powered engine. Smoother because of new Auraflow shock absorbers and synchronized springs. Easier because of feather light steering. These and many other features add up to a ride that's a revelation. No wonder your DeSoto Plymouth dealer so proudly presents... The 51 DeSoto, that's a revelation to ride. Okay, now let's see if you'll get the chance at the $1,000. Fenneman, explain the rules. Well, you bet as much of your $20 as you want on each of four questions. And the couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $1,000 DeSoto Plymouth question at the end of the show. Okay, here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You've selected personalities of the 20s. Here's your first question. How much will you bet? Uh, ten. Ten dollars. Ten dollars? Okay. The Bambino was undisputed king of the ballparks during the 20s. What was his name? Babe Ruth. Ruth. Babe Ruth is right. And you're on your way. You have thirty dollars. Remember, you're going for a thousand dollars tonight. Now, how much of the thirty dollars will you bet on your second question? Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine, <laughs> huh? Okay. Who defeated Jack Dempsey twice the second time in 1927? He was an ex-Marine. Gene Tunney. Gene Tunney is correct. <laughs> Where are you climbing now? You have $59. You're climbing with $59. Here's your third question. How much are you going to go for? 55. 55. 55. Okay. The hop along of the 20s was a straight shooting cowboy with a horse named Tony. What was the cowboy's name? Uh, Tom Mix. Tom Mix is correct. <laughs> now you have $114. $114. And here's your last chance to be the other couples. How much of the 114 Oh. All of it? Okay. You're gamblers. What was the name of the colorful revivalist who during the 20s drew thousands of people to his meetings? Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday is correct. <laughs> and you wind up with $228. Thank you very much. Uh, Fenneman, just a moment. There's something I want to clear up. Remember last week in the quiz, one question was, what do you call the Australian and New Zealand troops of both world wars? You remember that? I remember the question. Well, the Austrian war bride and her husband, she said uh, diggers, and I said that was wrong because the official name was Anzacs. Well, a lot of people said diggers was the slang name for him, so we're sending Mr. and Mrs. Schwander $180. (laughs) Fortunately, it wasn't enough to affect the standings for the big question, so thank heaven that remains the same as it turned out on the show. All right, on with it, Fenneman. Who's next? Uh, we invited some women from the Federation of State Societies to the program tonight, and we selected Mrs. Florence Parsons. Her partner is a husband from the studio audience, Mr. Bob Smith. Folks, come on in here and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, folks, to your bet your life. You say the secret word, and you'll win $100 between you. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mrs. Uh, Florence Parsons, eh? You're from the Federation of State Societies? Yes, I am. Uh, what, what is that? Is that the Confederate Army? It's an organization of the people from the different states as they've come into California. I see. Oh, I see. Where, where, where are you from? Uh? I'm from uh, Williamsburg, Massachusetts. Williamsburg? Yes. What part of California is that in? Uh? Oh, that's not in California. It is in Massachusetts. <laughs> Williamsburg, is, isn't that where uh, Cal Coolidge uh, came from? No, he uh, really was born in Vermont, but he lived in Northampton, just oh. a few miles from Williamsburg, oh, ten I miles. See. Did you know uh, Cal Coolidge? Slightly. They said that I had a longer conversation with him than did any congressman that ever cooled his heels in the White House. And a congressman can cool plenty of heels, too. <laughs> do you remember that conversation at all, uh, Mrs. Yes, Parsons? I do. Could you give us a, a little of it? Well, I was visiting a neighbor of Coolidge, and uh, their farms adjoined. 
and I was sitting in the garden looking over the hedge when Coolidge was seen approaching, and uh, I wanted to escape, but my friend... Why, are you a Democrat? uh, No, (laughs) I wasn't, but uh, I was afraid to meet him. So he came through the hedge, and uh, when I was introduced, he said, Oh, from Los Angeles, a beautiful town. I have spoken there. I hope you'll have a pleasant visit and a safe journey home. Well, that was very nice. That was about the extent of our conversation. Well, that was quite a conversation. (laughs) I don't think Mrs. Coolidge ever got that much out of him. Uh, Your name is Bob Smith? That's correct. What sort of work do you do, Bob? I work for a sewing machine company. A sewing machine? Well, you don't look like you did any sewing. uh... No, I'm a motor man on a sewing machine. You're a motor man on a sewing machine? (laughs) Where do you drive it, up Hollywood Boulevard? (laughs) I suppose old Bobbin pulls it, huh? (laughs) Well, Bobbin is on a sewing machine. I happen to know because I'm an old so-and-so myself. Now, Bob, where is your home? I was born in Seattle, Washington, but I left there when I was two years old. Oh. You left there when you were two? Wanderlust, eh? Uh, That's pretty early to leave home, isn't it? Where where did you go? To Alaska. So Alaska is your home, eh? No, I went from there to Portland, Oregon. Is uh, Portland your hometown? No, from Portland I went to Niagara Falls. (laughs) Oh, that's your hometown, eh? No, went to Washington, D.C. For a two-year-old, you certainly got around. (laughs) Well, I can keep this up as long as you can. Where did you go after that? Uh, Washington, D.C. I went to Dallas, Texas. The sheriff never got tired, huh? <laughs> well, I give up. Let's leave you right where you are, and don't move until I come back to you, will you? I'm liable to be in Tampa by the time I get there. <laughs> Mrs. Parsons, uh, how old are you? Old? Why, we never talk of age in the Federation. We are ages. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Parsons. How young are you? Well, the gypsies tried to steal me when I was five years old. I may steal you tonight, Mrs. Parsons. This man is a gypsy. This man is a gypsy? Yes, sir. You're a gypsy? You don't look like a gypsy. I thought all gypsies wore bananas. I mean bandanas and <laughs> played the accordion and wore gold earrings. Why, you just look just like me. Why is that? A lot of gypsies do. Anybody care to have his palm read? <laughs> are, you, are you married, Bob? Uh, yes, I am. How, how did you meet your wife? Uh, my father introduced her to me. Well, that was a very friendly gesture on your part. Why was your father so interested in this girl? Well, he gave $1,500 for her and selected her first to be my wife. It's a lot of money for one girl. <laughs> how come your father paid $1,500 for your wife? Well, that's a custom among the English gypsies and among all the gypsies. Always pay fifteen hundred dollars? No, not necessarily. Can you get one for six ninety eight or something like that? <laughs> Hardly. How much did your wife weigh at this time? About seventy pounds. Fifteen hundred dollars and seventy pounds. Let's see that. <laughs> that comes to about twenty two dollars a pound. <laughs> That's a pretty stiff price to pay for a wife. You can buy caviar for twenty two dollars a pound. Of course, it's pretty lonely in the evening sitting there with a dish of caviar. <laughs> You think your father made a shrewd investment, Bob? I think so, because a uh, very short time after he was married, my wife made enough telling fortunes to pay my father back. Oh. <laughs> she should have read her own fortune first, and she'd be $1,500 ahead. <laughs> and has this marriage turned out successfully? Have you been happy, Bob? Uh, yes, very successfully. I got about the best girl in the world. Well, you ought to know. You've been all over the world. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Parsons, uh, tell us something about your work. What sort of work do you do? Well, my work is uh, very complicated. It uh, consists of so many details. We uh, have uh, picnics for every state in the Union. They have I used it. to entertain at picnics. I was known as a picnic ham. <laughs> in, in a sandwich? Said, in, yes, in a sandwich. <laughs> I was boiled a good deal of the time. (laughs) Well, what is the largest of these picnics? Iowa is by far the largest. We often have 130,000 at the Iowa picnic. 
And Imagine, uh, 130,000 people at a picnic. Oh, we have... To me, a... it's no picnic if there's more than two people, Mrs. Park. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. even then, it's no picnic. <laughs> How much did your husband pay for you, uh, Mrs. Parkinson? Uh, nothing at all. He got you for nothing? Well, yes. he stole you. <laughs> that is as you think. Well, I certainly do. I think you were a, a big bargain. Would you? Have you been a good wife, Mrs. Parkinson? I think I have. Uh -huh. Fairly good. Oh, you're qualifying it now, Yes. Huh? All the time you've been married, you've been good for nothing, eh? <laughs> That's an old joke, but I've chased this gypsy so much tonight, I'm getting weary, eh? <laughs> well, this has been an interesting conversation. And if I ever want my palm red, I'll stick it in the bucket of red paint. <laughs> now then, let's see how well you make out in the race with $1,000. Now, you've got to run your $20 into more than our other couples. I can't tell you how much our first couple won, but Fenneman's off stage to remind our listeners. The unemployment clerk and the genealogist won $228. Now, here we go. Uh, you have $20. You select the scrambled proverbs. How much are you going to bet on your first question? $10. You can bet anything you want. $10? Is that all right Ten. with you, Florence? Yes. I'll call you Florence. Huh? Certainly. Now, here's your first question. You're betting $10. What is this proverb? Adult and his legal tender are quickly disassociated. Uh, man and his money are soon parted. A fool and his money are soon That's parted. That's right. A fool and his money are soon parted. Ah, you have $30. Remember, you're going for $1,000 tonight. Now, how much of the 30 are you going to risk? 25 a rotating boulder will not amass a form of lichen. A rolling stone will gather no more. A rolling stone gathers no more. You will roll up to $55. Florence, you're a pretty sharp cookie. <laughs> now, how much are you going to bet on your third question? Fifty. Fifty? Yes, fifty. Here we go. It is inadvisable to enumerate fowls in your possession prior to the moment of their nativity. Do not count your chickens before, before they, they hatch. hatch. Is that right? <laughs> now you two have climbed to one hundred and five dollars. Clarence, have you been a chicken thief in your earlier days? <laughs> no, I never was. Oh, well, I <laughs> a goose thief or a duck thief or any kind no, of fowl? No, nothing of that kind. Oh, that's a foul question. Here's your last chance to be the other time. <laughs> What is this proverb? How much are they betting? They haven't bet, bet all of it. Is that right? Oh, you want to bet all of it? I don't. Okay. A dual cranium is more acceptable than a single. Uh, two heads two are better than two one. Two heads are better than one. Clarence, put it there. They say they are because you wind up with two hundred and ten dollars. Well, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulations to you both. That's quite a gap. Isn't sure it? is. <laughs> well, Groucho, the secret... We all have a tendency to emphasize youth too much, and you see a gal like that, and it's really wonderful. The, uh, the secret word, you know, is still clock. I know, I understand that. Well, we invited some... My memory isn't faltering <laughs> yet. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Even though you are <laughs> No innuendos from you. We invited some Hawaiian dancing girls to the program tonight. Now you're talking. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Heolani Kawela. Never mind this nonsense. Bring her in here, will you? <laughs> and her partner is a fencing master, Monsieur Jean Aeromance. And here they are. Folks, come over here and meet Groucho Marx. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome, welcome to the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. Huh? Say the secret word and divide $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. A fencing master and a hula dancer. Eh? Well, this may be interesting. He may cut off her grass skirt. <laughs> Hilani, uh, Hilani Kovila, is that right? Hilani Kovila. Hilani, K uh, Hilani Kovila. <laughs> well, where are you from, Hilani? Eh? The islands. The islands, eh? The islands. Uh, which islands? Coney, Catalina, or a thousand? <laughs> I'm from Hawaii. Hawaii? Uh, is that the correct pronunciation? I thought it was Hawaii. Uh, no, that's not right. Uh, Hawaii is correct. Oh, you couldn't say Hawaii just once, huh? Please? That's not correct. What, what isn't correct? Hawaii. I'm all right. How are you? <laughs> Tell him, Mom, it was a great fight, but I won. <laughs> and Mr. Uh, Mr. Harriman's, huh? If you think I'm going to watch you tonight, you're crazy. Huh? <laughs> you're a fencing master, huh? Where are you from? Uh? Brussels, Belgium. Oh, from Belgium, huh? Uh, you were raised in Belgium? You're sort of a Brussels sprout then, in other words. <laughs> but are you married? Yes, sir. Some fencer. He's got a sword hanging over his own head. <laughs> uh, are you married? Uh... No, I'm not. Oh, 
thank the Lord. <laughs> and praise the grass skirts. Huh? I guess it'd be pretty hard for a hula dancer to nod her head yes when the rest of her is saying no. <laughs> where, where do you do your hula dancing? Uh? Well, I uh, work mostly casuals when I stand. Where do you do your work, uh, Jean? At the Los Angeles Athletic Club and the University of Southern California. Oh, well, that's a good place for a fence. Exactly what do you do there? Do you, do you pick it? <laughs> no, I teach fencing because fencing is a very popular sport now. It's very becoming. Is that so? It's increasing in popularity? Very, well, very what is much. there about fencing that makes it so popular? Well, uh, for women, for instance, grace, poise, elegance. For men, fast reaction. Then also the spirit of sportsmanship. You mean puncturing somebody is a sportsmanship? Well, in some way, yes. Uh, you carry bicycle tape in your back pocket or something? <laughs> Suppose I wanted to take up fencing, what would I need? Uh, first of all, a mask, a jacket. And what do you think I'm wearing now? <laughs> I was saying a mask, a jacket, trousers, and tennis shoes, if possible. Tennis shoes? What's yes. that, for running? No, you want slide when you make your lunch. Uh-huh. I make my lunch? Don't I carry my lunch with me? <laughs> Well, wouldn't it be nice if I had a sword, too? We don't use sword anymore. You don't use a sword in fencing? What no. do you use, a mix master? <laughs> no, we use... What do you mean, no swords? We use foil, epée, and sabre. Uh, epée? Isn't he one of the seven dwarfs? No, it's a blade. Well, epée was a blade, I remember. <laughs> well, let's talk about the hula, for example. Just, what is the hula? Uh, Besides uh, a good way to keep warm on a cold night. <laughs> Uh, tells a story by dancing. Uh-huh. And all this time I've been wasting my time reading books. <laughs> what kind of stories does it tell? Uh, mysteries? There's no mystery about the hula. <laughs> well, doesn't that depend on whether the uh, grass and the skirt needs cutting? <laughs> what kind of stories can you tell by dancing? Oh, you tell love stories, and stories about the trees, the sun, the moon. They're all very simple stories. Mm-hmm. Well, how does dancing tell a story? I don't understand. Well, it tells a story by using the hands and the arms. Mm -hmm. it, um, um, Each gesture you make has some significance, I suppose? Yes, that's right. And I bet you've told many a story and then tried to wiggle out of it, huh? <laughs> well, you've been a very interesting couple, particularly you, Havani. <laughs> and if I ever do any fencing, you can be sure it won't be with a hula dance. <laughs> Now you're going to play your bet your life. You run your $20 and the more than the other couples, and you'll get a chance at the $1,000 question. I can't tell you how much the other couples won, but Fenham is going to remind our listeners. The unemployment clerk and the genealogist are still leading with $228. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your $20. You selected modern composers. Here's your first question. How much will you bet? $10. dollars $10. $10? Okay. Who composed Begin the Begin? Cole Porter. Cole Porter is right. <laughs> $30. Remember, you're going for $1,000. How much is a 30 you're going to try? 20. 20? Who composed Summertime? Gershwin. Gershwin is right. And your time is $50. Now you got $50. Here's your third question. How much is the 50? 40. 40 you're going to bet? All right. Who composed I've Told Every Little Star? Take a guess. Talk it over. And if you don't know, guess. Well, the bell is, uh, the bell is told. It was Jerome Kern. You should have known that. It's a very, very popular and very well-known song. You now have $10. Well, that's a shame. Now, it's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 10 would you bet? 10. Shoot the works? <laughs> okay. Who composed White Christmas? Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin is right. Line up with a grand total of twenty dollars, and that means the unemployment clerk and the genealogist with two hundred twenty-eight dollars get the chance at the DeSoto Plymouth thousand-dollar question. <laughs> All over the country this week, wherever the famous DeSoto Plymouth sign is displayed, people have been stopping, looking, and buying. Yes, and you know what they've been buying: the great new fifty-one DeSoto. Wherever you see this year's DeSoto, 
you'll see crowds gathering to admire it. But the real cause for admiration is the ride DeSoto gives you. Smooth, unbelievably comfortable. It's a revelation. What gives this amazing new concept of driving pleasure? Well, a great many features, such as a big new higher-powered engine, amazing new Auraflow shock absorbers, feather light steering. Features like these add up to driving pleasure you never dream possible. Yet DeSoto sells for only a few dollars more than the lowest cost car. So follow the crowd to your DeSoto Plymouth dealers and see... The 51 DeSoto, that's a revelation to ride. Here comes the winning couple, Groucho, the unemployment clerk, and the genealogist. All set for the $1,000 DeSoto Plymouth question. All right, here we go for $1,000. I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you, so think carefully and please no help from the audience. Here it is. One of our presidents served only 30 days, the shortest service in presidential history. For $1,000, tell me who was this president. All right, what is the answer you two have decided upon? I guess we're wrong, but we thought Buchanan. No, I, I'm sorry. It was <laughs> William Henry Harrison. That was a tough question. But anyway, you won... How much did they win? $228. You won $228, so that means the big question next week will be worth $1,500. Well, you lost the big money, but you won $220 in the quiz. Congratulations and thanks to both of you and to all of our contestants on the show tonight. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, when the big question will be worth $1,500. And don't miss Groucho's television show, also presented by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. By the way, folks, if you have nothing better to do, you might curl up with the February issue of Coronet Magazine and read the piece about me by my brother Harpo. Doesn't make any sense, but I think you'll enjoy it. The February Coronet Magazine. Good night, folks, and remember... Now just be sure to visit your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Folks, here's a reminder from the National Safety Council. Keep your car in safe operating condition. You bet your life. Transcribed from Hollywood is produced by John Goodell. Directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. aren't getting much on my Yelp review. For one thing, I clearly asked for the kosher meal. I don't even know what that is, you stupid animal. Uh, it's something actors ask for. And I'm an actor. You'll be acting with my club up your butt if you don't shut up. Please don't antagonize the guards. Uh, yeah. Um. By the way, my, I, I, have you thought about how we're supposed to get out of it? 
out of here. I mean, uh, we, we kind of need to get back to 2024. I've been thinking about that, and it's got to be something to do with that train. You, you, did, did you see, happen to catch the numbers on it? Sure did. Four, six, eight, seven. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, we just have to find that train again, and hopefully it'll take us back to our own time. I don't know, but it's worth a shot. The least we can do is talk to that conductor if we ever get out of here. Yeah, um, should we start making like Steve McQueen? Steve McQueen kept getting caught and put back in the cell. I intend to get out of the cell once we're out of here. Good plan, I guess. We'll have to figure out the next bit later. See ya, folks.